Good morning. We're, we're all together. Great. I was talking and my mute was on. <laughs> oh, goodness. All right. Good morning, everyone. It's so good to be back. I wish we were in person, but I say that every time. So you just all know I wish we were together, but soon, very soon, I hope. So um, it is Friday, January 28th, and I will call this uh, meeting of the Nevada Board of Wildlife Commissioners to order. Um, Vice Chair Cabello, will you lead us in the pledge, please? Sure. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. I forgot to say Happy New Year. Happy New Year, everyone. Hope everyone had a good holiday. Okay, uh, Missy, could you call the roll, please? Chairwoman East. Here. Vice Chair Covilia. Here. Vice or Commissioner Almberg. Commissioner Barnes. Here. Commissioner Keel. Here. Commissioner McNinch. Here. Commissioner Perini. Here. Commissioner Rogers. Here. Commissioner Wise. Here. Have our quorum. Great. Thanks. Um, okay. And County Advisory Boards to Manage Wildlife. Will you please let us know you're here by raising your hand? Um, and I want to make a quick announcement for the CABS. Um, we allow uh, the spokesperson for each CAB six minutes to speak on a topic. If you are not the spokesperson, but you're, a, you're also commenting, you'll have three minutes. So I just wanna make sure that everybody's aware of that. Um, and so you should have a designated spokesperson from your CAB. So I see Joe Crawford, Glenn Bunch, Joe Krim, and Therese Campbell, Steve Robinson, um, okay, so we have Mineral, Washoe, Clark, Pershing. Sure, I missed somebody. All right, thank you very much. Okay, uh, agenda item number two: approval of the agenda. Uh, Chairwoman East for possible possible action. The commission will review the agenda and may take action to approve the agenda. The commission may remove items from the agenda, continue items for consideration, or take items out of order. I just have one change to the agenda. We're removing agenda item number 8A, which was Commission General Regulation 504, the ETAG regulation. We'll be hearing that at another time. So any other uh, comments or changes to the agenda? Okay, I don't see any from the commission. So we'll take it out to public comment. Do we have any public comment on our agenda? Ms. Campbell, do you have a comment or do you still have your hand up? Go ahead, Ms. Campbell. Oh, uh, sorry, I'm sorry. It, I was, it wasn't showing my, um, my microphone so I couldn't unmute myself. But um, no, I don't, I don't have anything to comment right now. I can see everybody, but I don't know if I'm on your video screen or are you just doing um, audio for other, other people? We just have audio for, for others, for public oh. comment. Okay, all right. Hey, right, thank you. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Mr. Casanelli, do you have a comment on our agenda?
Tom, you're, you're muted. Could you unmute your mic? Mr. Casanelli. There we go. Okay. There you go. Hi. Hi. Just checking in as a Humboldt County representative. Thank you very much. We're glad to have you here. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Do we have any other public comment on our agenda? Okay, I don't see any. I'll bring it back to the commission for uh, an approval. I have a motion to approve. Okay, I will make a motion to approve the agenda with the removal of item 8A. Do I have a second? I have a second from Commissioner Rogers. So a motion by Commissioner Chairwoman East and a second by Commissioner Rogers. All in favor of the approval of the agenda, raise your hand. Motion carries nine to zero. Thank you. Approval of the minutes. Agenda item number three, Chairwoman East for possible action. Commission minutes may be approved from the November 5, 2021 meeting. Okay, any comments on minutes? Commissioner McNinch. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, while I noticed a, a couple of things that didn't necessarily uh, get through spell check or were content related, um, uh, I didn't really make too many notes on them. The only one that I felt was really um, probably uh, important to change was on page 24, uh, the third paragraph down. Um, and I know that uh, Mr. Beffert would probably appreciate uh, having the name brain, but um, his first name is Brian. So uh, I think we can probably make that change. And I just want to compliment the department, um, the effort and the time and the energy that goes in, that has to go into these minutes uh, to, to paraphrase uh, what we do and uh, what we've said and to um, uh, um, make them, make them good and legible and, and something that is, is, you know, you understand what the meeting was all about. You get the context of the conversations. There's a lot of effort that goes into that. These were really well done. And I appreciate the effort that's going into those and, and uh, paraphrasing what we say. It's, there's a lot of content and to boil them down to something like this and still maintain that uh, the, the uh, content of what was discussed is, is uh, it's a lot of effort. And I really appreciate um, what, what the department's doing with the minutes. Okay, thank you very much. Anyone else have comments on the agenda or the minutes? I'm sorry. Okay, I caught a couple of things too, um, but the, probably the most important for me is on page four under Bighorn Sheep Surveys. Uh, in the second uh, sentence, it says many herds appear to have contracted something <laughs> due to continued drought conditions. I think we probably should fix that. And that would be, I agree with you. Um, Commissioner McNinch, the, they're really well done and I appreciate the time and the effort that goes into them. So um, I won't belabor any of the other little little tiny things. Um, anybody else? Okay, seeing none, we'll take our minutes out for public comment. Do we have any public comment on our meeting minutes? Okay, seeing none, I'll come back to the commission for an approval. Do I have an approval on the minutes? Commissioner McNinch. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll make a motion to approve the minutes with the noted changes on uh, page four and page 24. Thank you. Do we have a second? I have a second by Vice Chair Cavalia to approve the minutes with the noted changes. All in favor, raise your hand. Okay, motion carries nine to zero. Thank you. Okay, agenda item number four, member announcements and correspondence, Chairwoman East informational. Commissioners may present emergent items. No action may be taken by the commission. Any item requiring commission action may be scheduled on a future commission agenda. The commission will review and may discuss correspondence sent or received by the commission since the last regular meeting and may provide copies for the exhibit file. Commissioners may provide hard copies of their correspondence for the written record. Correspondence sent or received by Secretary Wasley may also be discussed. Um, I just wanted to, sorry, pull out of my bag of tricks here. Um, 
Note the correspondence that I've received and forwarded along, or if you've all been copied on it, um, I haven't sent it, Missy sent it along. So I received a correspondence from Kathy Smith, Catherine Bricker, Don Moldy, Jana Wright, Madeline Kopp, Rex Flowers, and Don Moldy. Again, a couple things from Mr. Moldy. So those are the things most are um, uh, regarding the uh, agenda items for this meeting. So any other correspondence or items that anyone needs to alert us about? Commissioner McNinch. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, sorry, Tom, I'm just, I get my requests a little quicker than you do, I think. <laughs> um, I just had a couple of, on the, uh, on the correspondence side, I just wanna let everybody know that I'm continuing to get phone calls uh, regarding the, the calling contests. Um, no need to dive into too much detail. Just, uh, just, uh, just that there's still a lot of concern about them, and uh, people expressing their frustrations. Uh, um, we're in the middle of uh, calling contest season, so um, folks are folks are upset about it. So I wanted to share that. And then on a maybe a more somber note, but important note in my mind, um, I just wanted to note the passing of a couple folks since our last meeting. Um, one of them was, uh, Don Sefton, um, passed away in a horrible plane crash up in Medford, Oregon. And I know uh, a lot of people, um, with the agency and certainly some of us uh, knew him. And, um, I just wanted to note that he had, um, he had a way of, uh, communicating, uh, not, not just to the commission. I always appreciated how he communicated with us as a commission and, uh, worked with the, worked with the department and, um, he helped, the, he helped us make strides um, in how to better service uh, clients and customers. And uh, he was an important part of that process. And I really appreciate everything that he did for the agency. And um, on a more personal level, if you sat down with Don and had a chance to talk with him, um, he had a way of challenging your thoughts and challenging uh, your viewpoints um, in a respectful way. Um, that, that people, that's not natural for a lot of people, but it was for him. And I, I just wanted to, um, express my, uh, condolences to his family and friends and stuff out in Fallon and, and around the state or wherever, and, uh, just recognize him. And on another note, a little more personal for me, <clears throat> thought I was ready, um, Just wanted to recognize the passing of uh, Professor Don Clebano. You want a minute? We can come back to you. Suffice it to say that he was important. <laughs> I can tell. Yeah. I'll take a minute. Okay. All right. We'll come back to you if you feel up to it. Commissioner Barnes. Yeah, I just uh, want everybody to know that I received a call from uh, Chairman of the Elko uh, Cab, Jim Cooney, and uh, he let me know that he did have a appointment this morning, but would be joining us as soon as he was uh, done with his appointment. Oh, thank you. Okay. Anybody else have comments? Commissioner McNinch. Oh, Commissioner Perini. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to mention about Bob Cook with the Douglas County Cab and the CAB. And then he's, he passed away, unfortunately, just within about three weeks ago. And he had been there for a long time and did a lot of uh, good information and trying to help whatever he could with um, our thing. And, and it was really sad that he passed away. And we've done some really good things about talking about it and what he's done. It really made a difference. And uh, for those that have heard about Bob, um, they're really having rough times to understand that too, that he passed away. So thank you. You bet, thank you. Bad news this morning. Commissioner McNinch? Yeah. Okay, I'll try one more time. Probably uh, won't get very far, but uh, I had a friend tell me one time that he would love to have me come to his funeral. Um, because I don't hold it together very well. I'm one of those guys. So uh, um, I've had a lot of people tell me that. It's not something I really care to, uh, to do a lot of. But um, anyway, um, so Professor Klebenow taught at the University of Nevada, Reno. And um, 
he has his uh, he has his hands on a lot of um, uh, people that have worked for the department um, and around the West. I mean, just wildlife in general. He's one of the most um, um, uh, knowledgeable and most uh, well respected, um, most regarded uh, folks when it came to sage grouse and sage grouse biology and sage grouse conservation. I mean, it extended way beyond sage grouse, but um, he he really uh, he he really is known and was known for his work with sage grouse 50, 60 plus 70 years, um, clear up until not horribly long ago. I know that he was still involved with going out and doing surveys that were, uh, that he would provide on let counts and stuff like that. But um, um, he's left a, a big mark on wildlife. And for me personally, he, um, he didn't really care um, what interest you represented or where you came with your interest points. Um, he respected, um, he was one of those uh, folks that just respected and appreciated that you liked wildlife and were interested in wildlife. And he took the time to get to know you. And, and uh, <clears throat> my condolences go out to his family. My a good friend of mine is his son, Don. So oh, okay. sorry for him and his family. Thank you for sharing that. Everybody, we we have lost some good people. I, I I read the obituaries pretty frequently, and I see sportsmen, 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 and it, yeah, we're losing some good people. Anyone else have comments? Okay, Secretary Wasley, do you have anything for us? I do, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, and I I too wanted to uh, acknowledge um, first acknowledge the passing of of several. Um, of our our colleagues, Don Don Septon, as as Commissioner McNich noted, um, the the creator, the founder, um, operator of uh, Systems Consultants that, that ran administered our draw and license program for so many years, and uh, I think it's safe to say that Don attended and participated in more commission meetings than the overwhelming majority of our present day staff and and the present commission. Um, Commissioner McNich, notwithstanding, but uh, Don had a significant uh, career, a significant impact, uh, was a key player in the, the evolution of, of the draw system uh, when that was legislatively required to be conducted by, uh, by a third party. And uh, my condolences go to, to his friends and, and family as well. Uh, the passing of Bob Cook uh, took me by surprise and what took me, um, by equal surprise was reading about just how much involvement, how much Bob gave of himself. I knew how much he, he gave to wildlife through uh, the cab process, uh, but to read all the engagement that he had, he, he volunteered his time uh, unselfishly to so many uh, worthwhile causes. I, I um, was, was sad for, for a number of reasons. Um, and we'll certainly certainly miss Bob's energy and enthusiasm. And, and lastly, and not least, uh, Doc, Doc Cleveno, um, and as Commissioner McNich uh, indicated, he, he has his uh, fingerprints on, on a whole lot of things in, in wildlife and in this agency in particular. A number of our staff uh, either studied uh, under him, uh, were advised by him, uh, or you know, directed, uh, learned you know from from his science. But I I think is you know my my view of, of Doc is he was an incredible professor, incredible scientist, but he was an incredible family man. Uh, he was an incredible friend that just brought a contagious um, optimism, energy, uh, humor. Uh, and, and humility that would be a, a lesson for, for all. On a, uh, I guess, uh, less somber note, uh, but um, still uh, in, in the vein of uh, sadness uh, for, for the agency, but uh, happiness for several individuals. I just wanted to announce several key retirements. And I, I know that this will be a little redundant, at least with, with some of the department activity reports, but um, 
I'd be remiss not to acknowledge these individuals. And I know recently we, we've, we've uh, had a number of key retirements and the risk in, in you know, going through you know, names and lists is that I, I may uh, inadvertently uh, forget to honor somebody who spent you know, the majority of their life or their entire career with our agency. But uh, I did want to acknowledge the recent retirement of Pat Cummins. Um, as many of you knew, Pat was a, the bighorn sheep biologist in the southern region uh, for the overwhelming majority of, of his career. And, and uh, as, as Deputy Director Jack Robb recently had a conversation with him, he, he, he laughed at, at Jack and he said, joke's on you. You guys have been paying me for this. Uh, he loved his job. Uh, and, and he's another, um, another one who's, whose fingerprints will, will be forever on the sheep, the bighorn sheep uh, of the state of Nevada, involved in so many different uh, captures and, and uh, translocations, too, too many to count. Uh, we've also uh, recently had the retirement of, of Lorraine Marshall in the data and technology services down south. Lorraine uh, essentially uh, ran the Henderson office for, for years. And then when that was consolidated into the, the new uh, Pepper Lane office, uh, she moved there and uh, will be, be sorely, sorely missed. I had a great uh, conversation with, with Lorraine just a couple of weeks ago and uh, on her last day and, and told her how much we, we appreciated everything she, she's done for the department. Uh, in the Eastern region up in Elko, uh, Chris Drake, uh, fisheries biologist, um, and Joe Doucette from, from Con Ed, both uh, long, long tenured, incredibly valuable uh, to their respective divisions and to the agency as a whole. Um, Chris uh, ha has a, a myriad of, of nicknames, not all of which that could be shared here, but uh, he'll, he will be, uh, he'll be missed. Uh, Joe, um, truly a, an asset in terms of uh, his speaking, writing, video, editing. Um, really, when, when Joe was hired, uh, it was over 20 years ago to, to, to come in and into the conservation education division. He brought a skill set with him um, from NBC News and uh, really kind of was a catalyst in, in our conservation education evolution to more video uh, for outreach tools. And then again, last but certainly not least, uh, is the, the pending retirement of, of Kathy Telegatis down, down south. And, and uh, Kathy is, is, means so much to this agency and so much to, to the region down there. Her um, constant uh, insight and oversight uh, will be will be sorely missed. And uh, Kathy's uh, last day, I believe, is scheduled to be February 11th. So um, I did I did want to make those announcements. And then I did have just one one last thing relative to correspondence, uh, Madam Chair, if, if I might. Um, I I received some correspondence in the past couple of days. That correspondence was forwarded to the commission uh, through Missy. I think some of it was sent to you directly. Um, just I just want to say that in, in, I can't I can't help um, but in in reading some of the correspondence that that we receive, um, I, I just want to point out that anything that suggests that the the department is you know negligent or derelict in, in fulfilling our, our statutory charge. Um, clearly uh, doesn't understand the breadth and depth of, of, of what we do. Nevada is the seventh largest state and among the smallest staff and budget. We're often compared to other Western states. Uh, we can point to game populations or we can point to staff, the size of staff. You know, we're, we're often compared unfavorably to uh, California in terms of what they do and what we don't do. And I just want to point out that, that California has over 10 times the staff and over 10 times the budget. These are items that are out of, outside of our, our control. Uh, we wish we had more. We ask for more. We want more. Um, but in terms of doing what we do with what we have, we're second to none uh, as, as an agency. And we're pulled in, in a dozen different directions every day. And, and whether it's, you know, COVID issues, uh, personnel issues, litigation issues. And I know it, we're likely to hear, uh, you know, challenges on what uh, 
what litigation surrounding you know bears perhaps is is costing the state and and is it worth it and i i would just point out that that any uh cost to the state is in defense of the state and the state can't just look the other way and not not try to defend its its interest the cost would be far greater uh if if that were the strategy and it doesn't it doesn't matter uh you know, what actions the state does or doesn't do. We're sued uh, frequently and we're sued from all aspects and all angles. And we will always expend resources to defend the state's best interests. So um, I, I, I would just challenge anyone who, who is suggesting for a second that the department or commission are negligent or derelict in fulfilling those duties to listen to agenda item 6i, the department activity report, and really try to understand the depth and breadth of what we do, how we do it, and the limited resources with which we're tasked to do those things. And if, if you would truly like to see uh, the department have uh, more resources or greater you know enhanced ability to conduct those kinds of activities um, by all means we, we welcome your support uh, during legislative sessions during budget hearings um, and quite frankly uh, those rooms are awfully awfully empty when those decisions are made so we would we would welcome that that kind of support to enhance our capacity and that that concludes uh, my announcements madam chair thank you thank you and I would agree. I've had some correspondence regarding commissioners and, and I just, I, I don't appreciate that. I think we're all doing the best job that we can. And um, it's, we are tasked with determining and, and using the information that we're provided to determine the outcome of a specific agenda item or issue. And, um, and it's not easy. We hear from a lot of people every day. Um, and so I just, I, I really wish and hope that the personal, um, the personal attacks will not be tolerated. I'll just put it that way. Okay, moving on to agenda item number five. County, does, oh, sorry, does anyone else have any comment? Okay, moving on to agenda item number five, county advisory boards to manage wildlife, member items informational. CAB members may present emergent items. No action may be taken by the commission. Any item requiring commission action will be scheduled on a future commission agenda. And I just want to reiterate that we had some question about CAB um, comments. And so the designated spokesperson for the CAB will, will receive six minutes per the statute. And then um, anyone speaking from the CAB who's not the designated spokesperson will have a three minute. Um, time limit. I do want to read correspondence that was sent um, to us and asked to be read into the record. And it's from the Lander County Wildlife Advisory Board. And it says, Dear Endow Commissioners, the Lander County Wildlife Advisory Board is writing to you with a couple of concerns. We would like this letter to be read in public comment at the state meeting in January, if possible. Our first concern is that for more than five years, our board has been trying to request that a youth antelope hunt be added to our areas. This hunt would be beneficial because it is an easier hunt and we feel that with success, it will entice the youth to continue to hunt. We feel that we have the antelope population to support this hunt. We have emailed asking about such a hunt. We have attended different meetings prior to COVID and Zoom meetings and have asked for it to be considered during public comment. However, we have not had any luck. Yet this past season, you added a muzzleloader hunt. We are asking once again for the board to strongly consider adding a youth antelope hunt in the areas 151 through 156, 141 and 143. The second item of concern is that our cab would like to ask for the board to reopen the Western Elko County Elk Plan. We would appreciate receiving acknowledgement of this and this request and also being told if there's a different process that we must go through to make this request. We appreciate you taking the time to read this and hopefully you will consider our two requests strongly. We would also ask that you email our secretary that you receive this letter. Her email is s-o-n-d-r-a-t-o-r-g-e-r-s-o-n at gmail.com. Sincerely, Scott Torgerson, Lander County Chairman. Okay, do we have other CAB comments? Please raise your hand. We 
We don't have any other CAB comments. Okay, we'll bring it back to the commission. I see Dag Burkett. Just uh, waiting for the next uh, item. On oh, the okay, oh, because you are next. <laughs> okay, uh, we'll move on to agenda item number six, reports informational. Agenda item 6A is the litigation report, Deputy Attorney General Craig Burkett. A report will be provided on the Nevada Department of Wildlife Litigation. Thank you, Chairwoman East. We uh, I'll make it short and sweet. I know you guys have a long commission uh, meeting or, or a long agenda today and tomorrow. Uh, I, I do want to say uh, I've had a chance to use the new Endow website now uh, quite a bit. And whoever did it, uh, I know we got a presentation on that, and I can't recall who who was responsible, but it's excellent, very intuitive, very easy to move through. So I just wanted to um, give um, uh, supportive comments to the department on the website, it's excellent. So uh, I'll just hit the highlights. We have two items really that have had significant movement. We have concluded now uh, officially, formally, and finally the uh, item number three on the litigation report, which is uh, has to do with a challenge to Nevada's uh, predatory uh, management uh, uh, statute. Uh, if, if you recall, uh, we we had the case dismissed on summary judgment at uh, district court. Then they appealed that uh, the appeal we were successful on as well, and then they asked for rehearing uh, twice, and twice the Supreme Court has now uh, rejected those appeals. So that case is uh, fully and finally concluded, and we will remove it from our report uh, very soon. The other, only other item is uh, item number four. We are preparing for a trial week after next on uh, a lawsuit related to bear issues in the Tahoe Basin uh, and a lawsuit filed by a gentleman there. Um, and we are in the final stages of preparing for the trial of that matter. We are informed by the court that unless everybody gets COVID next week, uh, we will be going to trial on Tuesday, February 8th. Uh, and of course, we are um, ready to do it, excited to provide the strongest defense possible on that matter. Other than that, uh, really nothing else. Well, I should say this, the, the, the only other item that <clears throat> we have, uh, have some movement on is the Bi-State Sage Grouse case. This is number six, Desert Survivors. Uh, that's a listing decision by the, uh, by, uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service not to list the bi-state sage grouse population. Um, we had originally hoped to file an amicus brief in support of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service on that issue, but um, we are two attorneys down in our division, and uh, as you may have just heard, uh, we're in the course of preparing for a trial. Uh, and we simply just don't have the personnel to file that amicus brief. So we will not be filing the amicus. We have reached out to U.S. Fish and Wildlife uh, Council to advise them. We fully support them and we will um, do whatever we can other than uh, the amicus brief filing to support that action. Uh, other than that, that's it. I'd uh, be happy to answer any questions that the commission has. Anyone have questions for Dag Burkett? Vice Chair Kalia? Uh, an item that's not on the list, uh, Craig, and I guess I believe this is the right time to bring it up, but I saw in December that Wildlife Services is getting sued by um, its Wild Earth Guardians and Western Watersheds over their the predator, the lethal predator removal. And I did see in there specifically, they even talked about the removal of coyotes and ravens, and that ties into our predator plan. I'm just curious, is the department, I would assume the department's going to be following that because obviously, um, you know, we utilize wildlife services within our predator plan. So absolutely. If it's on your radar. Yeah, it is on our radar. We did see it. I follow. I saw that. Um, uh, we have not yet formed a strategy with the department on how we're going to handle that issue, but I, I am aware of it. And uh, um we're certainly going to track it. It may be the same sort of 
I actually shouldn't talk out of turn now that I say that because I don't know exactly where the department wants to go with that. So, but yes, I did see it. Yes, uh, we are going to, we are paying attention to it and we will develop a strategy um, with the department on that issue. So good, 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 good thing to bring up. Certainly it is on our radar. Thank you. Anyone else have questions for Dag Burkett? Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Uh, agenda item 6B, Western Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies Midwinter Conference, Secretary Wasley and Commissioner McNinch, a report will be provided uh, from the, I'm sorry, a report of the conference will be provided by the attendees. Who wants to go first? Commissioner McNinch. Thank you, Madam Chair. I was hoping that Tony could uh, do his uh, standard overview of the waffle meetings. I, it, he's very good at it and it, uh, it sets us up better okay. than I would today, trust me. <laughs> okay, okay, Secretary Wasley. Thank you, Madam Chair. So as, I, as I've shared in the past, um, the Western Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies, which includes uh, states and provinces, essentially uh, west of the Mississippi has two meetings a year. Uh, the, the larger of the two is in July and you know, rotating locations. Uh, and then the smaller of the two is in early January. And so I, I know that we had uh, a few commissioners in, in attendance and uh, numerous staff in attendance. One week before the meeting was to occur in Tucson, Arizona, um, COVID rates were beginning to uh, spike and capacity, healthcare capacity was limited such that the, the organization determined that uh, it would be more prudent to hold this meeting virtually. So um, the meeting was switched from an in-person meeting in, in Tucson, Arizona to a, a virtual meeting. Uh, did create some some challenges, but I think also some, some opportunities. So the... Uh, the, the midwinter meeting is is a little bit uh, shorter, a little more brief than the, the summer meeting, uh, usually limited to, to, to business functions of, of the association. Uh, I would say that um, <clears throat> there were a, a number of really productive meetings, uh, wild sheep working group, mule deer working group, animal movement and corridor working group. Um, diversity, equity, inclusion, uh, meetings, working groups, uh, directors, forum, directors and commissioners, uh, joint meeting. We, we, the Western states, held an executive uh, session, a two-hour closed-door meeting with, with our federal uh, partners to discuss this upcoming uh, or ongoing sage-grouse land use planning efforts. Um, we, we had a number of reports from many of our conservation partners uh, that included the Wildlife Society, National Wild Turkey Federation, Mule Deer Foundation, uh, Council on the Advancement of Hunting and Shooting Supports, uh, Recreational Boating and Fishing Foundation. We had updates on a national uh, standardized outreach program for uh, bear education called BearWise that uh, was initiated in the Southeast Association and recently uh, picked up um, by the association, the National Association, uh, just the 1st of January. Uh, there is a, a web presence uh, for, for that program and uh, materials uh, are available and we are currently in the process of, of staffing that, selecting staff from each of the four regions to, to operate um, in that, that bear wise. Uh, also some discussions on, significant discussions on landscape conservation. There are a number of efforts uh, nationally, regionally to try to take state-based programs, partnerships, and priorities, and elevate those into a regional scheme that can then be rolled up into a national uh, platform, much like uh, the 30 by 30. Um, so it, the idea is, is that we, we get away, as states, we get away from this 
perpetually pivoting to, to the priorities of, of new administrations. And we take those existing priorities, programs, and partnerships and capture them in a durable manner so that they can inform uh, those, those kinds of initiatives. So the, the Western Association is uh, probably a little bit behind uh, the Southeast, Northeast, and Midwest in terms of developing a strategy, but we did have significant uh, progress and discussion around a, a governance structure that could allow for Nevada's uh, conservation priorities to be uh, you know, rolled up into a regional framework that could then be rolled up into a, a national framework. We also discussed um, emerging uh, initiative in, in the One Health Initiative. One Health Initiative looks at the, the intersection of human health, wildlife health, and ecosystem health recognizing that many of the emerging pathogens, 75%, uh, uh, according to CDC, of emerging pathogens are zoonotic in nature, meaning they come from animals, and 60% of those come from, from wildlife. So uh, bird flu, swine flu, uh, coronaviruses, a uh, whole suite of pathogens uh, have their their origin in animals and the human animal interaction is often shaped by ecosystem health. So looking for a multi-sector approach that can bring human health, animal health and ecosystem health together to address, address some of these issues instead of uh, as, as one-off issues is, is garnering a lot of attention. The CDC um, actually kind of, kind of launched a, a One Health initiative, uh, oh, 15, 16 years ago. Um, but the notion that the, con the concept of One Health is actually uh, centuries old, if not, if not older. So um, clearly the, the pandemic has, has kind of acted as a catalyst around One Health discussions. Um, you know, there was a, a myriad of other meetings, uh, human dimensions, essentially the social science uh, around wildlife, wildlife management continues to be uh, an item discussed. I mentioned updates from our peers. I, I didn't mention you know, Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation was, was one of the organizations uh, that also provided an update, just kind of looking through some of the agendas. Um, see if there was anything that I, I didn't mention. We. One of the benefits to these regional and national associations that I've mentioned in the past is that the access um, to to our peers in, in federal agencies. And so one thing that I that I haven't mentioned here today yet is is some of our challenges with with wild horses and, and burrows. And this is not only an opportunity to to work with other states who have some of the same concerns and challenges and frustrations, but it also provides an opportunity to have conversations with our, our federal partners and try to try to press the issues and, and you know show support where we can to elicit you know the appropriate actions on on our, our rangelands. And so um, there was also uh, significant uh, conversations and discussions around around wild horses and I'm sure uh, many of you have seen yeah, you know, there's there's a, a number of emergency gathers. Um, Department of Interior BLM is, is has a fairly aggressive strategy right now to try to get down to uh, AMLs, and and they are they're being litigated litigated um, as they try to try to implement that. Uh, some of that was announced just just this week, but these meetings are a, a very good opportunity for states to to discuss issues, develop a unified front, and then present that unified front to those federal uh, agencies that have the jurisdictional authorities. And um, those conversations certainly occurred as well. Uh, Western Native Trout Initiative, uh, ongoing effort in, in the West, Colorado River Fish and Wildlife Council, uh, Fisheries Division Administrator uh, Chris Crookshanks was able to participate in that, and uh, much like the, uh, the wild horse issue and developing a, a unified position on on challenges and opportunities, the Colorado River Fish and Wildlife Council is kind of a subset of the Wafwa states that are affected by the Colorado River. Talk about uh, everything from water flows, water management, uh, mitigation for uh, threatened or endangered species, AIS efforts, uh, quagga mussels, and, and others. Um, 
and so there there are just so many different parts and, and pieces to it. Uh, it's it, it's impossible to do it all just because of the overlap. Um, but I mentioned earlier today about the breadth and depth of, of what we do. And uh, if you haven't participated in, in these meetings and, and would ever uh, like to, um, I would certainly encourage you to, to consider it. And some of these that are virtual really provide an opportunity um, to, to get more, more involvement, perhaps uh, not the kind of uh, engagement that being in person provides, but it does, it does give us a, a unique opportunity to uh, have greater uh, exposure of these conversations to, to more people. Uh, I'm happy to, to answer any questions or address anything. Uh, I guess perhaps uh, Recovering America's Wildlife Act might be uh, one, one item that um, I didn't mention. Um, and so we've, this is an item, federal legislation that, that we've updated you on a number of times over the last four plus years. Um, happy to announce that uh, Recovering America's Wildlife Act did, was brought to a vote in House Natural Resources Committee. Uh, it did pass out of the House Natural Resources Committee. I, I believe the vote was 29 yeas and 15 nays, uh, but strong bipartisan representation uh, in those voting for it. Um, so we, we continue to work with, um, with the Senate and the House trying to address uh, a few remaining concerns, but there is significant optimism uh, that we will be able to address those, those concerns. Those concerns just deal with uh, the permanence of the funding. They deal with um, a lack um, or perceived lack of benefit to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and would like to see some of that funding uh, go directly to the Fish and Wildlife Service for the delisting and downlisting of, of those threatened or endangered species currently protected under the Endangered Species Act and talk about a, a more gradual ramp up to the $1.3 billion uh, to address concerns over uh, an offset. Um, so as 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 the legislation currently exists, uh, there there isn't a true offset in that um, the source of that 1.3 billion hasn't been specifically identified, other than uh, the general general treasury. So uh, and and environmental uh, penalties and and fees for uh, environmental impacts or degradation. So with that, I will um, certainly uh, stand for any, any questions and um, it, and let Dave uh, share his thoughts and perspectives as well, Madam Chair, thank you. Okay, I have one quick question about RAWA, Secretary Wasley. I watched the hearing and I know there was a question about the match and one of the comments was that um, they didn't want states coming back down the road to say, hey, we can't meet the match. Can we lower the match? Um, threshold is, do you have any concerns about our ability to meet the match? I do not have any concerns about our ability to, to meet the match. There are some logistics that, that um, could present some challenges. For example, if the legislation passes and the funding became available on October 1st, the next you know, federal fiscal year, um, would the state of Nevada, Department of Wildlife, have the authority um, from the legislature to accept or expend those funds? And so there are legislative processes. We, we do not have, you know, autonomy just to say, you know, thank you for that $24 million. Um, we have to be able to, we have to have approval to accept it. We have to have approval to expend it. And we have to have plans to identify that match. Um, and so what we're talking about is 24 million federal dollars that would require 8 million um, non-federal, um, although RAW was a little bit different than PR, than the Pittman Roberts Center, Dingle Johnson, and that we can use federal dollars as long as they aren't uh, other DOI or USDA funds. So we have, we, we had a, uh, a two-day meeting here in the past couple of weeks and did some uh, fairly uh, deep dive on our, our funding um, 
going through our budgets, going through our programs, what this would mean, how we would get there. And I think uh, we have a, I know we have a high degree of confidence that we would be able to meet that match requirement of $8 million. Um, and it isn't, it isn't necessarily new money that's just coming out of, of nowhere. But for example, RAWA allows for the, the use of, of that federal money to fund law enforcement to, to an unlimited amount to, towards implementation of a state wildlife action plan. So Nevada state wildlife action plan includes mule deer, bighorn sheep, lawn cutthroat, trout, pygmy rabbit, sage grouse, all of which are game species. And so presently, any patrol activities or law enforcement activities associated with those species are 100% tag and license dollars. If those tag and license dollars were freed up because we could now pay for, with the passage of RAWA, pay for certain law enforcement activities with those federal dollars, it would free that money up that could then be used as match towards those federal dollars. And so it wouldn't have to be 8 million new dollars. It just, you know, we'd have to find that, that money that is, currently being used for programs that would be eligible to be replaced with federal funds through RAWA. So we don't have any concerns about being able to do it, but we would need legislative approval to accept and expend and have plans as such that would outline specifically how, how that would happen. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for Secretary Wasley? Okay, Commissioner McNinch. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'll, I'll thank you, Tony, for getting us started. It's always, uh, um, you do a great job of setting the table. And I'll, um, th this is such a, uh, an information rich meeting. Um, it blows your mind. You just, you scratch, you just scratch information and, and points and notes. Um, and then you got to try to um, uh, coalesce it into some kind of a, a report here. And, um, you know, there's there's so many things going on, and I, I always hate to not share everything, but um, the, the things that really stood out to me here. So um, in the commissioners committee, we, you know, the commissioners committee continues to discuss um, how, how it how it can can how it moves forward and be uh, productive and, and add value to uh, to Wafa. And um, I think I think um, the more important um, way that uh, the commissioner um, committee, its role is really more, um, WAFA plays an important role for the commissioners. Um, it's, it's kind of backwards. I, I feel like we look at it the wrong way. Like what can we do to, to, to get things done? And, and really for me, the, the WAFA, being at the WAFA meeting with other commissioners and hearing, um, hearing what states are going through and hearing what the, the, the WAFWA committee, uh, committees are up, um, are, con are doing and, and how they're progressing and getting updates from the federal agencies. It's an information um, thing for me and hearing it firsthand is really, uh, really has value in my mind. And it's, uh, so it's a, it's a great opportunity to, to um, sit and hear directly from people that are making the decisions and um, you can ask questions and what, what that's done is um, some of the commissions are uh, continue to move forward with, uh, you know, fair chase type of issues. Um, uh, Utah adopted a, uh, a trail camera regulation, very similar to Nevada's, if not exactly like Nevada's. Um, I point that out because, you know, the, the conversations that are had resonate and they mean something and the things that we do as a commission resonate with other states. So, um, it has value in that sense, and the meetings uh, allow us to share those and, and share ideas. Uh, gosh, I'm kind of—I'll be honest with you guys. I kind of come into this meeting on my heat, on my on the skid a little bit. I've uh, not been feeling real well, so I didn't prepare very well. I told uh, Madam Chair um, that I'd do the best I can to not uh, not deviate too much and get out out of whack, but I didn't get a chance to really put my notes together. I'm going to focus on a couple of things that were real uh, broad. Uh, broad conversations that occurred in all the committees that I attended, um, most of the uh, reports that were given, and it had to do with, uh, one of them had to do with uh, uh, DEI, Tony had referenced it, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, the WAFWA um, developed a committee uh, to address DEI issues um, relevant to wildlife and, and agencies and how how do we how do we incorporate these these concept of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and in, and in, uh, what's going on with uh, with wildlife? 
we have a new um, we have a lot of new interest groups um, demanding uh, demanding services demanding um, that uh, that these wildlife agencies um, hear hear what they want and hear how they want it um, and it's a real challenge and it's not just with any uh, any one state it's it's across the board um, it's not just with agencies it's with NGOs as well um, I heard a number of uh, uh, entities, uh, the Wildlife Society, Council to Advance Hunting in the Shooting Sports. Um, um, th there, were, there were many others. I got a lot of notes on, on, on uh, some of that stuff. But um, the bottom line is, is that all these entities are really putting some energy into how to, how to, um, how to incorporate uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, how to be sensitive to those things um, into what they do. One of the things that really struck me was that during the DEI committee, um, and Tony, I, you, I, I don't know if you're prepared or want to talk about the surveys that are being developed, um, but the one thing that really resonated with me was uh, one of the uh, directors had made a comment about um, in his private life, he had to do, um, he worked for, a, a, um, I believe it was, a, Tony, you might have to help me here. I, I thought I'd written it down, but it was a company um, that required uh, that an ESG report be conducted annually. And the ESG report is an environmental social governance report. So it's an evaluation for that company um, to, to inform their investors um, how they rate with regards to the environment, social and governance. Basically, what's their conscience? How's their conscience doing? And um, uh, the higher the rating, the more profitable the company um, and the more attractive they are for investors. Um, and uh, consequently, the more productive or more and more successful those companies are. Um, they have a higher social conscience, if you will. And um, so those reports are important. So these things, th this concept is kind of starting to bleed down into agencies now, into, into areas like, uh, like we're dealing with uh, um, with wildlife agencies, we got these diverse groups, and the more successful um, we are at at our environmental report card, at our social report card, and our governance report card, uh, the more successful um, we're likely to be with our customers and the people that expect um, things from us. So it's kind of a new. Um, the, the ideas aren't new, but the the uh, the effort to um, address it and to, to build something out of it is really picking up. Um, I, I heard it over and over the terms like social caring capacity when it comes to trapping, uh, social conscience when it comes to uh, how to manage that um, uh, with respect to policies in a number of states. It was a thing that hit over and over and over and over and over. And uh, it's real. Um, I really, really hope that we as a commission find a way to engage in these types of conversations. Um, uh, Tony, I ask, uh, what can the commission do to support your efforts? Maybe, maybe that's not a, um, maybe that's not relevant today, but um, just keep that in mind that I would really like to hear the role that this commission can play in furthering uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, um, what that means, understanding it, um, what our role would be, how we do it. Um, it's really critical. Um, I think the broad consensus across the board um, everywhere um, is um, we've got to get good at it. We've got to, we've got to be um, cognizant of it and uh, we've got to make movement on it. And um, um, the, I don't want anybody to read into it any more than what, what I'm just saying that, that it's a, that it's a movement. It's, it's not even a movement. It's, it's a, um, it's just part of managing the the, um, the increased interest in wildlife and outdoor recreation. There's that nexus with public health. Um, you know, it moves uh, really critical, big, important public health indicators. You know, you're out in the public, you're out in the nature at lower stress. Um, you have uh, less um, less major uh, public health problems. Uh, you know. Uh, people are more active. Um, their mental health is better. Things of that nature. Um, so there's these nexuses that are 
uh, and, and uh, communities are, are really embracing this stuff. So it's going to, it's a big deal. It's going to continue to grow. It's going to put challenges on our, on our agency. Um, let me see here. The kind of the other common themes are resources. Um, Tony had talked about it, but one that really stood out to me was the, uh, uh, the efforts with all these, with all these, um, uh, infrastructure bills and all this money starting to flow into the system. Uh, the wildlife agencies really have some opportunities to, uh, to get a lot of things done infrastructure wise. I mean, that could be moving water around properties that continually flood, um, Overton comes to mind, but, but, but it's bigger than that. It's, it's bigger than that. And, um, so there's a real challenge in getting shovel ready projects on lists at the right time in the right place. Uh, it's a timing issue. It's a resource issue. So um, I feel for the agencies. You guys have a big task. I know. I know Tony. You and you, the department are up to it. Um, I appreciate. But I just want to let the commission know that it that's not an easy task. Um, every state's struggling with it, and uh, but there there are tremendous efforts. Um, there's a lot of opportunities, and um, uh, I I think uh, uh, I think we we really. Uh, throw our support behind the agency, whatever we can do to help you guys with that. Um, it's a big task. I'm kind of rambling right now. Um, one other thing that stood out to me, and I'm going to just make a quick comment on it. Um, the USDA gave their report, and I think that this goes back to that social conscience thing that's that I that I kind of mentioned. There was a time where the USDA report, um, Wildlife Services, basically focused on um, the removal of predators, and it was really really predator heavy. Um, the report this time really focused on the value that it provides, uh, that, the, that the agency uh, provides. It's a major part of what they do and what they're tasked with doing. And I don't want to lose sight of it. It has, um, Tony mentioned the um, uh, zoonotic diseases. They're really tasked with um, surveillance research um, of those zoonotic diseases and uh, transmissions. And I mean, the work that the work that they do, um, there's a lot of important things that that agency does. It was refreshing to hear that from them uh, to kind of uh, throw out. Um, I, it was presented in a way that um, I didn't take it as a uh, we're trying to uh, we're trying we're not trying to justify our existence. It wasn't it didn't come from that um, that uh, at least I didn't take it that way. It really was just informational. Hey, by the way, here's some stuff that we do. It's important, and we want you guys to know about it. And I, I kind of appreciated the uh, the update. It was kind of refreshing to um, to hear um, um, to hear that kind of an update and get away from some of the other stuff. And uh, um, I'm going to leave it at that. Tiffany, I know that you and Commissioner Cavilla were sat in on a bunch of those. I appreciate both of you taking your time to do that. It, there's, it really is an, an information rich environment. And, kind of blows your mind sometimes. I'm gonna, I'll step, step aside for a minute, thank you. Thanks, Commissioner McNinch. I, uh, I did sit in on, on several of the, of the um, sessions and I think the one I really enjoy the most is the session where the commissioners provide um, kind of successes and, and maybe upcoming um, things that, initiatives that they're working on. Um, and unfortunately, I didn't take a lot of notes because they were putting together a spreadsheet that I don't have. But if I can access that, I'll, I'll send it. Uh, we'll get it out to everyone because there are some there's some similarities across the states, but there's also some really cool things. And so um, if there's if there's something there that uh, you'd like more information on, we can put you in touch with that state. The other thing I, I hope uh, we talked about um some sort of forum where we can all connect outside of WAFWA, but unfortunately with um, different open meeting laws, we, we can't necessarily jump in on a, like a Facebook forum or something. So they're going to put together a list of commissioners from different states that if you have a question for Arizona or Colorado or Wyoming, you could reach out to a commissioner. Um, you can do that, you know, anyway, you can look up their information on the internet, but it, it would be really nice just to be able to connect um, with other other commissioners. Um, I think um, I think Dave pretty much covered it. Uh, we did talk about wild horses and burrows. We talked about wildfire. We talked about habitat. I did make an appeal um, during the meeting and asked, you know, we we need to um, 
preserve our habitat. We need to make improvements to our habitat, but with these, with the horse issue that we have, it's going to be really hard for us to make those investments um, if we don't take care of the horses too. So um, I did make that appeal. Um, any other thoughts, uh, Vice Chair Cavilia? Uh, no, and, and I did. I did. And I sat in on a couple sessions and I did enjoy it. Um, and you, you, uh, you and Dave both kind of mentioned it. The, the one I, the state of the state where kind of every state kind of mentioned what they're going through um, and kind of see, like Dave said, some of the stuff that we're, we all have in common and then some of the other the stuff the other states are looking at. I, I did find that uh, pretty interesting, but mm -hmm. I did think it was worth, worth attending that. Okay. Any questions? Anything else? Okay. Uh, let's see. That concludes agenda item 6B. We'll move on to 6C, Wildlife Heritage Account Report. Division Administrator, Alan Janay. A report will be provided on the funds available, interest and principal, for expenditure from the Heritage Account in the upcoming year and an update on available principal balance. Can you hear me? Oh, I can't, I can't, I can't see you though. <laughs> I don't know exactly what's going on with my camera right now, um, but- We see a pretty uh, landscape. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's nice. You guys don't have to look at my face, so that's a good thing. <laughs> um, I'm not gonna try to correct that, I'll just try to correct it before I get to my next end item. So, um, if you don't mind, I'm gonna share a screen and I can walk you through a wildlife heritage update. Okay. Can you see that? Yes. All right. Uh, for the record, Alan Janae, Habitat Division Administrator. Um, given that we have a new uh, website, which I think is pretty cool, um, I wanted to give folks uh, the site or locations, the web address of where information can be found on the heritage page. And so the, the main wildlife heritage tag information can be found at that website there, that endow.org blog, wildlife dash heritage dash tag. Um, and then the forms for the project proposal applications, uh, which are due March 1st, can also be found there. And for anyone who uh, has received heritage funds for a project, um, the completion reports are due March 15th and can be found at that web address. All right. As far as the Wildlife Heritage Account update, you can see here uh, going back to 1997, um, you can see the balance forward and what the beginning cash in each fiscal year was or is and what the annual growth um, was year to year and then looking at the fiscal interest and your annual interest rate. Um, so beginning cash in FY21 was 10,787,794 and zero cents. Annual growth was 9.6% and the fiscal interest uh, was accrued was 63,938 and eight cents with an annual interest rate of a whopping 0.59%. Um, this is where it gets important. Um, the Wildlife Heritage Account, as stipulated by NRS 5013575, says the funding available for the heritage project or heritage program projects in a given year is the 75% of the money deposited in the account during the most recent and completed state fiscal year plus the interest earned on the principal in the account. So if you look to the 2021 FY21 revenue of $1,932,586.14, um, 75% of that would be $1,439,439.14. If you can add in the interest that was earned last year, uh, it is 63,938 and eight cents. 
which gives a heritage funding availability of $1,513,377.69 that will be available for this year's annual funding pot. And with that, I will quit sharing my screen and stand for, well, I'll, I'll let my scenery stand for questions. Does anyone have questions for Mr. Janae? No? So the interest really is dependent on that rate, isn't it? There were some, there were some years where that interest was pretty high. Yeah, it, it uh, you know, some years early on, it, it was definitely gaining better interest rate. But what we've seen even in the last 10 years has been, I think, a, a whopping high of 2.14% or something like that. So, um, but that's, that's kind of what we're left to deal with. Okay. All right. So the Heritage Committee will have a, a fun task of, deciding what projects will get funded. Yep. Okay, no uh, questions? I don't see any questions, Mr. Janae, thank you. Thank you. Uh, agenda item 6D, Tag Allocation and Application Hunt Committee Report, Committee Chair Tommy Cavilla. A report will be provided on the recent TAC meeting. Thank you, Madam Chair. We So the TAC committee, we met on Wednesday, 26th. Um, kind of looked at three items. We looked at uh, Commission Policy 24, the kind of our initial stab at that, looked at the department's uh, recommended changes to that policy. And then the, the committee, we, we had requested some changes to that. So the department's gonna take another look at it and bring it back to the next committee meeting. Uh, we looked at the junior hunt program and that one's still, I guess the committee, we can't quite make our mind up yet what direction we wanna take there. So we've asked the department to provide some additional um, information. And uh, I guess the, all we're looking to do there is kind of spread the wealth amongst, amongst the tags available. The demand is way higher than the, um, what we can give tag wise, give out tag wise. So we're just trying to, to spread the wealth there and, figure out what we think the committee thinks is gonna be the best bet on that for the commission to look at. And then the last thing we looked at, um, the department provided, provided some information on our, um, it's the mentor and a apprenticeship program. And I guess really none of us were really aware of it. And uh, we took a look at that. It's basically that you can get an apprentice hunter's license as long as you have an, a a mentor and you can hunt uh, small game and birds within the state. And it just, I just, uh, coming out of the community, we just asked maybe that the department maybe advertise that more because we thought it was a pretty neat program. Um, and I don't know really that, that a lot of people really even know about it. So, um, and that was kind of it for the committee. And we're gonna look at next time around, we're gonna look at policy 24 again and the, the junior hunt again. So that was, that was pretty much it. Okay, thanks. Any questions for Vice Chair on the TAC committee? Okay, thank you. Uh, Mule Deer Enhancement Program, 6E. Mule Deer Enhancement Program Oversight Committee Update, Committee Chair Casey Keel and Division Administrator Mike Scott. A report will be provided on the recent Mule Deer Enhancement Program Oversight Committee and the department will provide an update on the current status of the Mule Deer Enhancement Program. Mr. Keel. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. So the committee has met uh, a couple of times since the last commission meeting. Uh, most recent meeting was on December 15th of 2021. Uh, quite a bit of progress in my opinion was made over the, the course of the two meetings. Uh, we were able to rank and prioritize um, all of the projects that uh, were put forth from the subcommittees uh, across the state. We had really good dialogue um, in the committee, um, some great insight from some subject matter experts that are on the committee, um, especially in regard to some of the habitat projects. And, uh, you know, we kind of re-rank some of those based on the expertise of the committee. 
um, and that tweaks some of the rankings that came out of the uh, scoring matrix that, that the department used to help us. Um, at the end of the day, really, we had um, two main motions. One was to move the handful of predator projects uh, that we approved on the committee to the State Predatory Animal and Rodent Committee. Um, and it looks like they're trying to schedule a meeting uh, for early February um, to review and approve those to see if there's any synergy with uh, the predator management plan and if we can get funding you know, through that mechanism. And then the other for the habitat projects, uh, we made a motion to approve those and send those for review to the Heritage Committee, which uh, Mr. Janae just uh, gave us a re report on uh, the money that will be available. So hopefully we can be able to leverage those. Uh, at the end of the day, I think by the time these projects get back to the commission, they're going to be heavily scrutinized by uh, not only the Mule Deer Committee, but also the other committees as well. Um, with that, I'll stand for questions or if Mr. Scott has anything to add or clean up, I'd certainly appreciate it. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Keel. Um, yeah, the only thing that I would add is that uh, there was a total of 36 projects um, submitted by the subcommittees. Um, that included eight mule deer investigations uh, with an asking price of 328,000, uh, five predator projects uh, with a total cost of 295,000, and 23 habitat projects, which if approved would be slightly over $2 million. Um, the oversight committee uh, approved moving forward with the all eight of the investigations, all five of the predator projects, and 12 of the habitat projects. Um, so each of those projects will now begin moving through those uh, appropriate processes for final approval. Um, the game division is going to try to uh, fund the investigations. The predator projects will be submitted through to the park and the uh, wildlife damage management committee for that uh, to go through that process. And then the approved habitat projects, um, some of them will be submitted to the heritage committee. And I think it's important that um, you, you saw the amount of, of funding that's available uh, that uh, uh, administrator Janae just showed 1.5 million in the heritage project. Um, and it's, it's important because the, the mule deer enhancement uh, program is asking for that much. Um, so we, we need to try to diversify our funding with the mule deer enhancement program because we simply, that money is not just available for mule deer projects. It, um, we're gonna be competing with a lot of other projects that are very important. So um, uh, that's, that's um, a challenge that we have for this whole program. And then uh, the only other thing that I would add is that my intention in the near future is to hold meetings with involved department personnel, as well as the oversight committee to try to revise the various forms uh, that we use uh, to simplify and clarify them and um, streamline and improve this whole process. And I'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Great. I have a question. What Can you describe maybe one of the projects under investigations or tell us a little bit more about what that might look like? I'm, I'm curious. Projects of investigation? Yes, Madam Chair. Uh, Mike Scott, for the record. Um, the investigations, I, I have a list of them here. Um, they include mule deer collaring um, in Washoe County, uh, remote sensing modeling in Area 6, mule deer collaring in Area 6, uh, some public messaging down in Douglas County, um, more mule deer collaring in um, area, uh, Area 789, uh, tooth collection, um, more mainly it's mule deer collaring projects. I think six of them um, are are collaring projects that we're we're going to try to fund. Um, I'm not sure that we're going to have the funding to do all of those, but um, we're going to we're going to attempt it. So um, it it just depends on where our budget what what uh, our budget will allow this year. Okay, I was just curious. Investigation led my brain somewhere else. 
Anyone have questions for either Commissioner Keel or Mr. Scott? Commissioner McNinch? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Mike and Casey, uh, the director of the Mule Deer Foundation, Joel Pedersen, he had, um, uh, he gave a, uh, a talk to the commissioners and uh, one of his, he, he really, really hit home over and over and over and over how they want to uh, focus on habitat improvements and, uh, and uh, putting themselves in a position to where they can assist with that stuff. Have you guys been in contact with them as a potential funding source for any of these, um, uh, these projects, uh, especially the habitat ones? Commissioner McNinch, Mike Scott, for the record. Um, we have been in contact with Mueller Foundation. Um, what we are asking them for or what they actually offered um, was to help fund a position with us. And between uh, Administrator Janae and Director Wasley and myself, um, what we would, what we're hoping to do is uh, come up with some sort of a, a NEPA coordinator position that would would allow um, the us to streamline that process um, to make some of these projects go forward quicker. Um, that's going to be the bottleneck for us is getting through the NEPA process with a lot of these habitat projects. So um, yes, we have been in contact with them and, and uh, hopefully something will occur um, through that whole process. Okay. I appreciate that. I, it just sounds like their position to um, the, things are aligning to, to make something happen here. That sounds good, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Uh, agenda item 6F, um, timing and format of big game status and trend book game division administrator, Mike Scott, a report will be provided to the commission outlining the suggested changes to the timing of the big game status and trend book. The status and trend book has historically been completed prior to the big game quota meeting. However, with the game division now being asked to also complete quota recommendation forms, it is difficult to provide both documents prior to the May wildlife commission meeting. The game division is proposing to provide the quota recommendation forms to the CABS commission and interested publics prior to the May commission meeting and complete the big game status and trend book prior to July 1st. The game division is also proposing some formatting changes to the big game status and trend book to eliminate some redundancy. Mr. Scott. Madam Chair, members of the commission, thank you. Um, the Game Division has written this book for decades um, with very few changes. And the springtime is, is uh, an extremely busy time for the Game Division. Um, they're trying to get you know, deer surveys completed, uh, counting sage grouse strutting grounds, building big game models, um, writing their big game reports, and making the quota recommendations, which you see in the form of commission regulations. Um, the major effort used to be in writing and compiling, editing, and producing the status and trend book, which is um, a, a little over 100 pages of text and over 50 pages of tables of various big game data. Um, a few years ago, uh, game staff members Cody Schroeder and Cody McKee gave a presentation to this board in Ely where they they revealed the quota recommendation forms that the game division was using as internal guidance. Um, these forms were mainly used by the regional supervisors and staff kind of as a cheat sheet to summarize the data that, that we use to make quota recommendations. Um, several of the commissioners recognized the, the value of those forms and requested that we provide them um, and, uh, during that whole process, which we do. Um, the quota recommendation forms originally were only done for some species um, or areas that we felt needed added justification for the quotas that we were recommending. Um, but now we're being asked to provide these forms for all species and all hunt uh, unit groups. So trying to compile the quota recommendation forms and writing the status and trend book and making them both available to the, the CABs the public and the commission um, is, a, is truly a monumental effort uh, for the entire staff of the game division. 
Um, my intention is to provide more complete versions of the quota recommendation forms, uh, which would be um, with added consistency, um, increased and thorough rationale sections for you to make informed decisions regarding quotas. Uh, this would allow us to get through the quota process, take a deep breath, and then write the status and trend book following the quota meeting. And my intention is to provide you with an improved status and trend book prior to July 1st. Um, so with that, I would be happy to answer any questions. Any questions for Mr. Scott? Everybody's so quiet today. Mr. Holmberg. Uh, yes, Mike, I, I really appreciate and I know all the effort that, that uh, in the short time frame we've gone over this before. But uh, I mean, I guess just for myself and I know others that I've spoken with and uh, Lanner Cap, as uh, the importance of the, having that uh, the big game status and it becomes our, our total go to reference. It's so full of data, historical data. Um, that I, I mean, I guess if I personally, if I had a preference, uh, I, I really like the big game status, always have, always, always will. It's, it's very informative. Your, the, the other sheets are also very helpful. I mean, but uh, for me, I really like that this, the status book. And I don't know if it's all, if it's, uh, we either do one or the other type situation, but uh, um, just for me, I don't know how everybody else feels, but for me, I, I really rely on that, that the big game status book is just going, well, and we have continued to improve it. We have the harvest species, a resident sex weapon and unit group, all that the, the data that really tells us what the sportsmen uh, are speaking for themselves are just a ton of information. Um, and so I really am reluctant to, to have that uh, come out after the quota setting myself. Thank you, Commissioner Allenberg. Uh, Mike Scott for the record. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I, I This is a big change, um, but I guess what I would say is that the data, the important data the, that you use to make those decisions is all summarized in the quota recommendation forms. Um, the, the value of the uh, status and trend book tends to be kind of habitat related um, where we see, you know, whether there's a drought or, um, you know, a hard winter or, or various climate uh, conditions that, that affect big game herds. And so um, that, I don't know if that is crucial to your making a decision. I, I guess for, for the, the products that we're producing, I don't feel that we're producing the quality of products that I would like to see for both of those. We're, the, there's the, the time frame that, that we have to produce both of those products is, is compressed so tightly that we have staff staying here till, till midnight um, trying to get reports edited and um, things like that. And uh, we certainly don't have to change. My intention is to make some changes in the status book regardless um, with regard to the formatting of the book um, to get rid of some of the redundancy. And, and uh, you will certainly see that change. Um, whether we, we make the change to um, produce that book afterwards or not, um, there will be some changes to it. But um, I don't, I feel like we could provide you with uh, more complete and better documents if we did one or the other. I know, <coughs> excuse me. I know some sportsmen use it as um, somewhat of a Bible. <laughs> um, they really look to that. I get calls periodically. Do you have that book yet? <laughs> Can you take a picture of this page? Um, so I know that a lot of sportsmen use the book and I, I feel, I understand your pain, uh, Mr. Scott. Um, I, I don't know, you know, I, I'm open to suggestions. I think um, anything we can do to help our game division provide more um, maybe accurate and efficient content, maybe not accurate, is the, accurate's not the right word, but efficient um, content, I, I appreciate. Um, any other questions for Mr. Scott? Commissioner Keel, and then I'll go to Secretary Wasley. 
Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, mm -hmm. I'm certainly supportive of you know a higher quality product, and if that takes a little bit longer, then that's fine. But um, I know there's some improvements to be made, and I think even in the next agenda item regarding you know what's the objective. I've asked that question a lot as we go into the quota setting season. But the one thing in the big game status book that I hear a lot of comments on, and I think you know nobody wants to lose, is that insight from the field level biologist and you know that's the one area or the one you know document where you can really get a feel for you know those specific trends in some of the areas so hopefully we don't lose that as this uh process improves so thank you uh secretary wasley thank you madam chair i just wanted to um maybe clarify a couple points and, and answer one of the questions that Commissioner Almberg uh, asked, you know, maybe maybe rhetorically. But um, I think that when we look at this document, that there's at least two primary functions. One is to inform sportsmen. And that's that's what you know you all are hearing. You know, people want that insight from the biologist. The second is it's a it's a way that we catalog the conditions, the, the the issues historically. And so game division administrator Scott mentioned this has been done for decades. I mean, we have these books that that go back into the 1950s and, and we go back and we look at that. And so to his point of wanting to have that that accuracy, um, it's it's from the historical perspective. And so I don't, I don't, going back to Commissioner Almberg's question, I don't think it is one or the other. I think we can do both. I think that we can provide that data, uh, the key data in those quota recommendation forms. And if it's the appendices that show the trends of the populations or quotas or whatever, the, you know, we can identify that key, those key data points and still provide that tool for sportsmen to rely on um, however, the, the written, the historical value is, is being diminished because our time is not adequate to accurately reflect the, the challenges in, in the habitat. And we're hurrying through that in a way that hurts us, um, maybe not this year, but five years from now, 10 years from now, and those who come after us to try to, try to look back and, and see what those, those trends are. So I don't think it has to be, to again, to Commissioner Almberg's question, it doesn't have to be one or the other. I think we can do both. I think we can continue to provide those, the, the key data that people want to see and we can enhance the quality of the write-up and enhance the historical value of that to, to for those who follow us. Okay, uh, Deputy Director Rob. Thank you, Chair. Uh, there's one part that we haven't talked about, and Mike Scott talks about uh, the compression of our time. We've talked about giving the game division more time and extending our application period and doing our draw mid-June. I know that there's going to be some sportsmen upset that we don't have this book out, but if we want to produce the product that we, we want quality when it comes out, and to get that quality, we need more time. And I think we would upset 85,000 sportsmen that get used to a late May release of draw results more than a few sportsmen that they don't have the book in their hand. And that's what it comes down to. We just do not physically have the time to get everything done and, and meet those deadlines. That's, that's what it truly comes down to. So if you want more information, we can get definitely give it to you. We can change some of our timing, but it will be a huge change to our sportsmen and the people that apply for big game. Commissioner Rogers. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I guess my only comment on this is I, I tend to agree. I think that big game status and trend book is an invaluable tool. Um, I, I certainly recognize and appreciate some of the challenges, um, you know, with our resources within the department to, to put together this stuff. I guess my only comment is, is as long as, you know, these re uh, quota recommendation forms 
are going to provide us as commissioners more than enough information to really make an informed decision. Um, you know, again, I, I think that's the, the critical piece. I think that, you know, we all know that the status of some of our uh, big game throughout the state, various species that we probably are going to have some some lengthy discussions on quotas on all of our species. And I guess I would just say that I just want to make sure that we have more than enough information to really make an informed decision uh, on some, you know, some tough decisions ahead for us in the coming meetings. Okay. Other comments, questions? Vice Chair Cavilla. Um, I guess I like the quarter rec recommendations for myself. I'm more, I guess, math geared and spreadsheet geared. I do like those. Uh, Mike's, Mike's saying they're going to provide some additional information on those. Um, for me personally, I prefer to look at them when we're doing quota setting. So um, that's just my preference. I, I did want to bring up that we did, and I think some of us heard from the, pub the public a couple people called and they were kind of upset that this is an informational item because there's no public comment on this. I did want to just bring that up because there's there are some individuals that are that are going to be upset if we don't put the book out like we do now prior to quota setting. And I, I did want to mention that. Um, but my like I said, again, my preference is the, the quota recommendation forms. Um, if we could provide, I guess, Mike, what additional information would you be looking to put on those forms if we got rid of the status book. Thank you for the question, Chairman Cavilia. Um, Mike Scott, for the record. Um, the, the, there's a rationale section at the bottom of those code of recommendation forms that is, is, our, is a space that's largely not used. A lot of them are just blank or, or it'll, you know, there's one sentence or something like that. And I think um, my direction to the game division, the biologists and, and staff would be to um, add additional text um, in that rationale section that would justify those quotas um, and inform people of why we are making those decisions. And um, we can, th that's where the text would be that I would say is, is crucial to uh, why we're making some of those recommendations. Go ahead. And I, I guess one thing too, Mike, and um, it was brought up before. The one thing I do like about the status book is you get to see um, some of the comments from the biologists in the different regions that they're putting those quotas together. Would that rationale then be kind of some of that, the, the area biologist um, rationale then? Uh, Commissioner Cavalia, Mike Scott, for the record. Yes, that, that would be directly coming from the biologist. Um, again, those, those, the, rationale section is down there. It would be written by the biologist and then edited by uh, the supervisor or staff. But um, yes, that will be what, that will be the biologist opportunity to provide you with, with information on why they're making that decision. Okay. Other questions? Yes, Commissioner Allenberg. Uh, just a final comment. I agree with uh, Commissioner Rogers and, and uh, Commissioner, as long as our information is what we need to make an informed decision um, and it's better, uh, you know, I, I have great faith that, that uh, what you're saying you can provide, you know, the, whatever, whatever that is. Uh, I just thought it was important to mention how critical that information is to make an, an informed decision for all, for the CABS and for the Commission. Agreed. Other questions, comments? Okay. I think it's 1039. We're going to take a quick break, uh, let everybody stretch their legs, and we'll come back with agenda item number 6G. Um, let's take 10 minutes. So let's be back at 1050. That works for everyone. Thanks.
Okay, let's come back. Thanks everyone. Okay, we'll jump into agenda item number 6G, big game season prescriptions and management objectives for quota recommendations. Game Division Administrator Mike Scott, a report will be provided on the draft revision of the big game season prescriptions and management objectives for quota recommendations. This document guides the game division when formulating big game hunting seasons and quota recommendations. This version will replace the harvest management guidelines that were adopted as internal guidance for the game division in 2017. Mr. Scott. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the commission, Mike Scott for the record. <clears throat> so the big game uh, season prescriptions and management objectives for quota recommendations is exactly what uh, Madam Chair mentioned. It was adopted in 2017 under uh, then uh, Division Administrator Brian Wakeling. Uh, the document was finalized and adopted as internal guidance um, when the commission chose not to um, engage in that, that process. So this has been our guiding document for the last five years. Uh, the intent was to update it every five years with different changes that uh, occur in, in reasons why we change seasons or, or things like that. So um, this version that I'm presenting to you is uh, to inform you of the, the reasons that you see the season and quota recommendations that come from the game division. Um, it has multiple sections. It's got an objective, uh, approaches for management objectives and guidance, rounding and, and uh, minimum tag conventions, um, and then sections for each of our big game species. So um, uh, I'm, I'm happy to stand for any questions that you have, but I, I don't have anything further to describe. Okay. Do we have questions for Mr. Scott? Comments? Okay, I have a couple, so I'll get started. Um, on page 12, um, and um, under the antlered mule deer objectives, we did hear from um, uh, a couple of the cabs um, to leave in uh, certain hunt units. Um, and so I think Eureka asked if we could add hunt units 141 to 145 to the alternative hunts in the Eastern region. I, I don't know if you have a comment about that, Mr. Scott, or if you wanna just take that under advisement. Um, and then, um, also hunt unit 014, leave it in under the non-standard hunts um, in the hunt unit group. So do you have comments on either of those before I move on or? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. uh, Mike Scott for the record. Uh, yeah, um, area 14, um, I, I, I guess if we offered this to um, any of the cabs, they would, they would choose to manage these units for higher buck ratios. Um, the alternative units are are managed at a for for thirty five bucks per hundred does. Uh, standard units are managed for thirty bucks per hundred does, and then the um, non standard units are the units that uh, we we don't fly. Um, we don't survey because the surveys don't necessarily provide any enough meaningful data for us to make decisions on. So we use, we simply use the demand success formula to go through those, um, uh, to make recommendations for quotas in those uh, non-standard units. Um, the problem with unit 014 is that it's the, the population has dropped to a point where we really can't uh, collect enough data on that, that unit to, make a, an informed decision. The buck ratio is extremely high, but the population is, is really low. So we were, we were considering moving that into uh, a non-standard hunt unit, but I don't think we would stop flying that one. That one is pretty important to uh, everybody really. And so um, I don't have a problem 
keeping that in a, as an alternative unit. Um, I think that's, that's probably um, the, the appropriate uh, place for that unit. The alternate, I, it's in non-standard right now. So my question was, do we want to move it or leave it there? Madam Chair, Mike, Mike Scott, for the record, I, I would say we can move it back into the alternative where it where it formerly was. Oh, okay, okay, move it back. Okay, sorry, I misunderstood you. Um, I think just for the commission as a whole, um, and, and Vice Chair Cavilia brought this up a little bit on um, the junior tags and and Doe the DOE tags, we, we had quite a discussion and we continue to have that discussion. And I think it's a broader conversation that we, we need to have at some point, probably not today, but the antlerless mule deer hunts, I think we're, we're going to have to have a decision once we get our quota forms and, and we more, better understand, you know, what our populations are and what the habitat looks like. So um, I just wanted to make that, make that comment. Um, the Rocky Mountain Goats on page 20, um, uh, you have in there uh, on number two under the goat prescriptions, um, the male only mountain goats, um, the any and male. And I know we have a, a required class um, for the uh, tag holders on Rocky Mountain Goats to determine, you know, how they can best determine sex. Should we leave male only in there? Madam Chair, Mike Scott for the record. I, I would say we should leave it in there um, just as an option if we ever do decide to uh, make a recommendation for a Billy only hunt. Um, right now, I, I, I actually just got done um, participating in the, the mountain goat survey. Um, and although I don't have the numbers in front of me, it appeared to me that uh, mountain goats seem to be doing um, fairly well. And so I think for the time being that our plan is to leave that as, a, as an any, uh, any goat um, recommendation. But at some point, uh, we could choose to go with a billy only hunt. And then um, we would really have to educate uh, the the uh, successful tag holders on on how they could determine the difference in between billies and nannies. Okay. Okay. Thank you for that. I think those were my only questions. Um, does anyone else have questions for Mr. Scott, Vice Chair Cavilia? Yeah, Mike. Um, back on the antlerless mule deer. Is this? These objectives, is this criteria changed at all from the previous document? Um, or is this kind of the same, the same stuff we had before? Do you know? Commissioner Cavilia, I believe this is the same, although we've we've made various changes through the document. And um, with the the declining mule deer population, we have made some um, changes to it. Um, to make it a little bit more, um, uh, uh, the, the criteria for holding a doe hunt um, would be a little more structured so that uh, we really have to be able to justify why we're having a, a doe hunt um, in, in the situation that we are in some of these areas. And so um, we aren't, like I said, we aren't making many changes to, to that. We're still recommending some of those seasons but we'll probably back off on quotas on some of them unless we really do need to remove those hunts. But um, my, my direction was to uh, leave those, leave that criteria in there so that we could still allow people to participate in some of these hunts. Yeah. I, I and like, that's obviously a hot topic one every year the don't hunt. So I was just curious if any of that was changed. Thank you. Okay, other questions, comments? Commissioner McNeish. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Scott, I was looking at the, um, uh, I'm gonna, I'll start with the mountain lion down on, uh, down under D, under management objectives. 
Um, it just, it, it makes it, and I'm looking at this broadly, real, um, not into specifics here. So it's mentioned harvest objectives within a specific management zone may be increased or combined with the statewide harvest objective. I'm sorry. Um, it, it's the whole A, B, C, and D. It, it talks about kind of more of a prescriptive what the department will do um, if certain parameters are um, crossed, if you will. And on the black bear hunt, um, under D, it kind of mentions uh, uh, then tag quotas or harvest limits should be reduced. Um, has there been any discussion about kind of standardizing the language, um, you know, how, how, they, how the department would handle, um, you know, parameters that are, that are certain parameters that are met or crossed with regards to mountain lion and um, same with the black bear, you know, when you cross the parameter. So this says should be reduced. And on the other one, it says that the department will take more of a prescriptive action. You see what I'm saying? Chairman McNinch, or I'm sorry, Commissioner McNinch, uh, Mike Scott for the record. Yeah, I, we, can, we can take a look at that and see if we can provide some more consistent language. But um, the way that these species are managed um, is that we don't, we aren't crossing those thresholds. And so um, we're, we're still in, in, in fine shape with, with those. So, um, yeah. but I, I can certainly, um, uh, staff uh, specialist Pat Jackson is the one who is, um, manages these, these species. Um, and so we can certainly look at, um, making some additional changes in the language. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. I'm not trying to, um, you know, I understand that it's it's unusual to cross those parameters, but it just seems like, um, you know, that it'd be, there's some prudency if, if we were to, to use similar language um, on how we would approach, you know, kind of put them on the same level that, hey, if we, if we get these parameters crossed, they're important and um, you know, that, that it's a little more descriptive of what the agency would do, not that it, not that something should be done, but that something, uh, would be done, uh, from the agency. I think that that's important. And I'm, I thank you. I appreciate that. Do, do you want to speak, have Pat Jackson speak to us, Mr. McNinch? No, thank you, Madam yeah. Chair. I was just, I was just trying to, um, I was just making a suggestion and asking that the department uh, consider standardizing that language from one species to the next. I mean, um, I think it, I think it adds a little bit of a, um, the, the department works off biology. If there's, if there's, um, um, if things aren't quite right, then it's appropriate for them to make a recommendation and not to just. Uh, fall not to fall back on should but that they would they would say hey we need to do something here and this is what we think we should do like we have with all these other things so um it's i think that they, they have the ability to do that and certainly the knowledge and and uh, that's all i was asking for was just some consistency from one to the other so okay okay thank you any other questions for mr scott comments thoughts Okay, thank you, Mr. Scott. We're going to move on to, catch up here, uh, agenda item 6H, 2021, first come first serve report, data and technology services division administrator, Kimberly Munoz and Calcomy Zach Lambert. A report will be provided on this year's new first come first serve functionality of the online licensing system they are. Hi. For the record, Kim Munoz, Data and Technology Services Division Administrator. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome Zach Lambert from Calcomai. He is our customer service success rep. He has prepared a great presentation for you guys on recapping how the first year of first come first serve went. So with that, I will turn it over to Zach and let him give his presentation. Thank you, Kim. Uh, let me get started sharing my screen really quick. Uh, but for the record, uh, Zach Lambert from Calcomy Enterprises. Um, my responsibility is essentially to 
support NDAO in their uh, objectives of our licensing draw and registration system, as well as to operate the system for things such as the draw <clears throat> on behalf of NDAO. Give me one moment to share my screen here. Okay. And let's start this here. Can everybody see that okay? Zach, it looks uh, like it's in presentation mode. Uh, let me do, how about that? Better. Excellent. Thanks, Kim. Um, so I'm really happy to be speaking in front of the commission today and give an update on the 2020, 20, 2021 first come first serve program. This was a big change for uh, sportsmen in Nevada and uh, a big change overall in terms of how we allocate tags outside of the draw process. So I'm here to give an overview to the commission and at the end I'll uh, get, answer any questions that uh, anybody may have. So I, I'm pretty sure everybody's familiar with essentially what the First Come First Serve program is, but I wanna go back to the beginning and what really inspired Endow to come up with this program? What was the need we're trying to fulfill? And we sat down and we, we talked about it and everything came back to increased opportunities for participation in big game hunting. So under current regulations prior to first come first serve being passed by the commission, tags were going unutilized if they were returned by a hunter to the department with no eligible alternate. For example, a tag return cannot go to an alternate if it is within 14 days of the season close or season open, excuse me, or if there is no eligible alternate for those tags. So oftentimes at the conclusion of the second draw throughout the summer, we'll get a good bit of archery tags returned. It's possible that those are uh, more than 14 business days out from their season start, but it's possible nobody listed those archery tags as their first choice. So those would be the examples of what go first come first serve. Uh, another example would be throughout our rifle and muzzleloader seasons, somebody has an emergency, can't go hunt and returns their tag two days before the season begins, we can't take uh, those tags to an alternate either. So those, uh, uh, those tags would also be a part of the first come first serve process. Historically, those have gone, gone unused uh, by a hunter. And we really saw this as an opportunity to um, also better meet our management objectives. In some units, Endow only gives out a few tags. And if two or more of those gone, go unused, that really creates a challenge in terms of harvest objectives. And we saw that there's likely a demand for these tags as some hunters may want the opportunity uh, to buy a tag, even if the season's already started. And the biggest thing was in order to accomplish this, we need a fair and equitable rate way to reissue these tags. And so that is what birthed uh, the concept of the first come first serve program, which went live on August 3rd of this year. And so again, any tags that are returned to the department without an alternate, we process a random time period uh, between one second and 24 hours when those tags show up on the page for purchase and we sell those uh, first come first serve. And I'm really excited to share with you the results of this and how we've helped Endow uh, meet their objectives. The first thing I wanted to look at is really the basis of first come first serve is rooted in tag returns. And so the Nevada Department of Wildlife allows big game tag holders to return their tag for a death, medical, military, or really any reason to the department uh, to get their bonus points back should they be unable to go hunting. And I pulled some data from the past three years from 2019, 2021, and 2020. Um, so you can see here on the left-hand side how many tags were allocated for the draw each year. And we almost hit a record here in 2021 with 7% of tag quota being returned. So the tag return option is quite a popular choice um, for customers to make should they need to alter their plans. And one of the things we get as a part of the first come first serve program is a lot of feedback about the alternate program. This year, almost uh, 112,000 applications were marked as alternate and 669 customers who marked themselves as an alternate received an alternate hunter. 
And so that's almost 39% of all of these tag returns that actually go to an alternate. And both of those are records for endow. So I want to make sure that everybody understands the first come first serve program does not replace the alternate tag program. In fact, the alternate tag program is very much alive and well, and we're seeing it utilized more with more customers uh, receiving an alternate tag and marking themselves to be al alternates. The one statistic we're really proud of is on the right-hand side where you'll see tags unused. So in 2019, 4% of all big game tags went unused due to being returned with no alternate. In 2020, we saw a bit of a reduction to about 3.6%. That's mainly attributable to in 2020, this was the first year that the commission passed the electronic tag return period where if a tag was returned to the department during the one week period after the draw, um, those would be able to go into the second draw. So we had more returns going either into the second draw or to an alternate hunter that year. But in 2021, we've reduced that significantly to only 0.04% of tags going unused. And that's a combination of the electronic return period, as well as the first come first serve program. So we're seeing near 100% tags being utilized by hunters in Nevada now. And so as a result of the first come first serve program, I wanna just throw out a few sales numbers. So 987 tags went first come first serve this year. And we processed through the program 1,033. Um, you may be wondering why sales made are greater than tags offered. That's because tags can be bought first come first serve and then returned back to the department and then resold. Um, I remember hearing an anecdotal story uh, way back in early August where somebody bought a first come first serve tag, showed up to an endow office, got it printed and immediately asked for the tag return form. They were just curious to see how it worked. So um, it is possible that people can uh, purchase a first come first serve tag, re-return it and we'll sell it again. Um, so of the 987 tags that were made available first come first serve, 84.5% came from residents returning that tag and 15.5% came from non-residents returning that tag. So about an 85-15 split with residents returning and non-residents returning. As far as people um, actually obtaining and utilizing a tag, of the 987, 73% of those were uh, purchased by residents and 26% of those were purchased by non-residents. And so as a part of first come first serve, regardless of who returns the tag, it is open to be purchased by a customer of any residency. Now, residents will pay the resident price for that tag. <clears throat> Non-residents will pay the non-resident price for that tag. Um, but it is open to any interested uh, customer. And we usually do this as a part of the draw results presentation. So I wanted to include that here as a part of first come first serve is how many people purchase how many tags through the program. So uh, 11 clients purchased three tags through the first come first serve program. Uh, 115 clients purchased two tags through the first come first serve program and 724 big majority purchased just one tag through the first come first serve program. And so of those 987, what tags were made available? Uh, so 173 antelope horns longer than years tags, 13 antelope horns shorter than years tags, two junior mule deer tags, 560 antler mule deer tags, 12 antlerless mule deer tags, 102 bull tags, 95 cow tags, and those bull and cow tags are inclusive of depredation tags as well. I didn't split those out. Uh, 21 spike tags, seven Nelson uh, desert sheep ram tags, and two Nelson U tags were uh, made available first come first serve. So just to give a breakout, um, what I've prepared is a breakout by species, the tags that were made available and who returned them and who purchased them just for complete transparency. So um, 173 antelope horns longer than years tags were made available first come first serve. Of those 148 were returned by residents and 25 were returned by non-residents. Of the tags returned by residents, 67.5% uh, were purchased by residents and 32.4% were purchased by non-residents. 
And of the tags returned by non-residents, 72% of those were bought by residents and seven uh, non-residents, about 28%. And then the horn shorter than years tags, 100%. Uh, that's a typo. Those are resident tags. Non-residents don't have a uh, uh, shorter than years hunt. But uh, so 13 tags, 100% of those were returned by residents and 92% bought by residents and 7.7% .7 bought by uh, non-residents. Uh, for mule deer tags, we did see two junior mule deer tags go first come first serve. And I'll note a junior mule deer tag is a pretty coveted item uh, for our youth hunters. And so we, we see very few of those ever get returned, especially with the, the extended opportunity for more seasons and uh, weapon classes. So only two there. And junior tags were only offered to residents. That's one of the exceptions of offering tags to residents and non-residents. So the two junior tags were purchased by two junior resident hunters. Uh, we did sell 560 antlered mule deer tags, and 457 of those were returned by residents. Uh, of those, 74% were purchased by residents, and a little over 25% were purchased by non-residents. And 103 tags were returned by non-residents. Um, that was purchased by about 75.7% residents and 24.3-ish percent non-residents. So the one trend we're seeing is the vast majority of returns are coming from resident hunters, um, which I was actually surprised when you look at the data and see that you would think non-resident hunters may draw a tag and not be able to uh, get to Nevada. Um, I, th I think part of it has to do with residents who draw multiple tags and maybe can't have their plans accommodate both, um, uh, both hunts, but I'd be happy to drill into that further. We did have 12 antlerless mule deer tags returned uh, all by residents. And 91% of those were bought by residents and 9% or one tag was bought by non-residents. And then elk tags, so 102 bull tags, 91 of those were returned by residents. About 48% of those were purchased by residents and 51% uh, of those were purchased by non-residents and only 11 non-residents returned bull elk tags. Um, and that was almost an even split five to residents and six to non-residents. Uh, 95 cow elk tags were returned, 84 of those by residents, uh, with almost 96% uh, of residents actually buying those cow tags and only 3.5% of non-residents buying those cow tags. So we actually saw a greater swing from the 90-10 split between resident and non-resident quota there where residents ended up holding more tags uh, than that. Uh, and 11 of those cow tags were returned by non-residents and coincidentally all 11 of those were purchased by non-residents and 21 spike tags were returned by residents and all purchased by residents uh, bighorn sheep tags so se seven ram tags were returned without an alternate uh, purchased by two residents and five non-residents and two nelson u tags were returned without an alternate purchased by two residents and I'd be happy to flip back through these uh, as we go through the um, question section. And I do plan on providing a hard copy of this presentation to the commissioners. Any questions on this so far, or should I continue going with the presentation and take questions at the end? Anyone have questions for Zach? If you do, just speak up because I can't see everybody. Not yet. Okay, keep going, Zach. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so as we talked about earlier, what tags went unused? So 11 tags went unutilized this year due to not being purchased before five days left in their respective seasons. So a first come first serve tag will only be offered through the program up until there are five days remaining in the season, after which point that tag does not become utilized, which is considered unused. And that happened to 11 tags here. So uh, looks like four antelope tags, some cow elk tags and three um, antlered mule deer tags. Now, you may be asking yourselves with the high demand for Nevada big game tags, how could 11 tags possibly go unused? People were sitting on the site constantly, always refreshing their page. And the reason these 11 tags went unused is because they were picked up by customers and put in their shopping cart and not purchased. So I either pick up a tag in my shopping cart and buy it, 
or my five minute timer runs out, or I decide it's not the tag I want and I remove it from my cart. When a tag is put into a customer's shopping cart and removed, it does not immediately go back onto the first come first serve page for purchase. It kicks off another time period randomized within 24 hours for when that tag becomes available again. And so what we saw was many people putting tags into their cart, not purchasing it. And it may be 12 or 13, sometimes 20, sometimes 23 hours until that tag comes back onto the list. We do that purposefully so that um, somebody can't grab a tag, hold it for a friend and call them and say, okay, I'm gonna let it go in three seconds, be ready to buy it. So that's really to ensure the fairness of the process. Um, but that is the reason these tags went unused. People grabbing them, dumping them, starting off another 12, 20 hour period. And then we get to five days left in the season and the tag can no longer be offered. And this is where we started noticing the potential for suspicious activity. So ads to cart without a purchase were closely monitored by myself and others at Calcomy. And what we really came to understand is potentially many ads to a cart in a short period of time could potentially demonstrate that users are, and I'm going to use air quotes, fishing for tags and potentially using an automated means of grabbing tags, getting a notification when something's been put in their shopping cart, looking at it, and then removing it to see if uh, it's not the one that they wanted. Um, statistically, it would be very hard for somebody to grab uh, so many tags in a short amount of time with the number of people interested in tags um, without potentially using some automated means or maybe they're quick in the middle of the night. But users determined to be performing suspicious activity were suspended from the first come first serve program. Uh, so in total, 10 users were identified and suspended from the program. I believe there is an agenda item either today or tomorrow um, that will actually discuss some of this uh, in regulation further. Um, but this is really what we look for in terms of fairness and equitability in issuing tags. Um, I'm happy to say that uh, I feel you know, really good and proud to stand up here and say that all tags were issued in an ethical manner this year because we did monitor and we did catch things. Um, but I think there will be some more discussion on the agenda item later in these meetings uh, to discuss this further. Uh, one piece of information that I found interesting is how do customers receive their tags? So when purchasing a tag first come first serve, you have the option to pick it up at an Indow office, have it shipped to you priority overnight, or just standard ground shipping. Uh, we saw the majority of people actually choosing to pick up at Indow office. That's likely because the season's probably already open. They're going to swing by on their way out of town and get it printed and be on their way. And really, we're proud of the outcomes of this program. So again, the biggest outcome, 850 hunters purchased a tag through the program, about 73.6% residents or percent residents, 26.3% non-resident hunters. And the big one here is 686 hunters who purchased a first come first serve tag did not draw a tag in the big game draw. And so without the first come first serve program, you would have had 686 less hunters in the field with a tag this year. And that was 80% of people who purchased the tag, first come, first serve. And of that, uh, about 68.37% of residents were first time tag holders this year through first come, first serve, and 31.6% of non residents got their tag through first come, first serve, and not the draw. Um, a couple of other uh, outcomes. Uh, one, due to the way our contract is structured with the Department of Wildlife. This costs zero dollars to endow to build and implement this program. Uh, we operate on a software as a service model for our software delivery and any enhancement that's gonna make our system better, that's, that's something we wanna do and it's not like a change order that we charge endow for. Um, and we're proud of the 99.96% tag utilization, probably some of the highest ever. And while revenue is really secondary, and at the bottom of the list of importance of the first come first serve program, the, the main focus is increased opportunity and uh, tag utilization. Uh, this did result in an additional $173,000 in revenue. Um, of that, $127,736 came from non-residents with over 
uh, 42,000 coming from residents. So even though residents made up the larger majority of people who purchased first come first serve tags, you can see um, the non-residents bringing in that additional revenue. And just to give people some ideas of what we track as far as the first come first serve program, I, you know, we, we take a couple of statistics just to see how engaged our users are with the site. So throughout the period from August 3rd, when we went live to uh, basically the end of the year, I think January 2nd is the last point at which some late cow elk tags open. Uh, we saw 116,425 page views on the first come first serve page. And the average time spent on that page is nine minutes and 18 seconds. Um, our bounce rate, and I have those numbers mixed up. We had a 69% bounce rate, uh, which is actually lower than any other page on our site. So a bounce is considered somebody comes to this, the page, they don't find what they're wanting and they leave immediately. So this is telling us that users are engaged with the site um, and they're sitting there uh, for a decent amount of time looking for the opportunity to purchase a big game tag. And that is everything I had in terms of my presentation. Um, I'd be open to take any questions from the commission uh, or comments on anything. And again, I will provide a hard copy um, in the mail to all of the commissioners. Okay, thank you, Zach. Could you maybe start sharing your screen? Sure. And if we need to go back to a page, thank you. That way I can see everyone. So any questions for Zach or for Ms. Munoz? Commissioner Olmberg. Yes, I just want to really appreciate uh, or express my appreciation for your presentation. It was extremely good and valuable with great information. Uh, I did receive the hard copy of your draw report. I appreciate it. They become a reference document, and I'm looking forward to getting a hard copy of your presentation. It was very good and very informative. Thank you very much. Thank you. Other questions, comments? Commissioner Weiss and then Commissioner Rogers. I'm just curious if the tag utilization rate includes people who um, haven't hunted, but also maybe didn't return their tag for any reason. That does not. Um, so it is only tags that were in the hands of a hunter who could have legally harvested a big game animal with that tag. Um, I think we'll have the actual utilization rate in terms of who hunted or who harvested relatively soon. The deadline to report your return card for your harvest is fast approaching on uh, the 31st of January, where we'll have a complete data set for that. Great, right, thank you. Commissioner Rogers. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, great presentation, uh, Mr. Lambert. That was very informative. Um, one question that I did have, you know, you talked about, I think there was 10 individuals that were identified and, and, and suspended. Just curious, you know, typical, I guess, with com computers and where there's a will, there's a way for somebody to try and game the system and, and com create a, an unfair or competitive advantage. So I'm just curious what measures calc you know knowing that this activity is going on and you've identified just what activities does Calcomai have planned going forward to continue to monitor and safeguard this type of activity doesn't continue sure um be happy to answer that and I, I saw Jack turn his camera on Jack let me know if you want to chime in on anything um first and foremost you know measures in place we, we monitor things um to the extent of page views and adds to cart. Those are our two main sources of like what, what's going on here and what's happening. Um, and we saw a correlation between people who were adding mini tags to their cart and uh, having constant page refreshes quicker than any human being could have done it. And so that, that was a real key for us to suspend people in that regard. Um, functionally, a couple of the changes we intend to make for next year. One is, if you notice, we, we had a refresh rate of about 30 seconds on the page. So every 30 seconds, your ping would update and you would refresh with the list of tags. We're looking to put that more into real time and in doing so that's gonna create more of a consistent experience for everybody uh, in terms of that. Um, we are also, I believe proposed in the regulations. Um, I don't know, I, I can't personally comment on uh, what I think about them, but I believe there's a proposed regulation to define suspicious activity more clearly Kim, do you have your hand raised? 
Yeah, that's an agenda item 11C that I'll present tomorrow morning is we're going to present um, what the department would like to do and have a limit to the number of ta uh, tags that could be added to a cart in any given time period. So we'll discuss that tomorrow. And if you guys approve it, then we'll hand it over to Calcomai to um, implement before uh, the 22 uh, first come first serve functionality opens up in, in July. Okay, that answer the questions. I had a couple of um, questions and one story actually, um, if anybody follows the Facebook pages, the Nevada Big Game Hunter and Nevada Hunter, I think they are. There was a young girl, a youth hunter who got a deer tag, she drew a deer tag. She went out, harvested her deer on the first day and was really disappointed that the experience was all over. And so her dad went into first come first serve, got her a bull muzzle loader tag, never shot a muzzle loader before. They went out four or five days. She hunted, um, ended up harvesting a bull and she was just elated. And it was just a really, really neat story that it just has really rung with me for this many, this many months. <laughs> so I just wanted to share that with you. Um, I also wanted to ask, we heard at the TAC committee meeting in public comment, we heard someone uh, bring up the Wi-Fi issue in rural communities that they just don't refresh as quickly. They don't have the, the same access that we have in some of our um, larger metropolitan areas. Can you, I don't know if there's anything that we can do about that, um, but I just wanted to share that with you that that is a concern um, that they have out in some of those rural communities um, where hunting is, is, you know, a little bit more prevalent than it is even here in our other areas. Yeah, and um, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I totally understand that concern, and it's a concern shared by other Western states as well who have a leftover tag process. Um, you know, I think about like Colorado, for example, when their leftover list goes on sale, it's a mad rush, rush to get logged in into the queue and get your tag. And um, unfortunately, some of that does play into internet speed. Uh, one of the things though that we hope will help alleviate some of that is the real-time refreshing of the tag page. Rather than relying on a health ping to be sent from our system to your internet connection, uploaded back up, that should hopefully help deter some of that frustration in that regard um, and something we're, we're looking forward to monitoring next year. Okay. Um, and just two other quick things. Um, I was talking with some sportsmen um, about this program and they weren't aware of it. So just curious about any maybe additional promotion or um, I, I guess it would be promotion to, to get the word out on this. It, it ha it's amazing. The success of this is amazing. I, I have to say, I, I'm really impressed, but I'm just curious how we can alert more more sportsmen to it. Yeah, absolutely. So Calcomai does have a marketing team that works with the conservation education division at Endow. And we collaborate and meet almost weekly to figure out how do we need to reach out to our customers? What do we need to notify them of? And certainly that should be something that we plan on doing this next year. Um, potentially even getting segmented and uh, customized with who you're reaching out to. Looking at junior hunters who didn't draw a tag, reach out to them with a special message. Looking for people who maybe forgot to apply this year, reach out to them with a special message. Things of that nature is what uh, we can consider looking at doing. Okay. Okay, thanks. And then just um, another comment that came from a sportsman, the, the non-resident number and that being a little bit higher than we will, we often, well, we can provide in quota setting. Um, it, that may provide some heartburn at some point. I just wanted to, to bring up that, that comment we heard. Yeah, absolutely. And Calcomai doesn't really have an opinion on uh, whether or not we change that at all. Um, it's mainly, that's how the regulation was written, was that the uh, tags would need to be made available to residents and non-residents. And so we, we had to stick to the letter of the, the regulation to, to implement that. But, but I, I think, Deputy Director Rob, can you speak to that? Yes, uh, Jack Rowe for the record. Uh, 
for years now, we've done the 90% resident, 10% non-resident. And the way the department views this, uh, we have fulfilled that obligation, uh, the 90-10 split. It's providing opportunity to 90% of the residents. Uh, that resident that had that tag and turned it back in, that, that resident opportunity has already been provided. And so at that point, 90% of the tags have gone to residents and 10% to non-residents. That opportunity was provided the first time. Uh, so it, we, we are following the rules by, by the 90-10 split. It was provided that opportunity. The resident was provided that opportunity. The resident chose to turn it back in. Uh, that, that's what we're looking at. That, that opportunity was in a resident's hands. Okay. I'm sure it won't be the last time we hear this. Uh, Vice Chair Cavillia and then Commissioner McNinch. Yeah, and I, that the biggest gripe I've heard, one of the biggest gripes is that the non-residents. And then I can tell you right now that when the public looks on here and sees that about half the elk tags that got returned went to non-residents, the majority of the sheep tags went to non-residents. It's going to, we're going to get a bigger complaint coming back at us on it. Um, and I, I think it's something we could look at. It might, maybe some of those tags stay within the resident, non-resident, some of those higher value tags, because um, everybody that I've been talking to, the public's been waiting to see these numbers and that we just saw them and it's, it's going to create some major heartburn within the public. I can guarantee it. Okay. Thanks. Commissioner McNinch. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, that kind of popped my bubble. I was going to actually make the comment, uh, uh, you know, that uh, considering the, the concerns that have been expressed over the decades now of, you know, the, the resident non-resident split, um, seeing that pot of tags is just open for whoever puts in for them, um, I thought was a real plus in my mind. Um, I thought that it helped. Um, uh, one of the reasons why we're doing this is, is to um, was really kind of, you know, the, the opportunity to create the opportunities um, and, and open those doors for, um, you know, so that, so that these tags could be used. But part of it had to do with the department trying to meet their management goals. And uh, for me personally, I think it's uh, uh, kind of a nice olive branch to extend to the non-residents uh, where we've had some challenges in the past um, uh, to say to them that hey, you're, we value you too. And we're uh, by putting in and offering them opportunities to, to participate in hunts that we don't actually have seasons for them. Um, I think that these are uh, the, the horns shorter than ears on the antelope was a, a good example. I mean, you know, we had non-residents actually get tags for that where otherwise they wouldn't, they don't even have the opportunity. And I, I think that it's a, um, a win, 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 um, if we go down this path where we start talking about how we're going to distribute these things, we're going to be talking about, you know, what about those folks that have multiple tags that are getting um, extra tags, you know, getting a, a first come first serve. And I think that uh, um, um, I hate to see us go down that path. I like the free for all aspect of it. I think it's healthy. Um, it gives opportunity. Um, people can participate in it or not. And I agree with Jack on, on how that's being handled. Thanks. Okay, other comments, questions? Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Have a good one. You too. Okay, I think what we'll do is we'll get through item um, 6I and then we'll take our lunch break after the department and activity report. So uh, is, if that's okay with everyone. So 6I, department activity report, secretary Wasley and division administrators. A report will be provided on the Nevada Department of Wildlife Activities. Thank you, Madam Chair. I will just uh, provide a very brief report from the director's office and then uh, turn it over to each division administrator, starting with, with the game division. Uh, the director's office recently gave a presentation to the interim committee on natural resource, resources. This is a joint committee the Senate and the Assembly, uh, we were provided about a 30 minute window that um, ended up, I don't know, probably closer to 45 minutes when we were all done. 
Uh, we used the opportunity to highlight some challenges and opportunities facing wildlife. Some of the challenges included uh, wildfire invasive species, climate change, uh, wild horses and burrows. Some of the opportunities uh, included sage grass planting efforts, uh, wildlife corridors, One Health Initiative, and the Habitat Conservation Framework Executive Order. The, the committee did specifically uh, ask for us to speak to uh, coyote contests. They also asked for us to specifically address um, the $3 predator fee and provide some updates. Um, we, did, we did provide that. Um, and we also provided some additional backup material for uh, their, their consideration. As we already reported out on the midwinter WAFWA meeting, it was moved to virtual format, but still included many important topics like diversity, equity, inclusion, wild sheep working group, mule deer working group, animal movement corridor working group, uh, the director's forum and the director's commissioner uh, joint committee meeting. The agency has attended every uh, every single interim finance committee meeting recently, the IFC, um, in order to uh, receive request and receive approval on donations into the Wildlife Trust Fund, each of those has been approved without question. So some of you may recall um, that the past legislative session, uh, any that there was an, an exemption for um, donations for emergency purposes of up to, uh, I think it was up to, to essentially $20,000, but uh, we, we've been um, on each and every one of those agendas and uh, hasn't, hasn't even been any questions. So we've been able to, to receive those donations and, and have approval for all those uh, non-emergency situations. So um, although brief, um, that concludes the report from the director's office and I'll, I'll turn it over to uh, game division administrator, Mike Scott, to provide that update. Thanks. Thank you, Director Wasley. Um, from the game division, <clears throat> uh, winter game meeting. Game division staff participated in the winter game division meetings held in Reno the week of December 13th. Subjects discussed included season setting, commission policies, big game management objectives, surveys and species priorities, upland game and fur bear, and a meeting with USDA APHIS Wildlife Services. Bighorn captures. Uh, Southern Region Game Division staff conducted Desert Bighorn Sheep Captures in conjunction with the Western Region the week of January 10th. The purpose of these capture efforts was to sample Desert Bighorn Sheep from six, six different subherds, uh, the San Antonio Mountains, Monte Cristo Range, Volcanic Hills, Miller Mountain, Candelaria Hills, Garfield Hills, and the other Monte Cristo Mountains. Uh, to identify extent of the Fairview Slate, Mycoplasma, Ova, Pneumonia, or MOV strain. In addition to disease sampling, 28 GPS collars were deployed throughout the areas to document movement among subherds and give us the ability to monitor lamb mortality occurrence during spring months. Uh, Bighorn capture operations were conducted on January 12th in the Western region to deploy GPS collars and continue disease surveillance throughout portions of both Humboldt and Mineral Counties. Uh, and our staff captured and collared 27 bighorn sheep in November of 2021 on the National Test and Training Range. Collaring efforts are the initiation of a test and removal project. The purpose of this project is to sample many bighorn sheep over a multi-year process and lethally remove the sheep that are determined to be chronically shedding bacterial pneumonia to increase lamb productivity and overall herd health. Of the 27 sheep that were sampled, only one ewe and one ram were PCR positive and actively shedding MOV. The ewe was lethally removed during the capture due to a muscle rupture and endow staff lethally removed a nine-year-old one-horned ram on January 18th. State Route 160 underpass, on January 7th, Staff Specialist McKee traveled to Las Vegas for a field tour of the State Route 160 or SR-160 underpass and supporting infrastructure with Southern Region biologists Joe Bennett and Sam Hughes. Staff Specialist McKee secured funding from the Wildlife Heritage Trust account 
to support the purchase and deployment of radio collars on bighorn sheep, mule deer, and elk. Uh, data collected from movements indicate, indicated SR-160 posed a substantial threat to public safety with several sheep, deer, and elk movements occurring on or near the highway corridor, as well as significant barrier restricting movements and connectivity in the Southern Spring Mountains. Documentation of these movement patterns were critical in securing support and integration of new wildlife cross of a new wildlife crossing structure from the Nevada Department of Transportation. Trail cameras deployed in at the undercrossing documented successful crossing by mule deer, fox, coyote, and burrows within a few weeks of deployment. Endow Wildlife Health staff assisted Arizona Game and Fish Department with captures in the North El Dorados to place collars to monitor usage of under and overpasses at the Boulder City Bypass. A total of 26 animals were caught with a single animal testing positive for MOV. Strain typing and comparison is ongoing. Sinus tumor investigations. To date this year, uh, Endow Wildlife Health has evaluated 66 bighorn sheep skulls for sinus tumor, of which seven are confirmed and one suspected. Of the six confirmed with MOV results, three were detected, two were indeterminate, and one was not detected. Elk fence rebuild completed. The Glockner elk fence, elk exclusionary fence rebuild has been completed in Little Spring Valley in Lincoln County. This fence was originally constructed in 1994 and was needed some major maintenance and repairs. Paradise Valley wild turkey capture. Uh, the trapping operation took place on January 11th. Turkeys were captured using both cannon nets and walk-in traps. A total of 22 birds were captured and then taken to Walker River State Park and released to expand the population of wild turkeys in Western Nevada. Uh, Esri Big Game Survey Out. In collaboration with Environmental Service Research Institute, Esri, uh, Game Division released the Wild Wildlife Survey App, WSA, for mobile data collection during big game surveys. Widespread adoption by biologists in the game division ensured classification data from 90% of postseason deer surveys were collected using the WSA. Despite a handful of issues during the initial release, overall feedback of the, the WSA has been positive since biologists and staff are able to review real-time survey information months before traditional deadlines. Primary funding for development and maintenance of the WSA was provided by the Wildlife Heritage Trust account. And I was fortunate enough to uh, participate in some surveys and even I was able to use this survey app. So I gotta give kudos to the game division staff for creating this, it's, it's an amazing tool. Uh, elk depredation seasons. Working with regional biologists and supervisors developed and proposed relevant elk season amendments to commission regulation 2103. Of note is the creation of antler point limits during certain hunts for antlered elk. Since antlered elk are often found in bachelor groups during much of the year, these hunts are intended to apply continued pressure to groups of antlered elk but prevent the harvest of older age class individuals whose antler points often exceed the proposed limit, i.e. five or fewer points. We are excited to learn more about the effect effectiveness of these hunts especially in addressing hunter conflict in the field. We have elected to implement these changes in a limited fashion where depredation concerns exist on agricultural lands. Washoe mule deer capture. Over two days, Endow staff participated in net gun captures of 20 mule deer in the Peterson, Dogskin, Virginia, and Granite Ranges to facilitate the taking of a tooth mold. Detailed body condition scoring and ultrasound of rump fat were taken. All deer captured were in relatively poor body condition with very little to no measurable rump fat. CWD surveillance. Uh, to date this year, Endow has collected more than um, 269 CWD samples. All return samples have been negative and there should be a few more uh, filtering in in the next few months. And finally, uh, you've heard this before, but a uh, long time Southern Region Bighorn Sheep and Game Biologist Pat Cummings retired in December. Uh, Pat has been integral to Nevada Bighorn Sheep Management going back to 1987 uh, when he worked as a conservation aide on the Bighorn Sheep Project. It is safe to say that Pat Cummings has seen and handled more Bighorn Sheep than anyone else on earth. 
Uh, his professionalism and passion will be missed by all of us in the game division as well as Nevada Sportsman. So that's it from the game division and I will answer any questions. Any questions for Mr. Scott? Commissioner Rogers. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. Scott, um, you were talking about uh, State Route 160 and an underpass. And I'm just curious, is that in place currently, did you say, or, or that is something that is considered for construction with, uh, with NDOT? It's in place currently. Okay. And is that on this uh, east side of the Spring Mountain Pass there or the west side of Spring Mountain Pass? I guess I hadn't seen it, so. Uh, Commissioner Rogers, I, I, maybe Alan Janae can provide an answer to that. I'm not sure where it is. Yeah, for the record, Alan Janae, Habitat Division Administrator. And yeah, I do believe that is the one on the east side there. It's an existing crossing that we worked with NDOT a um, number of years ago as they were considering some improvements to that highway. And we identified this need to try to further fill our knowledge gap as, as far as how those animals were moving through that country. Okay, other questions for Mr. Scott? Okay, thank you. All right, I'm next up. So Habitat Division, uh, again, for the record, Alan Janae, Habitat Division Administrator, uh, Wildfire Restoration. The Habitat Division completed approximately 26,158 acres of herbicide treatments this fall and are currently working with the Nevada Division of Forestry and other partners to seed approximately 8,100 acres of the Tamarack Bot. In total, Endow will be completing seeding of approximately 27,123 acres with other recent activities, activities including supplying kosha seed to supplement BLM efforts on 10,341 acres of the Martin Fire and 5,865 acres of the Poodle Fire. Seeding efforts that should, these are seeding efforts that should be completed this January. Uh, Carson Lake and Pasture, a department entered a disciplinary team representing all divisions of the agency, hosted a virtual public scoping meeting on November 16th to gather input into the Carson Lake wildlife, or soon to be Carson Lake wildlife management area conceptual management plan. A brief presentation on the area was provided prior to a question and answer session. Nearly 50 members of the public attended the live event with an additional 40 members providing comments to the department through email. The first draft of the area management plan is expected this fall. And that's all I have. Okay, any questions for Mr. Janae? Alan, I have a quick question. Is there a preferred time to get seed on the ground after a fire? Yeah, we generally like, um, with the exception of when we chemically fallow, um, we generally like to be seeding on black, um, mm -hmm. but by applying uh, the chemical amazepic, we can actually uh, restrict or, or uh, hold up that germination of cheatgrass seed for a year with by applying a mazepic and it gave it gains us another year so that we can come back that following fall um, and winter. We like to seed in the winter so that there's actually, you know, our winter moisture uh, is coming down upon that seed and it's, you know, germinating in the spring. Okay, thanks. Yeah, you mentioned the Martin and the Poodle and the Tamarack, and I know those are all within several years of each other, so I was just curious. Yeah, and so uh, that particular uh, Poodle Mountain fire was one that was treated with a Mazapic. Uh, Martin fire, same type of thing. We've been working, continuing to work up there and, and applying herbicides and trying to create windows to, to create more opportunities for reseeding efforts. Okay, once okay. twice, Alan. Okay. I'll pass along to Chris Vasey and Con Ed. Thanks. Good morning. I'm Chris Basie, Conservation Education Chief for the record. Uh, before I do a brief overview of activities for December and January, I have to repeat what uh, Director Wasley said about Joe Doucette. Joe will be missed for his go-to attitude, passion, and his over-the-top professionalism and everything communications. 
you will be missed, but I assure you, we will not let him go as a volunteer and a friend. So, um, and here's, I'm gonna just give you my updates for our programming, starting with classroom programming. Training for our wildlife badges pilot program, which I reported on last time has been wrapped up. Three nights of training for 30 teachers was completed late December and early January. The program covers standards for all grades. Teachers piloted the program, have committed to providing feedback on the program so we can improve the and change as recommended. The bird trunk pilot will, will have the teacher trainings beginning in late January and February. Meeting with local Audubon chapters are ongoing for potential partnership opportunities with this program. This program meets six, eighth, and eighth, and eighth grade standards. We will be expanding the trunk to meet more grade standards next year and adding some cover cover different and cover different species. Trout in the classroom egg pickup is currently ongoing. For those of you who do not know of this program, students raise trout in the classroom from egg to fry and end with the fry release day. This program meets all science, technology, engineering, and mathematics standards. More eggs are going to the classroom this year than last year because of COVID. Well over 150 classrooms are participating across the state. We also continue to offer the program virtually for educators that are either on the wait list for a tank or are not back in the classrooms yet. Um, for his events, conservation educators and endow staff work booths at the annual sheep show in Reno. The event attracted many families and hunters as well as students to the youth wildlife conservation experience. For the two day youth wildlife conservation experience, there were over 350 students who participated in the programming. Programming included career talks from endow biologists and educators, kayaking, rock climbing, archery, fly tying, skull and hide station, among many other education booths that were presented. Outreach, uh, the department has officially launched our new endow website. To best serve the public, we employed a website survey that will gather feedback so that we can optimize navigation and accessibility. So far, we've received largely positive feedback on the site's responsive and mobile-friendly design. Additional feedback from the survey will include the ease of access when purchasing a license, applying for hunts, seeking information on hunting, fishing, boating, and Nevada's wildlife. And keeping up with our updated branding, conservation education is also working on rolling out a refresh set of media graphics that is consistent with our new look. Um, earlier this year, conservation and staff worked on the University of Nevada Reno Cooperative Extension staff as part of the Nevada Economic Assessment Project to, to conduct a survey for hunters for bit of, to better understand how recreational hunting supports Nevada's economy. Based on that effort, a uh, report was developed by UNR, UNR Cooperative Extension and was shared by us via email, our state legislators, our commission, county advisory boards, and many other partners. We plan to continue to share this report as uh, opportunities arise and hope to become a resource for small businesses, state and federal agencies, and local governments, and anyone who comes across it. Conservation education staff is beginning promotions for big game application period through the email and social media. So far, emails have included information on hunter education and hunting a tag and tag app application resources. Staff has scheduled extensive outreach to promote the big game application in the coming months. Staff has recently worked on multiple social media campaigns to increase engagement on department social media platforms. One of the campaigns was 25 days of Fishmas. Staff posted a fish, fish, fishing related post daily to give our audiences tips on fishing and where to go, fishing gear, gift ideas, and shared photos from the public. The campaign received so much engagement from followers that it extended into the new year with a weekly catch of the week. Posts to share fishing photos from the public. Another campaign was boost, boosted engagement is uh, hunting dog of the week. This is where staff shares photos sent in from the public of their favorite hunting and outdoor dogs every Monday. Media highlights from the beginning of December to late January, the department has an audience of, of more than 10,448,000 for print, online news, and television audience of 130,595. Stories covered a wide range of topics, including positive print feature on game wardens, fishing reports, collaborative efforts to restore desert tortoises habitat in Southern uh, Nevada, improvements on Cummins and Cave Lake in Eastern Nevada, and 10 minute television feature on Endow's fish spawning work in Tahoe Basin and urban wildlife and more. Our 2000, uh, 
2022 uh, Nevada Fishing Regulation publication hit newsstands in early January, and our 2020 issue features updated regulations, information along the four articles about different aspects of fishing in the Silver State. We are also hard at work at the 2022-2023 uh, Big Game Season application publications, which will be hitting the newsstands in March. This completes Conservation Education Report, and thank you. Okay, questions for Mr. Vasey. I have a quick question. It's more personal than um, anecdotal. How many tanks do you need for trout in the classroom? <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's more about the um, capacity to maintain what we have. Okay. And so we can, we can take on many more tanks, probably, you know, 50 a year and handle that with capacity, but it's, it's basically maintaining the tanks and chillers for those classrooms. So it's, you know, it's staff capacity and making sure we always keep up uh, with the teachers. And then also, you know, there's a lot of bit of tracking, you know, teachers move from school to school. So we're always, we're always trying to make sure that tanks get utilized that may have already been used and we can move them. So we're, our expansion could go really, really big, but we're always trying to maintain a, um, the tanks we do have too. Okay, all right. I'll chat with you offline, thanks. Okay, sounds good. All right, Vice Chair Covilla. Run one quick question, Chris, on the, on the new website, as far as the commission page, the old, like the meeting minutes and all that, I, I can't seem to find it on there. I, and I've had an individual reach out to me. Do you, do you know when you guys are gonna have all, is that up and running or? when you guys are going to have all that the, the archive of all the old commission stuff like we used to. yes so we're making decisions on how back how far back those minutes need to go and so maybe we can talk offline about um some of the minutes that are being needed we did try to we do have minutes up and but they're they're only going back three years so if we need to go further we'll, we'll, we'll definitely address that are you finding the minutes from for the last I, three years I couldn't find them. I, I, and maybe I need to mess around more on there. I, I couldn't, I couldn't find a link to, to pull that stuff up myself and the individual I talked to could either. So. Okay. Well, we'll definitely uh, address it if there is an issue on our end and make sure it makes, sure, make sure it gets corrected. Okay. Are there questions for Mr. Basie? Oh, okay. Thank if you. I, please, I'm sorry. Oh, sure. Everyone. Commissioner Perini. Thank you. Chris, I just wanted to ask you a question about the taxidermy. We were looking for all those animals and stuff. Uh, and I guess it was at uh, uh, a year now that we were trying to find that at the airport to keep it there. Um, has it been changed? Or trying to find the taxidermy for the sheep to be moved to a location. Is that what the question was? Yeah, there was quite a few of them at one time. There really was. Yeah, we are still seeking a home. And we have postponed some of that movement uh, thanks to the airport, they've let us do that, but we are still finding, um, looking for a location for it because it's a fairly substantial size. And I've actually uh, reached out to Commissioner East on this too. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm, we're trying to look far and wide for the best location to display. We definitely want it to be displayed in a high uh, visitation area. So we're still looking for that, that perfect spot. Well, if you don't mind, Chris, what I'd like to do is to, to go further than that and see if we can find some great places that we could put those animals in a certain location, talk about it with Endow. What I think it'd be a really good thing to do, and I'd hate to see it get lost. So if you don't mind, um, we could move forward and see if we can do it here in Northwestern Nevada. Will do. Okay, I'll let you two talk offline. Okay, thank you, Mr. Vasey. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, for the record, I'm Jen Newmark. I'm the Wildlife Diversity Division Administrator. Um, the primary focus of our recent work in the Diversity Division has been the revision of the State Wildlife Action Plan. The SWAP revision is a multi-division cross-departmental effort to update the plan as required every 10 years by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. There is concurrent work being done on multiple fronts, starting with designating and assessing species of greatest conservation need. 
in the 2020, in the 2012 plan, there were 256 species recognized as department priorities. All 256 of these species were re-evaluated by the Diversity, Game, and Fisheries Division staff. Species were evaluated based on various elements, including perceived population threats, Nevada's proportion of the species global population, population status and trend, and opportunity for engaging with partners. The new draft list consists of 308 species, and it's currently being reviewed by an external team of key agency partners. In addition, uh, we developed a survey that was distributed to a wide variety of federal and state agencies, universities, non-governmental organizations, and the interested public. We received over 1,500 survey responses, and we are currently um, reviewing those comments and suggestions. In addition to reviewing species of greatest conservation need, new habitat classifications were creating using biophysical settings and vegetative succession classes using the land fire program. This re represents a pivot from the habitat classification scheme in the 2012 swap. That scheme was based on modeled vegetative assemblages using climatic and geomorphological variables. The newer land fire program allows us to delineate ideal habitats and then evaluate deviations from this ideal to help us prioritize habitat types for restoration. These newer classifications are also being reviewed by agency partners and they are included in that wider survey. Concurrent to these efforts, staff in all divisions have been evaluating species for pressing threats and updating or developing comprehensive species accounts for all priority species. We are discussing approaches to including climate change to the plan, as well as strategies for developing goals and actions for species and habitats, which are a key element to the overall plan. A new element for the 2022 plan will be a chapter on regional and landscape conservation through financial support from the US Fish and Wildlife Services Science Application Program. Endow has hired a facilitator to work with both Arizona and Nevada on regional considerations. Since both states have a similar revision timeline, we are coordinating on creating cross boundary recommendations and developing distribution models for approximately 50 priority species that both states share. In addition, we are also working informally with Utah, California, New Mexico, and Idaho to discuss other collaboration opportunities. So while diversity staff have been primarily focused on the SWAP revision, uh, we also held our annual division meeting to coordinate surveys and other work in the upcoming year. We're also running winter raptor surveys this month and conducting winter hibernation roost surveys and white nose disease surveillance for bats across the state. And that is our update from the diversity division. I'm happy to answer any questions. You are busy. Any questions for Ms. Newmark? Commissioner McNinch. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Jen, you mentioned uh, there's a pretty substantial increase in the number of species that have made the concern list. Um, and you mentioned things like climate change and, you know, kind of addressing or looking at the, is there any particular thing that seems to be driving um, the addition of species to that um, list? Anything specific that you can note? Yes, um, thanks for the question. Uh, a large proportion of the additional species are songbirds that um, were newly evaluated by the Fish and Wildlife Service and um, that have been declining across their range. So remember the swap is meant to be proactive in our conservation activities. And so these are species that we wanna have on the radar and um, you know, be evaluating over the next 10 years for their declines in the state. That's the largest proportion. Um, there are a couple of other species that were left off of the old plan or are newly added and we're evaluating all those threats um, right now. Madam, Madam Chair, yes. if I might also just point out that that, that state wildlife action plan, uh, not only does it require that 
you know, revision at that specified interval. But that is the, the key document that is tied to Recovering America's Wildlife Act. So that 24 million federal dollars per year that we're talking about, the primary purpose of that money is to see through the implementation of that state wildlife action plan. So with 895 species under our statutory charge, having 308 built into that plan allows us the opportunity to use that 24 million federal and $8 million match towards the implementation of that plan. And that includes uh, education programs for those species, law enforcement for those species, habitat upon which those species depend. And so this document is really the, the focal point of Recovering America's Wildlife Act. So having that that those additional species, some may see it as, oh, is that is that burdensome? Is there regulatory consequences from having those species in a, in a wildlife action plan? And, and it's not, but it does open up opportunity to do proactive conservation. And the whole purpose of that Recovering America's Wildlife Act originally was to keep common species common. So having those species that were, were called out in the, the state of the birds, or having those in there that, that to, to Commissioner McNichol's question, I think that there's an increase of, I think, 52 species. A lot of that is just indicative of a better understanding of, of the status of those species, not that, you know, that they're imperiled because of anything that's happened in the last 10 years since the last time that plan was, was written or revised. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Yeah. And, and Tony, I appreciate you making that clarification because it's it is easy to lose uh, track of the the idea of keeping common species common, and and uh, um, it is a real unique um, opportunity. This uh, the Rawa, and uh, they are tied together. I really appreciate you tying all those together, and um, you know, uh, and re really emphasizing that uh, the point that conservation is keeping common species common <laughs> is a big part of it. So I appreciate that. One thing I just might also add is that, you know, we're still, um, you know, sifting through all the recommendations. We are still reviewing um, and having that list reviewed, but we do plan to do um, a more detailed presentation for you all once we get down the road a little bit so that we can highlight some of those changes and some of the reasons behind them and, um, and have a more fuller presentation than just this activity report today. That would be great. And I like, I love seeing the collaboration you're doing with our sister states or our neighboring states. That's, that's important. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Who's next? That would be me. Thank you, Madam Chair. For the record, I am Chris Cruikshanks, Fisheries Division Administrator, uh, and I've got a few updates for you. During the colder months, most of our fisheries division personnel are busy analyzing data, writing job progress reports, and preparing work plans for the upcoming field season. Staffing changes are a continuing theme in the fisheries division, as filling some positions has led to additional vacancies. We are very proud to announce that Travis Hawks recently accepted the position of Western Region Supervising Biologist, while Christy Klinger recently assumed the position of Staff Specialist for Native Aquatic Species here at the Reno headquarters. Both are, long, both are long tenured endow employees that bring a wealth of knowledge, strong work ethic and great attitudes to the fisheries team. We're certain they'll both excel in their new roles. Uh, from the AIS Species Program Fund front, uh, villager and zooplankton monitoring resulted in a dead quagga mussel villager being sampled from Walker Lake in November. Additional sampling was subsequently conducted at Walker Lake, as well as all upstream reservoirs and tributary, tributaries in Nevada and California, including Weber Reservoir, Bridgeport Reservoir, and Topaz Lake. All subsequent testing has been negative for quagga mussels. Uh, quagga mussels are not able to survive in Walker Lake. It is currently unknown where the villager may have originated, but a viable population does not appear to be present in the Walker River drainage at this time. Our AIS program recently conducted interviews for three new technician positions in Southern Nevada. Two of, the, two of the positions will be stationed at Lake Mead and will assist with daily AIS operations. Uh, and the third position will be a uh, roadside position at Alamo. From our fish hatchery front, Mason Valley Hatchery is currently raising approximately 25,000 YY brook trout eggs that we received from Idaho. 
The YY brook trout are part of a groundbreaking research to reduce brook trout impacts to native cutthroat trout populations by stocking all male brook trout into LCT waters that are occupied with brook trout. After multiple years of stocking the YY male brook trout, the sex ratio of the population is altered, resulting in an all male population that eventually dies out due to lack of reproduction. Mason Valley Hatchery and Gallagher Hatchery recently received their annual allotment of tiger trout and brown trout eggs from Utah. Gallagher Hatchery, Hatchery recently completed an annual, its annual December spawning activities of Eagle Lake strain rainbow trout uh, with the help of uh, quite a few Eastern region personnel. Quick note on water conditions, the winter of 2021-22 uh, roared into life, bringing with it much needed precip and snowpack. Uh, as of the writing of January 1st, most basins throughout Nevada were near or above 200% of average. Snow totals in the Lake Tahoe Basin shattered previous records for the month of December with more than 200 inches of snow. Uh, let's hope, wish, and pray that the remainder of the winter is as productive as the, as the start. So we had a super, super wet December followed by pretty much nothing of a January. So let's just hope that February is fantastic. From our Eastern region, a modern boat launch facility with an improved parking and picnic tables was recently completed at Cummins Lake. The improved boat launch is long overdue at the most used boating water in White Pine County. In addition, the fish salad was completed at Cave Lake in early December. Nearly 200 fish consisting primarily of wild brown trout were relocated from Cave Lake to Cummins Lake. And this salvage was completed as the lake is being drained to facilitate the construction of a new dam structure at Cave Lake in 2022. A fish salvage was also completed at Cold Creek Reservoir in anticipation of dam repairs planned there also in 2022. Nearly 300 cutboat trout and largemouth bass were relocated to Ruby Lake. Uh, from our southern region fisheries front, November marked our annual transition from warm water to cold water fish stocking at our urban ponds. From November through March, endow hatcheries will be stocking the southern region urban ponds with rainbow trout several times per month. Regional staff have been busy coordinating and participating in numerous annual winter coordination and conservation team meetings with our interagency partners. Endow spent a couple of weeks salvaging at days within the headwaters of the Muddy River in support of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service restoration efforts aimed at reducing a fish passage issue and improving the stream gauge. Annual monitoring of Razorback Sucker in Lake Mead kicked off in January and will be continuing through the spring. This monitoring includes netting surveys for spawning adult fish as well as monitoring for larval razorback supper, sucker at known locations. Also tagging and subsequent stocking of native razorback sucker and bony tail that have been held at the Lake Mead Hatchery um, is a key activity. To date, over 5,000 fish were stocked in Mead and Mojave. Uh, a recent renovation of our Lake Mead Hatchery Visitor Center is nearly complete and looks absolutely fantastic. Uh, many thanks to all the personnel across all divisions that have assisted with this effort. <clears throat> From the Western region, abbreviated annual electroshockings of the East and West Forks of the Walker River were completed in November. Um, as you might expect with low flows, uh, fish populations were very healthy upstream in some of our upstream reaches and they diminished greatly as, as we went downstream. BLM recently issued a finding of no significant impact in December for the environmental assessment associated with the Dixie Meadows Geothermal Project in Churchill County. Uh, this decision allows for the con construction of a geothermal power plant on a spring which supports the Dixie Valley toad, which is found nowhere else in the world. Uh, in response to this decision, a lawsuit was filed in court by the Center for Biological Diversity against the BLM claiming inadequate environmental analysis uh, was completed. Coordination also continues with a number of parties relating to a new trail with Truckee River access near Lockwood. Uh, some, some recent concerns from private land, landowners were addressed, and when completed, this trail will offer access to a greatly underutilized resource. Um, and, and lastly, a segment detailing our annual fish capture and spawning, spawning activities at Third and Incline Creeks, uh, which are tributaries of Lake Tahoe and Incline Village, was recently, recently aired by PBS and was extremely well received. The long-term study provides rainbow trout eggs for our hatcheries and serves as a surrogate study for the possible future reintroduction of Lahontan and cutthroat trout into Lake Tahoe tributary streams. Uh, and that's all I have. I'll be more than welcome to take any questions we might have.
Any questions for Mr. Crookshanks? I don't see any. Thank you for Thank your you report. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. You bet. Ms. Munoz. Thank you. For the record, Kim Munoz, Division Administrator, Data and Technology Services Division. In the Hutton Licensing Unit, we close out the 2021 license sales with a 0.91% of growth in hunting license sales for a total of 107,888. Uh, licenses that were sold. We did see a decre decrease in fishing license sales. Um, they were down 11.94% with a total of 161,911 fishing licenses that were sold in 2021. Uh, first come first serve program ended uh, this season. Uh, the first year was a huge success as uh, Zach Lambert gave your presentation and I just have a couple of uh, recaps for that as well is we made 987 big game tags available, including 173 antelope horns longer than ear tags, 13 antelope horns shorter than ear tags, two junior mule deer tags, 560 antlered mule deer tags, 12 antlerless mule deer tags, 102 antlered bull elk tags, 95 antlerless cow elk tags, 21 spike elk tags, seven Nelson Desert Bighorn Sheep Ram tags, and two Nelson Desert Bighorn Sheep U tags. There was a total of 170,553 dollars in revenues generated from the first come first serve tags. 127,736 dollars came from non-resident tag sales and $42,817 came from resident tag sales. This year, we only had 11 tags go unused compared to 991 in 2020 and 1,133 in 2019. On January 1st, our annual vessel auto renews went off very smoothly. We had 16,170 vessels auto renew, that is 48. 0.65% of the total vessels that have been renewed in the um, 2022 uh, registration year. Kalkamai completed the fulfillment quickly and had everything mailed out in just 10 days. Applications for spring turkey hunts opened on January 10th, and our licensing and hunt staff are preparing for the non-resident guided mule deer hunt that will open on February 7th. We are excited to offer some enhancements to this system this year um, that will allow master guides to see the clients that have applied underneath them, as well as the ability to see those clients draw results. We've scheduled a training session for the master guides on February 4th to demonstrate how this new feature works. In the geographic information system, staff completed a refresh of our Fish and Bee app to make it more user-friendly and better match the appearance of our Hunt and Bee app. They're also working on a more user-friendly approach to the draw odds in the Hunt and Bee app, and we're prepared to release that prior to our big game application opening in March. GIS staff also completed the initial draft of an interactive map that has the wildlife management areas across the state which contains their location along with some information about the wildlife and vegetation that can be found at each spot. The winter raptor survey form was updated and launched is currently being used by Endow and partner agency staff to enter any observations that they have. And lastly, in the information technology unit, staff have um, started the annual cycle of computer replacements and server replacements. Um, they have also received the new video conferencing equipment for the Elko office that will be installed this spring. That's all I have. Um, it'll take any questions that the commission might have. Any questions for Ms. Munoz? Hey, I don't see any, thank you. Chief Maynard. Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, <laughs> Chief Kim Warden, Mike Maynard, for the record. Um, in the law enforcement divisions, all game wardens 
in the uh, state went through the use of force training following legislative changes in the first approved policy through the new collective bargaining process with MPU. Three new game wardens graduated the academy. There was one new lateral game warden who started after a career in California as a peace officer. And one new game warden trainee started with an academy date beginning in January. Training outreach efforts started for partner agencies on how to investigate OUI cases around Lake Tahoe. This effort is anticipated to extend vessel operations and other efforts to enhance the law enforcement capabilities on the water around Lake Tahoe. Game wardens assisted local agencies with shop with a cop efforts in Lyon and Clark counties. Game wardens have assisted or worked with California, Alaska, Nebraska, Idaho, Arizona, and Utah with recent game violation investigations. Southern region game wardens assisted with river closure efforts while contractors removed an outdated cable from the Colorado River near Laughlin. Game wardens have recently investigated a case of diseased big game, three trapping cases, two mountain lion cases, multiple self-report wrong sex big game cases, and two private property cases. An Eastern region game warden assisted NHP with a fatal traffic incident. Game wardens have also checked in several mountain lions and responded to assist multiple incidents of big game and raptors which were injured or entangled in various materials. And that concludes my brief synopsis. Okay, thank you. Questions for Chief Maynard? I don't see any. Thanks for your report. Are we finished, Secretary Wasley? Yes, Madam Chair, that concludes the Department Activity Report. Thank you again uh, for that opportunity. I, I think it's invaluable just, again, to share the breadth and depth of everything that's that's going on. I know that you know, we have we have pressing items and issues that, that's, that this body uh, is required to focus on. Uh, so it's nice to at least take a little bit of time to provide that activity report so that you all and others in attendance can, can have a little glance into many things that that aren't on our agenda here. So thank you for that opportunity. You bet. Okay, it's 1230, um, 1227. Why don't we come back at 130? We'll take a, a break and we'll be back at 130. Thank you.
Okay, it's 1.30, if we can have everybody rejoin the meeting. Get started. Keep doing that, I put my computer on mute. Okay, <clears throat> we are back, it's 1.30. Uh, we're starting with item number seven on the agenda, Administrative Procedures, Regulations, and Policy, APRP Committee Report. Chairman, Chairman McNinch, a report will be provided on the recent APRP Committee meeting. So we didn't have a committee meeting, so we'll jump right into 7A. Commission Policy Number 1, General Guidelines for the Commission. Second reading, APRP Committee Chair Dave McNinch for possible action. The commission will have a second reading of commission policy one, general guidelines for the commission and may take action to repeal, revise or adopt the policy. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my voice is uh, disappearing slowly but surely, so you'll all be glad to know that uh, try to limit my comments as we go here. Kaylee, you're gonna do a lot of lifting today, but I know you're ready for it. So um, just real quick, we've got two policies, one and 10 that um, we are uh, considering, uh, we're going through for a second time to the commission. Um, I don't think that there's, uh, uh, on any of these, possibly number 67, we'll have a little com some conversation down there, but none, as, as daunting as it might look, I think today I'll go fairly smooth, fairly quick, um, a lot of cleanup type stuff. So uh, I don't anticipate um, a lot of conversation or a lot of issues with any one of these. I do think 67 will warrant some, uh, conversation there's been some proposed amendments from eureka cab and uh so we'll want to touch base on those but uh, kaylee i'm going to turn it over to you and um let you explain what we've got and what we're trying to accomplish today and um again one in ten for a second reading today the remaining commission policies i think our goal is to um, modify, revise, make our comment and bring back to a second commission meeting uh in the near future Kaylee, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner McNinch. Um, and I do want to apologize in advance. Um, I am stuck at home. I have not been feeling the best also. Um, and it's the way my setup is, is when I look at you guys, I'm, it looks as though I'm looking up. So I just want you guys to know that means I'm looking at you. Um, and I wanted to start with that. Um, and also, unfortunately, you guys are going to be stuck with me for the rest of the afternoon. So um, I hope my voice lasts too, but um, we do have administrators on that can help. So um, to get started, um, Commissioner McNinch was exactly right. Most of these policies on the agenda today are um, just cleanup versions, um, except for policy 67. Um, but I did want to also note that the formatting of every policy will be updated as they're approved so that um, the formatting looks consistent from policy to policy. We're using consistent terminology and acronyms policy to policy. Um, so I did want to let you guys know that as we approve policies, I will update them um, so that they all match and are formatted the same. Um, so to start out with commission policy one, this is the second reading. There were no questions or changes to this policy um, at our last commission meeting. And this is just general guidelines for the commission. So um it's helpful when we're selecting chair and vice chair um approving agendas and um just administrative duties that the or that the commission handles and then i also had added in um the wildlife trust fund portion um as it came out of our last assembly bill in the 2021 session so that was uh, the biggest change to commission policy one that was made but um, as I stated, there were no questions or comments or requested changes after our last commission meeting. Okay, anyone have questions or comments for Ms. Musso? Okay, I don't see any. Um, this is an action item, so get my screen here. We will take it out for public comment. We have any public comment on commission policy number one? <clears throat> Raise your hand in the chat if you have comments on commission policy number one. Okay, 
I don't see any. We'll come back to the commission for a motion to approve or other discussion. Commissioner McNinch. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll make a motion to approve uh, Commission Policy 1 uh, as revised. Okay, we have a motion. Do we have a second? I have a second by Commissioner Rogers. So we have a motion to approve uh, from Commissioner McNinch and a second by Commissioner Rogers to approve commis Commission Policy Number 1, General Guidelines for the Commission. All in favor, raise your hand. Okay, motion carries nine to zero. Thank you. Okay, <clears throat> moving on to 7B, Commission Policy 10, Heritage Tags and Vendors, second reading, APRP, Committee Chairman David McNinch for possible action. The Commission will have a second reading of Commission Policy 10, Heritage Tags and Vendors, and may take action to repeal, revise, or adopt the policy. Thank you, Chairwoman East. Uh, Kaylee Musso again for the record. Um, again, this is the second reading for this policy. So the department is requesting you guys to adopt commit the changes to commission policy 10. Again, um, it is mostly a cleanup um, version of the reg or of the policy, I apologize. Um, we did change um, in number one, the meeting, the February commission meeting to just the first scheduled commission meeting of the calendar year. Um, clearly, we don't always meet in February as our first meeting. In fact, most of the time it's January. Um, so that explains that change. And then um, we added an item G for an explanation of if or how the auction will take place um, online or via phone. And um, we just recognize the need for that um, throughout COVID. So. Um, those are really the big changes to this policy, but we are here for any questions. Hey, questions for Ms. Musso. Commissioner Rogers. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I noticed that one of the changes was on item number six uh, regarding the vendor may not allow a wildlife tag to be auctioned, resold, bartered, trade uh, at another fundraising event without the approval of the commission. Just curious why or the thought process behind striking that from the policy. Thank you, um, Commissioner Rogers. Uh, we did discuss this briefly um, during our committee meeting and I, I apologize if we didn't mention it um, during our last commission meeting, but we did strike that language because we do have proof that tags have been um, auctioned or resold or bartered and we can't really, we don't really have much control over that anyways. Um, that's that's the explanation that I was aware of. John and would like to add to that, then I would invite him to as well. Did you ask for Deputy Director Rob? You kind of cut out there for a second. Oh, yes, I did. I apologize. Um, I don't know if he's available or not, but I would also um, be willing to get you a, a better explanation, Commissioner Rogers. Oh, he's on. <laughs> there he is. Chuck Rowe, for the record, I apologize. I stepped out on multitasking preparing for a trial at the same time I'm doing this today. So could you re-ask the question and I will do my best to answer it. Uh, Deputy Director Rob, it was concerning policy 10, uh, the number six, the vendor may not allow a wildlife heritage tag to be auctioned, resold, bartered, or traded at another fundraising event without the approval of the commission. And that was struck? Yes. And uh, Jack Rob, again, for the record, we know on a regular basis that these tags are sold at the event that you uh, approve. And it, I think the commission has done a great job to this point to uh, approve the venues that garner the most revenue for the state of Nevada. But uh, we oftentimes see an auction tag go very high, and then that successful bidder uh, determines that they're overbooked in their calendar. And a lot of times the original bidder uh, is not the person that ends up having the tag. There's a number of days that you can transfer that tag. And we often see a different individual claim the tag when they come in. Uh, most of the time we've seen that it has been at a reduced price. I know of multiples that 
Uh, one individual uh, helped us out and got a great auction value for it. But then uh, in turn, uh, somebody else uh, buys it from that individual and um, we, we benefit by the extra dollars and somebody benefits by uh, picking a tag up at a, at a decent price and getting into the field. That answer your question, Commissioner Rogers. Okay. Other questions? Okay, seeing none, we'll take it out for public comment. We're taking public comment on agenda item uh, 7B, which is commission policy 10. Uh, Mr. Dixon. Thank you, uh, <clears throat> Chair East. Um, I guess when we talked in our cab, um, it was brought up that um, we currently have an NGO that had to move their banquet because of COVID. And because of that, they had a heritage tag that they had to send back to the department. And there are other NGOs having banquets that would have allowed that Turkey heritage tag to have been uh, used at those banquets had the language up above not been stricken. I mean, or, or if the language had been changed to that, and we made a recommendation, a vendor may trade or donate a heritage tag to another NGO with approval of endo. In other words, why would we want to send it back or it go through the whole process? Why wouldn't we want to find an event or a NOVA event and, and work with the department to get that tag reissued? It's not a reselling of a tag or anything. It's a tag that will, will not be used because it's a turkey tag. And because of the timing of the, of the rescheduling of the event, that turkey tag can't be used. So we were looking for language that accommodated that sort of an event in this heritage thing that said, if you had a tag, your banquet got moved, canceled or whatever, there's a host of reasons beside COVID that could happen. Could you get it to another NGO with the approval of the Department of Wildlife so that it could be auctioned? That's the thought. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dixon. Other public comment on policy 10. Okay, I don't see any, we'll bring it back. Uh, Ms. Musso or Deputy Director Rob. Jack Rob for the record. Uh, I fully understand uh, what Cab Person uh, Dixon brought up and that is going to be discussed tomorrow. Uh, we did have uh, Mr. Reese uh, send us an email saying that their banquet had moved. Mm -hmm. And what we're bringing forward tomorrow uh, is we've looked at the events that the commission has already approved the auction tags to be at. There's Mealy Fanatics in Northern Nevada. This year, a front chapter of Mealy Fanatics has an uh, event that has a turkey tag that meets the timing before the hunt. And then the other one uh, that has a tag is Meadow Valley. And so with those two as viable options to get those tags to, we're going to ask the commission to assign that tag to one of those. Uh, somebody that already has a tag, somebody that uh, is already marketing a tag for that event. So that's what we're trying to do. And then during that same discussion, we're going to ask for some leeway if we have any other tags that uh, come back unexpectedly because events are, are canceled, that we have ability to move it to any event that already has an auction tag at it. We wouldn't uh, want to move it to an event that's not already advertised auction tags, but if there's another event that meets the timing of the tag, that you've already approved the sale of an auction tag at, we would like to move it to that event and, and get those tags uh, into a, a viable auction. So that's part of tomorrow, tomorrow's discussion. And I just wanted to ensure today that uh, the, the things that Mr. Dixon brought up have been considered and we're trying to, to simplify that process moving forward. Okay, so two things. My understanding is that is that the change in a tag and an auction heritage auction tag has to come before the commission, not end out, correct? At the current time, yes. Yes, okay. So should we table this to our next meeting then to um, capture 
the, the language that we discussed tomorrow? Is that what I'm hearing? It, it may help. Uh, the, COVID has made auction tags a very dynamic and forever changing item. And, and luckily we've hooked up with onlineauctions.com. Uh, we, we need some leeway to be able to accommodate uh, a COVID type scenario with short time frames before events when they're canceled to make sure that we can get these tags out and generate the revenues that we're relying on. So uh, I hate to put this off, but tomorrow's discussion will further uh, where we're trying to get to. Okay. Uh, Chairman McNinch or Commissioner McNinch, I, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, it, it, if we need to delay, this is, it's not an issue. We can certainly do that. Um, uh, you know, this COVID thing is, you know, speaking optimistically, um, <laughs> yeah, uh, Kaylee, I feel your pain, I think. <laughs> so um, optimistically, you know, hopefully things will smooth out and, you know, the, these types of things are going to be um, uh, very infrequent again and uh, not, not a part of our normal uh, procedure. And I, I think um, we'll hear what Jack and the department um, has uh, going tomorrow and we can bring this back at the next meeting. Uh, you know, it's nice to get these done and we want to be timely about it, but um, we're not in such a crunch that we have to push things through if we're not quite ready. So we're fine. Okay. Okay. Deputy Director Rob. As we table this item for today, uh, can we get some direction that, yeah, we understand that the department needs the ability to make some of these changes, but we would only do it to a vendor that has already been approved through the commission process. We would, we would not seek out vendors that weren't approved through the commission process without bringing it back to the commission. If that is understood and it would help Kaylee move forward to make some small changes to what we have in front of you today. Okay. Mr. McNinch, are you good with that? Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't have a problem. We want to, you know, I think, I think, um, you know, it's, uh, it's kind of a, a, a fun part of our job, you know, to, to issue those heritage tags. I know that, you know, it's we we're always worried about hurting feelings and stuff, um, and I know that it's, uh, uh, it's a big part of what we do. It's a really important part of what we do. But um, once those things are issued. If there's, uh, if there's some situations that require uh, being light on our feet, I think it's prudent that we build that in. And um, I don't have a problem with that. If there's some proposed language that the department would like to throw in there that would um, give them that latitude, or uh, I think it's, you know, we can certainly take a look at it at the next commission meeting and we can go from there. Okay. Does that, does that help, Jack? Is that what you're looking for? Is that... Definitely so, I, Jack Rob again for the record, definitely so that does help us out. Uh, luckily this time uh, we did receive that letter prior to this commission meeting so we can discuss it. But if that letter would have come in next week, that tag for that turkey tag would have started before our next commission meeting. It, 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 we, would have been, we would have been just sacrificing one of those tags at that point because we wouldn't have been able to turn around. That's why we need some of the leeway that's not currently spelled out. Okay. okay. We don't need a motion for that, do we? No. I, don't think so. I think we've, we've, uh, okay. yeah, we've shared our intent and I think the department kind of approached us about, uh, about the possibility. So maybe, you know, we'll rely on them to bring some revised language back and we'll, we'll, uh, take a look at it. Okay. Thank you. All right. So we're good on uh, 7B. We'll move on to 7C, Commission Policy 31, Lahont and Cutthroat Trout Management, first reading, APRP Committee Chairman David McNinch for possible action. The Commission will have a first reading of Commission Policy 31, Lahont and Cutthroat Trout Management, and may take action to repeal or revise the policy. The Commission may advance the policy to a second reading for possible adoption at a future meeting. Thank you, Chairwoman East. Um, as you stated, 
The rest of these policies are only up for a first reading, so there will be no movement um, on these policies and no action taken technically. Um, anyways, but to get started with policy 31, this one truly is a cleanup change. Um, our new fisheries division administrator, Mr. Cookshanks, did take the liberty of cleaning up this policy and updating it so that um, it's usable now. Um, we also added in the associated updated goals and objectives for the conservation of Lahontan cut cutthroat trout um, referenced in number one. Um, that was really the only addition to this. Um, the rest of these are just minor cleanup changes. And then we removed number 12. Um, I did want to note pretty quickly, um, the changes in red were the department's initial changes and then the text in blue is um, stuff we added in our last commission meeting or committee meeting. Um, and then there were a couple CAB comments I just wanted to note for you guys. Uh, Douglas CAB pointed out that there's a typo in number five. There's not a space between two and protect. So um, I will be planning on fixing that. Um, and then the only other CAB comment on this policy was from Eureka. And um, I can't remember if they're on or not, but their comment was just that they would like to see number 12 kept in the policy. Oh, and Mr. Cookshanks is on in case you have any questions for him. Okay. Questions for Ms. Musso, Commissioner Almberg, and then Commissioner Burns. Yes, I, I guess I just wanted to get a clarification of why uh, the reasoning behind the elimination of uh, line item 12. I can speak to that, uh, Division Administrator Crookshanks, for the record. Um, the specific line item number 12 was removed because uh, traditionally the recovery activities for Lawton cutthroat trout uh, range-wide were covered under the, the uh, range-wide recovery plan, which was, was grossly outdated and in need of update. Um, but the Fish and Wildlife Service, rather than um, rewrite the recovery plan um, went under uh, a pretty uh, aggressive endeavor to to create what, what's called the updated goals and objectives for the conservation of lot and cup of trout and those updated goals and objectives are referred to in uh, number one and they're, they're commonly called the Yugos, um, which is is basically a framework and a blueprint and a plan of, of what all the, the partnering agencies how they're going to uh, move forward with the restoration and recovery of lawn and cutthroat trout. It's just, it's it's in lieu of a recovery plan. So the, the updated goals and recoveries outline, um, like I said, specific act actions by by each agency as, as to their roles in recovery. Um, so with, with the Yugos in place, number 12 seemed very redundant. Any, anything that was covered in number 12 is, is covered um, completely, if not more so, in, in the updated goals and, and objectives. So it was, it was just a redundancy issue. Okay, someone else had their hand up. Commissioner Barnes, was it you? It was, but Commissioner Almberg uh, stole my thunder and asked the same question I was going to. <laughs> Darn it, okay. All right, save your thunder, thanks. Any other questions? Okay, seeing none, we'll take this out for public comment. Do we have public comment on commission policy number 31? Not appear that we have public comment on policy 31, so we'll bring it back to the commission or Further discussion, a motion. Yeah, Madam Chair, was there, so I, I guess I would ask is that, is there still concern, um, Commissioner Holmberg, um, after after the, the explanation or is it something that you're okay with at this point? Oh, no, I'm, I'm perfectly comfortable with it. I, 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 I'm glad I'm, the explanation was perfect for me, thank you. Okay, good. Okay. Then if there's no other concerns or comments, mm -hmm. I'll uh, 
I'll make a motion to uh, um, forward commission policy number 31 uh, to a future commission meeting for a second reading. Okay, we have a motion. Do we have a second? We have a second by Commissioner Weiss. Okay, we have a motion by Commissioner McNinch, a second by Commissioner Weiss to, Weiss to adopt, sorry, to advance commission policy 31 to a future meeting. All in favor, raise your hand. Okay, motion carries nine to zero. Thank you. And I guess, Madam Chair, um, I guess by uh, by taking action, by actually making a motion, is that is that preferred over just moving it to another than you just putting it on a future agenda item or is it do we need to um, do we need to actually take action or make a motion to, to advance these if there's no changes or anything or um i prefer it to be a little bit more formal okay good. we right. may not need to be but i prefer it to be a little bit okay. more that works for me okay thank you all right we're moving on to 7d Commission Policy 33, Fisheries Management Program, first reading, APRP Committee Chairman David McNinch for possible action. <clears throat> the commission will have a first reading of Commission Policy 33, Fisheries Management Program, may take action to repeal or revise the policy. The commission may advance the policy to a second reading for possible adoption at a future meeting. Thank you, Chairwoman East. Uh, Kaylee Musso again for the record. Again, um, this is another cleanup fisheries policy. Um, we did update the number of Endangered Species Act reference in this policy. Um, other than that, it's mostly all cleanup. Um, you'll notice that we added social media under angler access for um, opportunities to publicize programs. Um, and then another language change is we added and or salvage behind um, where you'll notice the word harvest. Um, and that's so that we can salvage fish also. Um, but other than that, uh, Mr. Cookshanks and I are available for questions. Okay. I just saw one little cleanup thing under background. The third line up from that second paragraph is commission supports. There ne we need a, a space there between commission and supports. <clears throat> Do you see that? No? Under back, it's the third line on the first paragraph under background. Third line from the bottom. Oh, the sorry. second paragraph. Commission supports. Okay, yes. That's, I see that. that was all I saw. Perfect. For grammatical or clerical. Questions? Commissioner Weiss. Um, I just had one more grammatical thing. Um, under aquatic invasive species, the last the change that was made under that paragraph. Um, there's an extra eye in aquarium. So just minor clip. Okay. I don't see that. You have that, Kaylee? I, I'm not seeing it right at the minute, but I wrote down um, Fishner Wise's comment. So uh, I will go back through and um, make sure I find that before next meeting. Okay. Okay, other questions or comments? Okay, seeing them, we'll go out for public comment on policy 33. Do we have any public comment on commission policy 33? Okay, I don't see any, we'll bring it back for uh, further discussion or a motion. Oh, I see aquarium right there. Commissioner McNinch. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll make a motion to move uh, commission policy number 33 uh, to a uh, second hearing at a future commission meeting. Okay, do I have a second? I have a second by uh, Vice Chair Cavillia. Okay, so we have a Motion by Commissioner McNinch and a second by Vice Chair Cavillia to advance Commission Policy 33 to a future meeting. All in favor, raise your hand. Okay, motion carries nine to zero. Thank you. All right, Commission Policy 63, protecting wildlife from toxic ponds. 
first reading APRP committee chairman, David McNinch for possible action. The commission will have a first reading of commission policy 63, protecting wildlife from toxic ponds and may take action to repeal or revise the policy. The commission may advance the policy to a second reading for possible adoption at a future meeting. Thank you, Chairwoman East, Kaylee Musa for the record. Um, on commission policy 63, the department actually did not recommend any changes at this time. Uh, this policy was, or is fairly up to date as it was updated during the um, mining regulation renewal on industrial and artificial pond review, um, which was a couple of years ago, um, just in 2017 actually. So um, we are not recommended any changes on this policy, but um, myself and Habitat Division Administrator Alan Janae are on if you'd like to have any questions. I just have one question. Do we need to add under the heading up there, do we need to add that we reviewed it in 2021 just for, for historical purposes? I can definitely um, make a note of that on these policies if, if that's the commission's wish. Um, we are required to review all of the policies every um, X number of years. So um, we know that we go through them all every few years, but um, I don't think it would hurt to add a reference date on there um, if the commission chooses. Okay. I would like to see that just so that it it's dated and we know, and because maybe in 10 years, we all won't be around here. <laughs> so, <laughs> around here. <laughs> Hopefully we'll still be here. Okay. Yes. Sorry. Have adding some fun to the afternoon. <laughs> All right, any questions on commission policy 63? Okay, I don't see any, any public comment on commission policy 63. Mr. Dixon. Thank you, Chair East and commissioners. Um, you're gonna get uh, the comment that the Clark cab had came from the two chemists on the clerk cab, which is myself and John Hyatt. Um, one of them is, is that I realize that this has to do with toxic ponds, but we have a lot of toxic pit lakes that are left from some of our open mining things. Does this policy cover toxic pit lakes or toxic you know, pit lakes? And, and, and I didn't know the answer to that question. The other thing is, is that we talk about cyanide and other chemicals. Um, are we worried about compounds and elements? Because a lot of these ponds have arsenic, um, they have um, it, mercury, they have other elements in them that are just as, they may not be instantaneously toxic like cyanide, but they're, uh, they're a uh, environmental buildup in, in, in animals that eat them, uh, you know, whether it be uh, as you go up the food chain. And so do we want to, you know, when we say chemicals, it does not include elements like arsenic and mercury. And I just wondered if we wanted to put in there, you know, basically, you know, cyanide, you know, Toxic compounds and elements is, is is was our recommendation on our on our cab notes and the, both of those come from a from from chemists thinking about just chemical wording on this not so much other things and whether or not it's important if if we're really just worried about instantaneous deaths from something like consuming cyanide then I agree with that but if we're looking at buildup in the environment because you have mercury or arsenic or cadmium and and other things in here. Do we really want to uh, to account for that in here? Because that would be part of the testing program results. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dixon. <clears throat> Mr. Volz. Yes, good afternoon. For the record, Fred Volz. The largest toxic ponds in Nevada by surface area are at Silver Peak's existing lithium carbonate evaporation process. Nevada may have two more of these large toxic pond complexes at two proposed lithium mine sites, Rhyolite Ridge and Thacker Pass. As currently expressed, how does this policy ensure that alternatives to evaporative ponds are explored and implemented as a protective measure for wildlife species? This step becomes especially important given the scarcity of groundwater in these areas. The Industrial Artificial Pond Program administered by NDOW collects fees, but there is no visible, periodic, and public reporting of the known mortalities by wildlife species and geographic area to determine whether the implemented mitigation efforts are working or need revision. 
These mortality numbers likely undercount the mortalities since some wildlife species ingest the toxic liquid and die elsewhere. Some type of informed guesstimate needs to include those unidentified deaths in summary mortality statistics. Under policy number one, what numeric threshold is considered, quote, incidental mortality? Is the number 10, 100, 1,000, or 10,000 for a given area in a given period of time? Why isn't it required to be specifically defined so that there is a hard metric for measurement and assessment purposes? For Silver Peak, the federal government gave complete liability immunity to its operators for wildlife species deaths. If the same liability waiver is granted for Rhyolite Ridge and Thacker Pass or any other future industrial project on federal land, how do the five 2017 policies protect wildlife species from bad operating practices since there are no meaningful consequences for errant operators? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Boltz. Do we have any other public comment on policy number 63? Okay, I don't see any. So we'll bring it back to the commission for further discussion. Mr. Janae, do you, um, did you wanna uh, maybe respond to Mr. Dixon's suggestions? Uh, yeah, so again, for the record, Alan Janae, Habitat Division Administrator. Um, one of the things that, that folks should keep in mind is, is, is this is a, a commission policy. Um, and so it's really more about the general guidance of the commission to the department. Um, if you're worried about the specifics of it um, and how we interpret it, it's written in law and that that's in that initial guidance of NRS 502-390. And then also under NAC, starting at uh, uh, 502-47, I believe it's 475. Um, and so that's kind of where it lays out the specifics of the program um, and lays out much more detail. And the comment that Mr. Dixon threw out as far as, uh, you know, the adding to you know the chemical it's actually within the regs and it, it kind of stipulates a little bit further um so i i would say um i took a look at it i think we're good but um if the folks that had those comments could take a look at those regulations and see if that meets their needs before the next reading um that'd probably be appropriate okay I wonder if we should include that, that in AC. We could, we could include the NRS, uh, we could include an NRS citation and then the NACs, yes. Okay. Other comments, uh, Commissioner McNeil. Thank you, Madam Chair. So following along those lines with uh, Mr. Volt's comments, Alan, um, the, the reporting of these, uh, you know, of the, um, the reporting of, of wildlife deaths um, from these toxic ponds and stuff. I know I've heard this story before, but it, it's, it's a long time in between. So if you could, if you, could you give us a real quick rundown on how that system works, how that process works, and um, we can see if we need to make some other considerations with respect to this policy. Yeah, so there's a, a quarterly reporting that's required by the permit holders, um, and they report, um, plus we do inspections, um, and it's in dealing with artificial ponds and, and waters is that it's all about exclusure, exclosure of wildlife, either through fencing or through uh, bird balls that float on top of the water to prevent the animals from being able to access it. And so um, if you recall, uh, I've done a presentation on our, when we were going through the reg development process and refining that back in 2017, we actually uh, gave a presentation. Um, this, this regulation was put in place because of 
the mortalities that we were seeing on animals. But as soon as we implemented this and we worked with the industry, we saw a significant reduction. I mean, a, a very substantial reduction in, in the amount of mortalities. Um, we track it, they report it. Um, but if the commission would like, I mean, we could come back and give you an overview of the mining program again um, to give you more detailed information for consideration. Does that answer your question, Mr. McNinch? Mr. It, McNinch? It, it does. Um, you know, we could we could certainly, um, you know, I, I think it goes to that, you know, the, the transparency aspect. Um, the information's there, the actions are there, um, but maybe maybe uh, looking into making it more, more of a conversation piece or more of a, uh, you know, something that it's more out there. I mean, let's face it, these things are going to be, you know, there's going to be more of these things, um, likely. And, um, you know, it's certainly something to, to consider. And, and I think that the, um, the public is going to have, uh, interest in it. And I, um, I think that our interests are largely covered through the department. I know that, you know, uh, um, I appreciate the update, Alan, because I do recall that now. And, and, uh, I do remember the, the update that, uh, that the, the, the new system, the new um, regulations had resolved a lot of the concerns that the department had had that prompted those. So, um, but uh, when we don't talk about them very often, then, then we forget. So um, maybe there's some kind of a, something in our policy that um, helps us update or helps us, uh, I don't know, you see where I'm headed. So I'm open to suggestions on that, Alan, if there's an easy way to um, just keep us informed or updated. That would be that would be helpful. Yeah, thank you, Commissioner McNanch. I, I can, uh, uh, you know, I can work with you guys, uh, Chairwoman East. If, if if you guys want to schedule that where we give an update, we can absolutely do that. Um, we can bring back another presentation um, and give you an update of where we've been. Um, the the tracking of the system, it is a it is an old paper, you know, reporting type of system. And we've been trying to get to a place where we can find the capacity and time to be able to update that so that it's a more user-friendly and more instantaneous process. But you can imagine when you've got, uh, I think we've got 184 permits spread across the state and each one of them is mailing something in quarterly, um, trying to get those, you know, pulled together, um, it's something we do annually, but um, we can we can get you a report and give you an update on where things stand currently. Okay, Commissioner McNinch, would it be your uh, comfort to send this back to APRP, or do you want to bring it back to the commission next at a future meeting? Yeah, uh, I would. I would prefer to just keep it on the track it's on. Bring it back. And okay. maybe between now and the next commission meeting, Kaylee and Alan and I can have a real quick conversation and see if there's um, something that's reasonable, <laughs> practical, that, that might resolve some of the concerns and, um, you know, that we could present at, the, at, a, at a future commission meeting sooner than later. But uh, I, I think we can do that. If, if, Alan, you're up for it, it sounds like, and, um, you know, we can, we can work on that. Okay, so it sounds like we probably need to table this one, but leave it on with new info. Okay, Is that okay? Yeah, we can do it. We can do it either way. We can just bring it back when we're when we're ready, or we can do it as a second reading. It doesn't matter. I, I we can bring it back as a just. We'll bring it back at the next uh, the next meeting, and we'll just start from where we're at. We'll table it, like you said. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Then we'll move on to agenda item 7F, which is commission policy 64 input on land sales, transfers, and exchanges. First reading APRP committee chairman, David McNinch for possible action. The commission will have a first reading of commission policy 64 input on land sales, transfers, and exchanges, and may take action to repeal or revise the policy. The commission may advance the policy to a second reading for possible adoption at a future meeting. Thank you, Chairwoman East. Uh, Kaylee Musso again for the record. The department did not have any changes um, to this policy. Um, again, we are 
guided by NA, NRS and NAC when it comes to land sales and transfers as well. So um, I just wanted to make that point on this policy also. Um, and then note that the only change I have to this policy is a very minor one on number three, and it's to make input one word rather than two. Okay, questions? Comments? Commissioner Barnes, do you have a, no? Okay, all right. So seeing no questions or comments, we'll take it out for public comment. Uh, we're, we'll take public comment on Commission Policy P6, or sorry, 64. Commission Policy 64. Okay, I don't see any public comment. We'll bring it back for a motion or further discussion. Commissioner McNinch. Madam Chair, I'll make a motion to uh, move commission policy number 64 uh, to a second hearing um, at a future commission meeting. Okay, we have a motion. Do we have a second? I have a second by Commissioner Perini. So we have a motion by Commissioner Inch and a second by Commissioner Perini to advance commission policy 64 to a future meeting. All in favor, raise your hand. Okay, motion carries nine to zero. Thank you. Whew. All right. Seven. Madam Chair, if I can yes. very, very briefly, um, uh, Commission Policy 65, which is not on here today, um, I just didn't want, no, I don't think anybody's necessary to keep in track, but in case they are, um, it's not on the agenda today. It is something that's uh, largely ready to bring to the commission. And Alan, I believe that, and Kaylee, correct me if I'm wrong, but we might wait to bring that forward until uh, the Licking Ranch um, kind of falls falls into place or whatever uh, the process is there so that we can just bring back at one time and include uh, the Licking Ranch as a wildlife management area um, when the time is appropriate. So um, no hurry on that one. I just wanted to not lose track of it on the record, so. Okay, thank you. Okay, so 7G, Commission Policy 67. Fed, I think this should be feral horses and burrows. First reading APRP, maybe it is federal horses and burrows. First reading APRP, Committee Chairman David McNinch for possible action. The commission will have a first reading of Commission Policy 67, federal horses and burrows, and may take action to repeal or revise the policy. The commission may advance the policy to a second reading for possible adoption at a future meeting. Thank you, Chairwoman East. Um, this policy um, did get a lot of changes. Um, we worked in conjunction with uh, the Coalition for Nevada's Healthy Land in updating this policy. Um, they have been asking for a few years now for us to take a look at this. Um, and and the APRP committee is now reviewing our policy, so we finally got around to it. Um, I do want to leave the explanation of the changes to someone that has a little bit more knowledge than me, so I'll leave that to Habitat Division Administrator Alan Janae. But I did want to let you guys know that we attached both a clean version and a marked up version, and we attached the marked up version um, because I know you guys would want to see the changes, but then um, they were just so many that we wanted you guys to have a clean version as well. So um, both both versions are in front of you. Um, it is all policy 67. And then um, maybe we could talk about the title also. Um, so you're good, Alan. Yes, uh, for the record, Alan Janae, have that vision administrator. And so if you look down to the marked up version, um, this was a draft that was a uh, coalition for healthy Nevada lands took a first stab at rewriting this uh, policy and it was presented to the APRP committee um, in September. Um, based on some conversations that happened at that committee. Um, Department of Wildlife worked with the coalition to try to uh, 
make some modifications there and change some wording, some structure. Um, came up with this version that currently sits in front of you. Um, presented that at the October APRP meeting. And it is a rather extensive rewrite, um, refreshment, trying to uh, depict the current state of where while the horse and burros are in the state of Nevada at this time, um, trying to do a better job of representing uh, some of the uh, federal legislation, and then trying to set some uh, connection to some other plans that have been developed at a national level, um, such as the uh, path forward, um, which is referenced in the, in the policy. Um, and uh, to try to get to a solution of getting us back or providing guidance in the hopes of getting back to appropriate management level um, for the horse herds in the state of Nevada. Um, it calls out some specific items in here um, as far as, uh, I'll, I'll just quickly write, walk through the policies number one through nine. Um, the Board of Wildlife Commissioners recognizes the exponential growth of free raiming horses and burros in Nevada and the current and future health and viability of wildlife um, that the, those horse numbers pose a problem to them. Uh, Commission supports compliance with the Act of 1971, ensuring healthy landscapes and humane management, rearranging horse and burrows. Um, number three is again, um, stating that the Board of Wildlife Commissions uh, believes that the time frame of the path forward, the 20 year timeline to reach AML on the path forward is, they would like to find a shorter time frame. They support the goal of the path forward, but would like to see shorter timelines. Um, number four, management actions based on, commission supports management actions based on scientific research on free ranging horse and burrows. Uh, on the use of public land resources and development of best management practices. Number five, the coalition supports collaboration of stakeholders and agencies to develop best management practices and managing free ranging horse and burrows within a thriving ecological balance with wildlife plants and pollinators. Number six, Nevada Board of Wildlife Commission and NDOW shall provide letters of support for projects or plans proposed by BLM or other agencies managing free ranging horse and burrows that propose actions to achieve AML in agreement with other objectives of this policy. Number seven, and now shall provide to the Nevada Board of Wildlife Commission on an annual basis and in concert with BLM and other agencies managing free ranging horses and burrows, uh, a listing of those areas where free ranging horse and burrows are having the most significant impact on wildlife, uh, focused on those habitats critical for law and cut Grouse, sage grouse, and other threatened sensitive wildlife. Um, upon the commission approval, the report uh, will accompany a uh, request by the commission to the agencies that manage horses for the removal of excess horses and burrows to low to AML on herd management area lands and to be totally removed from those lands. Um, number eight, the board. Wildlife Commissioner supports and recognizes the urgency of removal of free ranging horse and burrows outside HMAs and the reduction of horses within the HMAs to their appropriate, appropriate uh, management levels to uh, provide critical resources to wildlife in maintaining the thriving natural ecological balance. And so it was a refresh, like I say, uh, a little bit of tying to the the current uh, solutions that have been brought to bear more at a national uh, level. And I'll hold there okay. before I go on. Okay, do we have questions for Mr. Janae at this point? Vice Chair Cavilia? 
one item, Alan, that came up in the committee meeting was <clears throat> is if we needed if we looked into adding another bullet under the policy regarding uh, if nothing happened, adding legal action to that. Did you you guys were gonna? It was my understanding you guys were gonna get with the coalition and see what their thoughts were on that. Um, that's what I recall from that committee meeting. <clears throat> yeah, thank you for the question, Commissioner Cavilia. I this has been bounced around a few times. I don't think that there is any uh, current path. Well, I won't say path forward. But there's there's no uh, agreement on what that would look like. Um, I think it's kind of been left for consideration of this commission, and in that discussion of. Uh, the possibility of legal action as we discussed it in the past is um, the commission and the state uh, department of wildlife we don't have the ability and and i'm speaking well outside my my range uh, my biological range so craig burkett feel free to weigh in but uh you know we could only recommend legal action we couldn't ensure that legal action, we would offer it for consideration of the AG's office, Attorney General's office, and it would be beyond either the commission or the department to be able to ensure that legal action was taken. Um, let's see if Dag Burkett can weigh in for us. There he is. Right. Yeah, so I can certainly say that um, we have authorities existing in law to enforce federal agencies that do not um, meet federal regulation or statute to do so. I, my experience with uh, the department and this commission is that that would be, that would not be your primary, uh, that would not be something that you're going to primarily resort to, um, but you certainly have those authorities. Um, so that exists in law. Okay. Am I missing something? I don't believe so. Does that answer your question, Vice Chair? And, and I guess like we talked in the committee, that, that would be the, if all else fails, that's the end option, right? That's the final option that would be on the table. Is, and then do we want to put that within the policy? I guess that's the question we have to answer. Um, I have one other item on, on policy number eight, and it's just a we referenced AML everywhere else, and I know in there we put appropriate management level, and I don't know if we just want to put AML there to match all the others. We defined AML up above. It's just It was just a minor thing that stuck out at me there on that one, and that's all I have. Okay, thank you. Other comments, questions? Uh, Commissioner Barnes, and then we'll go to Commissioner McNinch. Thanks, Madam Chairman. I don't know if I'm getting ahead, um, if uh, Commissioner McNish wanted to go first, but uh, this is really a, a timely policy with this path moving forward. We're finally uh, maybe going someplace with the with this horse thing. And um, so, th so this is really timely. And as I looked at this, um, I was kind of thinking that maybe there's, we, sh we should make it a little bit stronger. But then when I saw what the Eureka County CAP proposed for changes, I thought they really nailed it. And I would like to, uh, to see this policy reflect what uh, the changes that, uh, that Eureka came up with. I think it's worded well. And, um, and I think it captures um, everything that we want and, and makes, makes this policy a lot stronger to help support the efforts um, of those that are, that are trying to move this horse issue. Okay, thank you. Commissioner McNinch. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I, I had one real quick um, 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 modification here. Um, under number three, uh, one, two, three, four, like the fifth or sixth, the fifth line down at the end, the sentence starts the NBWC supports the fat path forwards. Um, I think we should put four there. There's, I think there's four main precepts. There's the targeted gathers and removals, increased adoptions, leased pastures, and use of fertility inhibitors uh, based on efficacy. So we could we could do that. There might be a couple places where that's referenced. 
And then I was going to uh, mention, um, as Commissioner Barnes did, the uh, Eureka Cab. And I think what I'd like to do is um, when, when the time comes, if we could have Eureka County kind of explain their proposal. And then um, I, I don't know if uh, uh, JJ Goikachi is uh, on the call or not, but I know Rebecca is, Rebecca Stetson. So if we could have her, um, I, I'd just like to get her thoughts on it. and. Um, uh, you know, I think some of the, some of the changes are super quick and easy. Um, I think we can blend a lot of that stuff in there. Um, but I, I do agree with commissioner Barnes. It, it just feels different than it has in the past. Um, you know, and I, I guess the, the, the optimist, you know, I think, I think that, uh, I think there's some opportunity. I think, you know, things could happen here and, and I think timeliness is, is right, and I would like to uh, resolve and keep this thing moving, uh, you know, at a at a respectful pace here and get it done. So, okay, okay, uh, Mr. Janae. All right, I did want to offer. I was tracking uh, the comments as they came in from the cabs, and then also I received correspondence. Uh, I think a couple of commissioners were. CC'd on some of that as far as uh, comments from the Coalition for Healthy Nevada Lands. Um, I captured those all and I have put them into uh, a working document. Um, and I, I'm, I'm tracking those as, as we go, um, as well as some of these edits that have been recommended, the small catches, uh, AML and, and the four and so, I've got that going now um, for consideration, you know, for the commission as, as we roll forward. But I did capture what, what I saw in the notes coming from each of the cabs, um, just to try to be preemptive, to try to have that, that language captured. Okay. Okay, we'll, we'll go to public comment in just a second, but I just wanna make sure all the commissioners have a chance to weigh in before we go out for public comment. Do we have any other? Commissioner comments. Madam Chair, if I, so Alan, you've tried to, you have captured what Eureka put in here in your mind? Yes, I, I have. And if you would like, I, I, I don't know how we should go about this, but I could show you the marked up version, what I've got right now. Um, and I believe it captures those points and I could just share the screen, walk you through it. It's, it's actually, Fairly succinct. Okay, whatever's whatever's easiest. I had I, so I have to be honest. The um, I was wondering how number nine um, would change. So that kind of reflects that you know you'd already kind of tried to capture that. But then when I read under five um, at the the bottom line there, there was a natural missing out of the thriving ecological balance. So I I jumped to the thought. Well, maybe we maybe we still have some work that we wanted to look at here. So I didn't, I guess that's why I was still kind of hanging on it. So, okay. Okay. Dear woman East, if you, if you just let me know if you want to see that. And when you do, I can, I can share that screen. Sure, go ahead. I'm sure we'll have additional. Yeah, I, this may be helpful for additional comment from the public as well. Okay. So you can see here, this is the clean version. Um, this was an addition uh, highlighted in yellow here that was proposed by the Coalition uh, for Healthy Nevada Lands that just more explicitly states that while the horse and burros are managed by the Bureau of Land Management and the US Forest Service according to the Wild Free, Rain, Free Roaming Horses and Burro Act of 1971 as amended by the Federal Land, Management, or Federal land Policy and Management Act of 1976, the Public Rangeland Improvement Act of 1978, the Omnibus Parks and Public Lands Management Act of 1996, and the Fiscal Year 2005 Omnibus Appropriations Act. And then it has a uh, link that uh, Western Governor's resolutions that also has some description as to wild horse and borough management. Okay. Moving up, question? No, Sorry. I just said, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Moving on to the next paragraph, uh, these were the catches that uh, free roaming was 
something that um, it was in certain places in the previous version. We just wanted to make sure that it was constant throughout. That was proposed by uh, the coalition. The next one, adding private and public to federal, state, and military lands uh, that free-ranging horses and burrows are on private, public, federal, state, and military lands are impacting the future of Nevada's wildlife. So just broadening that, that was proposed, I think, by at least one cab as well as the coalition. Um, when referencing the Free Roaming Horse and Burrow Act, we wanted to make sure that, you know, it was referencing back to the amended version. So that was a catch. Um, I think one of these naturals um, referenced in the second paragraph above purpose um, mentioned by Dave McNinch, uh, Commissioner McNinch was another trying to make sure that natural was consistent in the thriving natural ecological balance and continue that wording throughout. In the purpose section, there was actually some excessive language that came in. Um, it was duplicate and so we struck out and guidance for the, um, in the policy number one, free roaming again, that was to make that consistent. Number two, the policy as amended in, make sure that that was referencing correctly. And number five was that correction to natural ecological balance. Number eight, I just caught Commissioner Cavillia's comment um, to reduce that back to just AML instead of the full spelled out appropriate management level. And then number nine was a comment that was received from Eureka, Eureka Cab as well as uh, coalition um, and we added number nine I'll read the because of Nevada's limited water water sources Nevada Board of Wildlife Commission asks to end out together with BLM the Sagebrush Ecosystem Council and other public land agencies and water right holders to identify and I invest in efforts to ensure that these water sources remain available to wildlife fish and invertebrates and to keep or restore riparian functions while ensuring the water remains available to the holders of the water right. And then as far as consistency with other commission policies, we wanted to make sure that this has, uh, you know, a statement as to effectiveness of this commission policy. So policies shall remain in effect until amended, repealed, or superseded by the Board of Wildlife Commission. Okay. With that, I will stop share so that you Thanks. have a conversation. Does that capture everything you think, Commissioner McNinch? Yeah, from, from what I understand, um, Alan, you guys have done a fantastic job of cleaning this thing up and, and trying to capture, certainly, uh, you know, it's been a really major transformation. And I know that you've had a lot of um, things to juggle to get it done. And um, that, you, yeah, from my understanding, those are the proposed changes. And it looked, to me, it looks like you nailed it. And, um, you guys have done a great job of uh, putting this thing together and getting us something that we can process and consider and talk about. So uh, I think I think you're right down Broadway on it, and I really appreciate the work you guys have put in on it. Thank you. Okay. Do we want to discuss an additional policy number ten uh, about recommended legal action? If we're going to go this far, we need to discuss this, in my opinion. Thoughts, no? Okay. Madam Chair, it's a, it's a tough one. I mean, we were trying to strike a, a tone. Um, we want it to be firm. So in that mindset, yeah, it probably has value, but we also want to be collaborative. And um, so in that, so I, to be honest with you, I'm kind of 50, 50 on it. Um, I feel like, you know, that there was a time where, you know, I would have certainly voted to, um, to be all over, uh, a provision that, you know, dictated or, or really outlined where we're going to go. Um, right now, I guess I'm not hundred percent sure. So I think there's a lot of collaboration going on. Um, so, uh, it's important. Um, I like the, I like the, the, Provision number seven, um, it doesn't necessarily help us keep the good things good, but it certainly puts focus on the things that are going bad. 
so that we can emphasize those. Um, that's kind of a step in that direction, I suppose. Um, but uh, I, I guess I'd be, I'd really like to hear from uh, the coalition. They put a lot of time and effort into this and um, I'd like to hear what their thoughts are on it. And um, definitely weigh heavy on my, my decision. Okay. Okay, well then if we don't have any other commission comment, I'll take it out for public comment. Okay. Uh, Let's hear from Rebecca Stetson. Good afternoon. Thank you, Chairwoman East and Commission. I wanted to start by saying, um, yeah, a special thank you to Alan for doing so much work in collaboration with us, Tony for allowing Alan to work on this, and then Dave um, for allowing us to come to you initially with the desire to have this changed and Tiffany for um, always taking my phone calls and really being an ally uh, on this issue in so many different ways. In regards, and I'm sorry, Rebecca Stetson for the record, Chairwoman of the Coalition for Health Nevada Lands. Um, the coalition is in agreement with whatever the commission decides in regards to litigation. We do want to maintain an open atmosphere of collaboration with BLM. That is our first and primary goal. Um, and in fact, positive collaboration with any entity who is working on the issue. Um, in regards to the CAB um, recommendations that JJ and others had brought forth, we were also in support of those. And I appreciate you doing all that work, Alan, <laughs> after you've already done so much work to bring new stuff onto that. And in regards to Tiffany's um, language of feral versus free roaming, we are open to that language. We are open to feral or free roaming. Uh, we do agree that feral would be uh, a more correct um, word, but also we don't want to uh, limit collaboration by, you know, finite terms. So, um, Commissioner McNinch, was there one other thing that you would ask for me to weigh in on? Um, Rebecca, I think that you've got it covered. I was um, really interested in your thoughts on the enforcement. Um, I left her, I left Rebecca kind of a harried uh, last second um, uh, phone message about two minutes before we got back to our meeting today. Um, so she's trying to process that, but uh, you, you've, you've got it covered. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, Commissioner McNinch. Yeah, and thank you all again. I know that this has been, I'm always thankful to meet people who are still excited to work on this issue and aren't completely downtrodden. And I really do believe that based on our um, meeting this week with uh, the director of national director of BLM, Tracy Stone Manning, that there is a lot of common ground that we're making and that we will uh, start to make some strides. All right, thank you, Rebecca. Always nice to hear from you. Uh, we'll go to uh, Craig Downer. Mr. Downer, I, if you can unmute yourself. Okay. Um, there you go. Yes. Th thank. Thank you for listening to me. I'm a, a wildlife ecologist, and I'm specialized in the the parasodactyl, including the horse family and paper family, as well as some of the rhinos. Um, dear commissioners, I'm. Uh, I sent you um, earlier day a, a thorough statement. I have an introductory statement here that I'd like to deliver to you. Uh, I'm res respectfully submitting the following for your careful consideration in hopes that you will give Nevada's wild horses and burros much more respectful and knowledgeable treatment along with their rightful habitats. These solid hooves post-gastric digesters have deeply rooted ancestry in Nevada and elsewhere in North America and contribute in many major and positive ways to a variety of ecosystems, including that of Nevada and the Great Basin. 
its many majestic mountains and valleys, rivers and lakes, and desert vastnesses. I'm a wildlife ecologist specialized in the mammal mammalian order Parasodactyla and have devoted much time and effort to understand this order, which includes members of the horse, keeper, and rhino families. I have done studies of the wild horses and burrows here in Nevada as elsewhere and have published articles and even books about them. I have learned that the horses, burrows, and others of this order have a very important to role uh, a very important role to play in the life community. This includes their superior ability to build healthy, nutrient-rich, and moisture-absorbing soils to disperse intact seeds that go on to successfully germinate, their ability to open up ice-encrusted water and forage sources, and their ability to open up trails and bushy thickets, all ways in which they greatly uh, aid many plants and animals. And my studies have proven that they are superior carbon sequesters over ruminant herbivores such as cattle, sheep, goats, and deer. Also, it makes great sense that due to their multi-million year ancestry in North America, a large number of the species of Nevada and elsewhere in North America have mutualistic symbioses uh, with horses and burros. Animals who are refilling their age-old niches and functional roles within these ecosystems, including in the Great Basin in Nevada. Also, and of particular concern today, is that this alarming era of global warming is the very important role that the wild horses and burros play in reducing dry, flammable vegetation or vegetation later. Okay, I believe that Mr. Downer reached his three minute mark. So my apologies, Mr. Downer, we'll read through your uh, comment in email. Uh, Mr. Hendricks. Okay, thank you. I just unmuted myself. Thank you for the opportunity here to, uh, to comment on your policies. My name's Greg Hendricks for the record, uh, Director of Field Operations with American Wild Horse Campaign. I know a number of you, and I'm, I'm pleased to see your faces here today. Uh, one of the things that I look at here when we look at your, your policy is a focus on uh, removals of wild horses. And I might uh, reiterate again that the, the 71 Act does refer to them as wild horses, and uh, it is the proper term for it. And I encourage you to maintain that if you, if you uh, would. Uh, a day, uh, basically, Comments on the policy, you know, when I look at it, um, there's been a certain emphasis made on the path forward and, you know, it's 20 year uh, plan and emphasis on removing horses. And that's probably one of the things that the policy is focused on as you walk through all of the different steps within it. As you, if you look at the actual tools that are mentioned in the policy, it talks about, again, you know, the long-term hold and, and uh, adoptions, and it talks about fertility control. And I've been um, given an opportunity to work with American Wild Horse on some very large fertility control programs, both with the Bureau and also in the Virginia range with the Nevada Department of Agriculture. And we've seen some very strong results with those uh, within second year results of up to 43% reduction of pulls. So there is an awful lot that can be said for adding additional language supporting fertility control within your policy. I say that along the lines because right now BLM historically has used very little fertility control and Congress has mandated that they now have a budget of $11 million in the uh, appropriation uh, language that would be dedicated to fertility control humane fertility control within the Bureau, the Bureau populations. So again, I emphasize that if the focus is only on Roundup, what will happen is you will continue down that path that hasn't worked today. Uh, I had the opportunity to work with the BLM in 78 for five or seven years at the Carson District. And during that time frame, I uh, had uh, Roundups that were 4,000 and 4,000 adoptions. So we had zero uh, stockpiling. Right now, our stockpiling is 
in excess of 50,000 and growing quickly. And the BLM actually is doing a considerable amount of roundups, but they don't have the facilities or the money to, to move any faster than what they're doing now. I don't necessarily agree that roundups are the answer, but I do believe that if you were to strengthen your fertility control statements, uh, both um, within item seven and eight of your, of your um, elements and not really. Okay, Mr. Hendricks, you reached your three minute mark. Um, I'm just going to remind all of our public commenters, you have three minutes to speak unless you're representing a cab and you are the spokesperson. Um, so we'll go next to Mr. Dixon. Ready to get the button to unmute myself. Thank you, um, <laughs> Mr. East and commissioners for listening. Um, I joined the county advisory board system 14 years ago. Um, and back at the time when Mike Macbeth was on the county advisory board, who was a former commissioner. And one of the things he got me really engaged in because coming from back east Michigan and going to school back east, um, I had no real understanding and respect for the unique nature of what Nevada was as being a dry state and the impact that wild horses and burros were having on our environment. And this was 14 years ago when the numbers were half of what they are today or, or less. And I think that, you know, when we put a policy together, I, I, I'm gonna tend to agree with Commissioner Cavilia is that I believe that we have tried a lot of things. And although we're, you know, I said in my notes that the, the plan is, is a good start, but it's suboptimal because in part I have with the plan is that it doesn't ever really say that we're gonna take any action if things continue down the path. In other words, it, we're all encouraged, we're all happy, we're all thinking this is great. And, 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 and I told my board, yeah, it may be suboptimal, but we are moving. The biggest problem we have is getting money out of Congress. And at some point, if Congress decides not to fund the, the sterilizations or you know, the birth control or other things that we're doing, this problem's not gonna go away. And, and, and again, putting them in corrals and, 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 and capturing them isn't working either. Um, all I'll say is the last big removal they had down here in Southern Nevada uh, off of the, you know, the, the Spring Mountains by our house here where I live, 97% of the animals they removed had to be euthanized because of health. That's basically horse rich and dirt poor in health. And, and I don't wanna see any animal suffer on the range. And if the animals are suffering like that on the range, they're not doing all the things, they're, they're not having the benefits that they are. They're basically at that point, the range has been destroyed. And the fact of the matter is, is as water poor as this state is, we don't have a lot of springs or lakes or other things for, for horses to go to. And, and I've seen them up in the Spruce Mountains and then the you know, Dolly Bardens where horses have taken a lot of the natural springs back when they were running 15 years ago or 20 years ago, and they're gone now. They've been stamped shut because of, 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 over, of overuse and, and, and by protective horses. I really think that we need to have the ability in this policy to say, if this thing turns from any direction other than what it is right now positive, we need to have the teeth to say that we're gonna do something. And, and this state and this commission has really never wanted to take those steps. And, and I understand there, there are ramifications when you head down those paths and, and it, it, it segregates people. But at some level, when the horses, the thing we're trying to protect are suffering on the range as much as I've seen them suffer, I think it's time that we take action to protect all wildlife, including the horses who I believe are suffering because of overpopulation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dixon. Mr. Tibbetts? Good afternoon. Can you hear me okay? Yes. All right, thanks. Uh, Jake Tibbetts. Um, I'm the Eureka County Natural Resource Manager. Um, I also uh, uh, am the liaison with Eureka County Commissioners and our Eureka CAB, attend all their meetings, and I um, worked on drafting their last set of minutes and submitting those um, to you, and I can answer any questions you may ha have on the Eureka CAB's recommendations. Um, but we're uh, asking that you go ahead and move forward with adopting or, or pushing this to the second reading, um, Policy 67, 
supportive of all the changes that Mr. Janae had uh, worked in and hope you can move forward with that. We do support the path forward, of course. Um, Eureka County is called out as one of the only two counties that signed on to that path forward proposal. Um, I want to mention that the path forward does have a very strong bias towards um, fertility controls but it does recognize that for fertility control efforts to work, that you need to start um, at or within AML. And so I think that needs to be you know, really clear that yes, there, there has to be an increase of gathers. We have to address these ecological impacts on the range, but the very strong efforts towards fertility controls will work and will be much more successful if we start at those appropriate management levels. Um, one thing, you know, I don't know if it's necessary for this policy now because we would like to see it move forward, but it, there's no mention in the policy whatsoever of the um, the horses that are impacting uh, tribal lands or that are flowing from tribal lands. And just in Nevada, you know, we've had thousands of horses on the Cortez range that are not protected under the 1971 Act, thousands of horses in the McDermott area that aren't protected under the 1971 Act, and they too are creating many of the impacts this policy speaks towards. So that may be something the commission would like to look at in the future is strengthening this policy to include, you know, not just the, the horses under the 71 Act, but also those other horses that are impacting or coming from tribal lands. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tibbetts. Mr. Volz. Yes, again, for the record, Fred Volz. In proposed commission policy 67, this commission continues to singularly demonize and blame wild horses and burrows for environmental problems on public lands. Simultaneously, it blithely ignores the impact of cattle on forage, water, and land impacting 61% of Nevada's land area. Cattle, as this commission was informed at the Winnemucca meeting last year, account for almost nine times the number of estimated wild horses and burros on Nevada's land per USDA statistics. The two studies NDOW sponsored on this subject skirted over the massive cattle problem that far supersedes the number of wild horses and burros. Yet there is no proposal to round up and kill an overpopulation problem of cattle far exceeding the perceived problem that has been attributed solely to wild horses and burros. Wild horses and burros are allowed on only 20% of Nevada's land and must share that same land with cattle. Roundups by helicopter lead to multiple deaths as frightened wild horses and burros are mercilessly chased, then imprisoned in substandard conditions for committing no crime. They are usually sold for slaughter, lately under the guise of adoption with a $1,000 stipend because in time they are deemed too expensive to care for by their jailers. Such practices are the antithesis of equitable wildlife management. Arbitrary alleged mercy killings of infirm animals can easily lead to abusive deaths. Where is the much greater funding emphasis in this proposed policy on humane birth control initiatives versus the many millions of dollars spent on imprisonment to preclude the claimed problem before it is born? Why aren't cattle numbers immediately required to decline significantly through the policy since most graze on public lands at bargain basement rental rates, consume considerable forage and water, and do enormous damage to sparse vegetation that far exceeds the impact of wild horses and burrows because of the exponential difference in numbers? The ranching and farming representatives on this commission should recuse themselves from voting on this policy because of direct conflicts of interest in promoting only cattle and agricultural interests by eviscerating wild horses and burrows. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Cooney. Chairman East and commissioners, Jim Cooney, Elko Cab. Uh, thank you for having this item on the agenda. Uh, I want to say that the Elko Cab is definitely uh, cautiously optimistic at the approach that's being taken right here. And we're in support of anything, uh, including uh, the work as far as the coalition has done to uh, take care of this, this issue. Um, we had some real concerns about the 
AML and several of our units up here in Elko. So uh, we solicit your support in this policy 67. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cooney. Mr. Moldy. Yes, thank you, Chair, um, Commissioner Don Moldy for the record, Reno. Uh, <clears throat> it is difficult for me as it apparently is for Fred Volz to speak about this issue without considering <clears throat> domestic livestock um, as a joint uh, topic of concern since horses and cows are pretty much joined at the hip on our public lands. But uh, <clears throat> I, let me do a couple nitpicking things. Uh, I think that uh, one thing that's concerned me for a long time is the um, implied uh, uh, reference to wildlife being adversely impacted by wild horses and burros. And over the years, I've heard this um, a number of times. <clears throat> and in the past, I've done what I'm about to do now, uh, which is to assume that by uh, that using that term in your policy, uh, you are not referring to elk, since this state had a surplus of elk uh, a few years ago, and you've reduced elk numbers uh, because of depredation complaints and so on. Uh, you're not referring obviously to bighorn sheep since Nevada has the largest number of bighorn sheep short of Alaska. And your biologists for several years have said there's no place to put bighorns uh, or is getting very hard to find places, not because of uh, horses, but because of domestic sheep uh, conflicts. Uh, <clears throat> we're not talking about pronghorns since we're now at about 30,000 pronghorns. Uh, the highest number the states recorded in decades. So we're not talking about pronghorns. And I don't think we're talking about mule deer uh, since nobody has uh, suggested that wild horses account for current mule deer numbers. That would be absurd as we all know. So my suggestion is that you better define what you mean by wildlife in this policy because the way it sits now to me, it means nothing. The only two species mentioned in your policy are the hot and cutthroat trout and sage grouse, and we're poisoning ravens on behalf of sage grouse. So uh, to me, uh, the policy lacks definition with respect to what you think wild horses and burros uh, are contributing with respect to wildlife. Uh, but secondly, um, let me talk a minute about the appropriate management levels thing. It, we've, everybody sounds like they're cast in concrete. And there's somehow some magical number that everybody has agreed on. I would remind you that in 2013, the National Academy of Sciences conducted a big review of the BLM horse program. I'm sure many of you remember that. And one of the statements they made, and I'm quoting, how AMLs are established, monitored, and adjusted is not transparent to stakeholders supported by scientific information or amenable to adoption with new information and environmental and social change. So it seems to me in the, uh, in the notion of fairness, uh, this policy ought to include a recommendation to the bill. Okay, Mr. Moldy, you reached your three minutes. Uh, other comments from the public? Okay, seeing none, I'll bring it back to the commission for further discussion. Comments? Movement? Commissioner Barnes. No? Okay, Commissioner McNinch. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, you know, I know that uh, clearly I wasn't, uh, um, I, I knew that this would be a, a topic of, of interest for sure. Um, we're definitely getting some, um, getting some engagement and I just, uh, we're trying to handle these, these issues at the committee level. So if people are concerned about, uh, input, please, please, please engage with the committees. I know, um, uh, it, it provides an extra opportunity to get thoughts out, um, on the front end of these things. Um, maybe it prompts conversations there and we don't, we don't, uh, um, they don't, they don't surface until we get to here maybe, but I'm just trying to, uh, help with some of the thoughts and the inputs. I, it's, um, you know, I'm ready to move forward and, uh, it, it's, it really is time that the coalition has, has, uh, they engaged me over a year ago on this and, 
Um, they've been they've been very active. Um, the Path Forward has a real diverse group of people that have um, that have come up with a uh, they've collaborated and they've come up with a a, a path <laughs> forward. Ironically, and um, you know it's in this day and age to find a group that can come to some kind of consensus on something as critical and something as controversial as wild horse management that that has a lot of weight to me um that that's there's a lot of weight to to what they've done what they've proposed and i appreciate what uh, mr tibbetts uh said about um you know the front load on the uh, removal of horses so that these other things can be more successful um i think that that's a really really important um a distinction, a really important comment, and I appreciate that he made that. Um, what else are we supposed to do? Um, I'm hearing, I'm hearing, get rid of whor- uh, cows and get rid of, uh, you know, livestock in general. Um, I'm hearing, um, you know, there's got to be a practicality to it, and um, I, I feel like, I feel like what the work that we're doing here. I, I understand people's passion for horses, and I understand the gap. I've been here long enough to know how passionate people are about the wild horses. And um, I enjoy seeing them as much as any of those folks. I do. I love seeing them out in the wild, but like Mr. Dixon said, um, unfortunately I've seen a few that didn't look really healthy to me in the last couple of years. Um, I've been down in the Vegas area a little bit um, doing my thing and um, it's kind of sad. It's scary. I mean, I feel bad for them. Um, you know, it's a, miserable way to, to eke out a, an existence. And, um, uh, when you're basically, you're, you're not, you know, you don't have the resources available to you and stuff. So, um, I think that, uh, I think that we're down heading down the right path. Um, I, I do feel that as far as an enforcement provision, I feel like we should hold off on that. I think we're, I think that we're okay moving forward without it for now. If, if we, feel the need. Um, there's nothing that says we can't come back and open up the policy and um, make modifications to include new provisions or whatever we think we might need to. Um, there's nothing that precludes us from uh, just taking action as a commission. Um, doesn't have to be included in a policy to head there. Um, but I do like the idea of maintaining that collaborative tone and uh, seeing what it gets us. Nothing else has worked real well. So um I, I like the idea of, of going down that path and seeing what we get. So that's, those are my comments and um, thank you. Okay, other comments? Um, the only other thought that I had, um, Mr. Janae, is under the policy number seven, um, Eureka County did suggest that we um, identify the impact. And so we are saying having the most significant, should we add the word negative there? It's the third line down in number seven. I see it and I will add it. Okay. Um, and then the, uh, maybe one other, under the background section in the third paragraph down, we, I, we do identify the population estimates um, in that paragraph. We don't talk about the state horses at all that are out at Washoe. Are, would that be of concern out at Washoe Lake in the Scripps area? Would, would, would we want to include the, those numbers in there? I don't know what those numbers are, but um, we talk about the tribal lands, we talk about managed by the Department of Ag, but. Um, I know there's a number of horses out at the Washoe areas. Is that included in the the number for the Department of Ag? Um, I I do believe 3,000. And I'll confirm that number with Department of Ag, Nevada Department of Ag, and and confirm that that number is good. Okay. Uh, They may, uh, I had heard rumors they might be doing some flags, so. Okay. Okay, and then I guess, um, you know, in the spirit of collaboration, I, I, I would back off on the, the litigation aspect. Um, I do think it adds some teeth, but I, I, I'm hearing uh, you, Commissioner McNinch and, and Ms. Stetson, um, you know, it, 
I can go there <laughs> if we if we agree to revisit it if it becomes an issue. So, um, do we have any other Commissioner Almberg? You need help. <laughs> The mute is probably to the bottom left. There you go. I lost everybody for a minute. Uh, for me, I, I, I'm okay with leaving off, uh, enforcement um, with because we have this on an annual basis, you know, and. and like seven there on an annual basis, we're gonna get a review of this. And so um, it's not like that it's gonna be very long. Uh, and so anything to keep this moving forward and to, uh, you know, try to, to um, keep the momentum, again, keep the momentum going, but I'm okay with not, not including uh, enforcement um, based on our annual review. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Okay, do we want to make a motion to move this forward? Commissioner McNinch. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'll make a motion that uh, we move uh, commission policy number 67 to a second hearing at a future commission uh, meeting. Um, and that would uh, be with the draft, um, you know, a continued cleanup version, if you will, uh, Kaylee and Alan, if you guys could, like you've been doing here, and bring us a fresh version with um, that that uh, presentation that um, Alan just showed us on the on the screen, plus the couple of additions that we've talked about here lately. The last seconds. Okay, thanks. Do I have a second? I have a second from Commissioner Barnes. So we have a motion by Commissioner McNinch and a second by Commissioner Barnes to move. Uh, Commission policy 67 forward with the noted changes. All in favor, raise your hand. Opposed, motion carries nine to zero. Thank you very much. Okay, let's take a quick break because we're gonna jump into regulations and I think those are gonna take a little bit of time. So let's take a 10 minute break. We'll be back at 325. Thanks.
Okay, if we can have everyone come back. Okay, <clears throat> we'll move on to um, the final part of our agenda today. Uh, we're on agenda number nine, Commission General Regulations for Possible Action or Adoption, Public Comment Allowed. 9A, Commission General Regulation 495, LCB File 176-20-NAC 502, Simplification, Management Analyst Kaylee Musso. The Commission will consider adopting changes to NAC 502, recommended by the Regulation Simplification Committee. This regulation was considered during a workshop at the September and November 2020 and 20, January 2021 meetings. Ms. Musso. Thank you, Chairwoman East. Um, as you stated, these regulations are up for adoption today. Um, I did wanna start out by um, reminding you guys that these regulations came out of an effort um, brought forth by former chairman Brad Johnston. Um, he expressed his desire a couple of years ago to clean up our wildlife chapters of NAC. Um, and state agencies are required to review NAC chapters every 10 years. Um, we would have been required to review them in 2021 anyway, but uh, former chairman Johnson had us start this review a little bit early, which turned out to be great because um, <laughs> COVID just uh, slowed things down a little bit, and it, it's taken a while to get these regulations back from LCB, um, as I'm sure you may have noticed, being that the workshops were held about a year ago. Um, and in that note, I did want to explain that um, I saw in some of the CAB, CAB reports and minutes um, a desire to have more clear regulations that are easier for the public to understand. And um, I just want to tell you guys that I too want that and have been working with LCB on that. Um, we have had a couple of regulations come back, um, in my mind, more confusing than the way I drafted and submitted them originally. Um, and I've had a few conversations with some of the drafters at LCB about that. So um, now after reading those comments, I will take that to LCB as well to let them know that um, some of our constituents are having a difficult time understanding the way that some of these regulations are drafted. Um, but I did just wanna point that out to you guys before I begin. So um, to get started, uh, the Regulation Simplification Committee discussed changes to NAC 502, and simple changes were made to remove contradictory language and clarify or update existing language. Um, the Commission previously held three workshops on CGR 495 NAC 502. Um, so we spent a fairly significant amount of time discussing this as a commission, and that is not including the number of committee meetings we held on this regulation. Um, so I was going to keep my comments today fairly brief, but I did want to just highlight the most significant changes that were made in NAC 502. Most of those were to mountain lion portions. Um, the first change is to clarify what the department needs when checking in a mountain lion. Um, the department also removed LCB's language, um, making it acceptable to transfer a mountain lion tag as allowable by uh, the tag transfer regulation that came out of the last session. Um, we decided to remove that language that they put in allowing the transfer because a mountain lion tag is open for everyone. It's not a drawn tag. It only costs $20 and it's an over-the-counter tag. So it's more of a heartache for the department to um, allow a transfer of that tag. And it's just a lot of work than um, it would be for someone to just let that tag go unused and then um, someone can buy it over the counter. Um, next, this regulation makes it unlawful to participate in a canned hunt. That canned hunt language was very carefully drafted through multiple meetings and in consultation with uh, Dag Burkett and Commissioner McMinch. I believe he even worked um, with other states on that canned hunt language as well. Um, this regulation makes it unlawful for master guides to submit an application for a family member during the non-resident guided deer hunt and makes it mandatory for a guide to hold the necessary permits required by federal land management agencies. Um, that actually is already a requirement in NAC, but we made that language a little bit more clear. Um, and then lastly, the Regulation clarifies how landowner towns must be investigated. Um, the department is asking the commission to adopt this regulation with the noted changes being that 
um, we did we did take out that tag transfer language. And we are available for questions. Okay, questions or comments for Ms. Musso. None? Okay. Commissioner McNitch, did you have anything? Are you good? You're good. Okay. All right, we'll go to public comment then. Do we have public comment on NAC? Actually, CGR 495, NEC 502. Mr. Kranka. Thank you, Madam Chair. For the record, Henry Krinka, speaking for the Nevada Outfitters and Guides Association. Um, on these regulations, the they they only applying to the guides that are already guiding legally, um, and we feel that the guide program, when it was installed, to have is to have a warden in the field, working on illegal guiding issues and not in the office with regulations. So, the ones the ones of us that are legal, we're already working on these issues and don't have any and don't have any real heartache with them. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Kranka. Mr. Dixon. <clears throat> there we go. Thank you, Commissioner East and Commissioners. Um, I think that my, my cab, we, we started out with these things on my cab agenda and uh, we spent a lot of time on them. And for something that's called uh, simplification. Uh, we found that the new regulations, even the, re the reading of these regulations is anything simple. Um, and I guess at the end of the day, with, with not any real specifics on this one, but I, I'm thinking that these sort of uh, commission regulations could really benefit from having a professional editor work with one of the wildlife staff specialists and make sure we have wording that's clear I mean, I, I write documents for the US government and Congress and I have scientists write things. And then I, I have a professional writing staff that work with those scientists to put it into language that Congress and, and, and other people can understand. And I think at some level, our, our, you know, our, our general regulations like this need to be written in a fashion, at least at a level that if somebody picks one up to read it, they have some general understanding. You don't have to have an advanced degree to read them and understand them. And, and I think right now they're, they're confusing to read and, and hard, hard to read. And, and I think they could benefit from that. And I don't know if the department's ever used that or, or is currently using that, but I know that it works very well in my current job when I'm preparing documents for Congress and the National Academy of Sciences and the public. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dixon. We have other public comment on NAC 502. I don't see any, we'll bring it back to the commission. Um, I see Deputy Director Rob popped on. Did you have something? No. Nope. Okay. Uh, Commissioner McNinch. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so if I could, uh, if we could bring Paul back on. Uh, Paul, considering that you there, there were concerns with language, is there something specific that needs to be worked on? Um, I mean, just the whole thing. I mean, we've been working on these for a long, long time. I mean, so what, what, um, you know, regulations, as you know, are difficult at best. And then we mix in LCB and we mix in the fact that there's, you know, uh, 100,000 different people reading them or that should be reading them and uh, a thousand different opinions um, of what is succinct and what is not. And I, I understand I've done a lot of regulations myself. They're not easy to write. They're not easy to make clear. And they're certainly impossible to make um uh, clear to everybody out there. So um, is there something specific that was causing trepidations or problems? I, on 495, I didn't have any th anything specific other than it's just, it's very thick to read. And I just wondered if, if we had ever, if we'd ever thought of bringing in somebody to basically keep all of the regulatory language there, but put it in a, in a fashion that was more readable. And, 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 and like I said, I pay people and I pay them 
handsomely six figures a year to do this so that I could communicate with Congress. Because I, as a scientist, don't have that ability to do that. On this one, I didn't have specific comments, but if you look at my my CAB um, action report, I did have some specific comments uh, on, on the next one um, in, in the next couple of those so that we could actually talk there, Dave. But I mean, I, I wish I could tell you other than it's, when you pick it up, people just, I, I list the people at my CAB meeting complaining that th there's no way that they could understand this and not have a violation. I said, well, you have to understand this is because this is law. And I'm trying to explain it to him in my meeting, and, and I'm stumbling a little bit, even myself, trying to explain it. And I guess from that perspective, I, I just don't know if it would help or not, if we'd ever tried it. And, and as you well know, it, it might not work, but I, I'm, I'm also thinking for, you know, for a certain amount of money, it might be worth a try. We are bringing in extra mm -hmm. money on our, on our licenses and fees and other things that we do out there and, and making our rules and regulations easier might help. And I don't think anybody's a professional uh, editor on your staff. We're all biologists and scientists and, and other things working at Endow, and I, I applaud them for having that knowledge. But when I want a code written in computer scientists, I get a computer scientist to write it. I don't have a, uh, I don't have a scientist write code, even though they can. That's, I, I, I don't have something specific on this one, Dave, other than just the general net here, and I apologize for that. Okay, thanks, Mr. Dixon. Uh, Deputy Director Rob. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Jack Rowe, for the record. I totally agree with what Mr. Dixon is saying, but there are professional writers for this, and it's the Legislative Council Bureau. And we send down plain English, plain English, I can't even say plain English, uh, <laughs> to them, and it comes back in the verbiage that they will pass. And we cannot... It, it is not up to any of our staff what the final language is. And oftentimes we send it down, they send it back and we say, you missed the intent or you don't understand it well enough. The changes you've made, take it outside of what we're trying to get. And we go back and forth with them on a regular basis. This is not a department product. It is the Legislative Council Bureau product that we have to live with. We have no choice in where we're going or these things don't change. Thank you, Deputy Director. I will relay that message back to my cab. We wish we could simplify it. We, in our regulations that we put out, we oftentimes put in what the law actually says in NAC or NIS, and then we try to simplify it into lay layman's terms to make it more understandable for the general public. Um, also, management analyst Musa, for the record, I just wanted to add that we are going through an effort right now, too, in our um, application guidebooks and hunt guidebooks to um, put the regulations into simpler terms for the public. Um, and management analyst Manfredi has, I know, has put in a major effort on that. Um, so hopefully our guidebooks and publications coming out from now on will um, be able to explain these regulations in a little bit more of a simpler term since that's really where we have the ability to do so. Um, it's not really in the regulation language that we have that ability. Okay, thank you, Ms. Musso. Any other comments or questions? Okay, seeing none, do we have a motion to approve regulation 495 NAC 502? I will make the motion then to approve uh, Commission General Regulation 495 LCB file R176-20 NAC 502 as amended. Do I have a second? I have a second from Vice Chair Cavilia. All in favor, raise your hand. Motion carries nine to zero. Okay, thank you. All right. 9B, Commission General Regulation 496, LCB file R009-21-NAC 503, Simplification, Management Analyst Kaylee Musso. The Commission will consider adopting changes to NAC 503 recommended by the Regulation Simplification Committee. This regulation was considered during a workshop at the November 2020 and January and March 2021 meetings. Thank you, Chairwoman East. As I noted earlier, um, or as you noted, 
this regulation has been discussed during two different workshops um, and then also through multiple committee meetings. Uh, the regulation updates, the highlights of this regulation are that it updates taxonomic classifications and makes it unlawful to collect reptile species, reptiles for commercial purposes. Um, the department also added Gila monsters to list of species that's unable to be imported or transported. Um, we did insert that after it came back from LCD, so that was a um, change we wrote into this version. Um, this regulation also makes it unlawful for a person to check their traps using any sort of aircraft and clarifies certain trap requirements. Uh, the department is asking the commission to adopt the regulation with noted changes, and I do um, have a couple more that I just want to point out to you guys. Um, on page 25, um, we you can see that I hand wrote in a change on number um, one in section 16. We would we have discussed um, as a department recently and would like to keep that the language that LCB um, sent back to us. So it would say it is unlawful for a person to collect unprotected wildlife, including without limitation any unprotected species of reptile. Um, so we would like to keep it that way, um, but we do want to uh, use our changes in red on number two. So that first sentence would say, except as otherwise provided in NAC 503.513 and 503.545, the department will issue a permit authorizing a natural person to collect unprotected wildlife with the exception of reptiles for commercial purposes um, et cetera, et cetera. So um, that's one change I had on that page. Um, on page 30 is where we added Gila monsters into the list of uh, reptiles. So you'll see that change listed there as a new number nine. Um, and then I did want to just make sure it's pointed out that we want to keep that portion that's uh, crossed out after sea snakes. So that text in red that's lined out. Um, that came from LCD and we do want to keep that. Um, and then the last change I wanted to note to this regulation is on page 45, section 24 in the blue text. That the blue text says along the entire surface of the outside jaw that is used to catch wildlife. That's confusing. And we just wanted to say along the entire surface of the jaw that is used to catch wildlife. I'm sorry, Kaylee, can you tell us where that is? I just oh, got yes. to page sorry. 45. <laughs> page 45. I know, I'm sorry. I, I have these tabbed on my... <laughs> okay. Uh, so sorry, page 45, section 24. Okay. And it's the blue text at the end of section 24, um, okay. right before you get to section 25. We just want to... Uh-oh, we lost her. Oh, there she is. Hang on, you froze for a second. You want to keep the, the part in blue? We do want to keep the part in blue, but we want to remove the term outside. Okay. So that would read, all steel leg hold traps the size number two or larger with an outside jaw spread of five and a half inches or larger used in the taking of any wildlife must have lugs, spacers, or similar devices permanently attached so as to maintain a minimum trap opening of three sixteenths of an inch along the entire surface of the jaw that is used to catch wildlife. Okay. And those are the only changes I um, really wanted to note in this regulation also, um, but we are all available for questions. Um, again, if you guys have any questions on this regulation. Okay. <laughs> again, a, a pretty extensive regulation. Do we have any questions? or comments? Is anyone turn around? I don't see any questions. Okay, I don't see any from the commission yet. So I'll go out for public comment. And Mr. Dixon. Thank you, um, Mr. Chairman East. Um, I had just two specific comments that I wanted to make on this. One, the first one is in section three on mollusks. The question that was brought up at my cab is, is we don't mention spring snails in the mollusk section here. And so since they're a protected species, why aren't they underneath of the, why aren't they in here is something that we want to be dealing with. And I didn't know the answer. 
it's something for you guys to consider. And the other one is under section 16. Um, I thought all of section 16, I thought we did not have any commercial collection of reptiles. So why do we even have a section 16 anymore that goes into getting permits and doing things for the collection of, of reptiles when in fact commercial collection of reptiles uh, we voted on several years ago to get rid of. And so I was confused with that unless I'm misreading section 16. Those were the two questions that I had. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Mr. Dixon. Other public comment on regulation 496 NAC 503. Okay, I don't see any, so we'll come back to the commission. Ms. Musso, do you want to address Mr. Dixon's comments? Yes. Um, I do not want to address the Springfield comment. I would like to defer that to Mr. Cushing's, um, okay. but I can address the reptile collection piece. And um, he is correct in that we have not allowed commercial collection of reptiles for quite some time now. Um, but we've been doing that through commission regulation, which is a CR process. So um, it's yearly or every other year, depending on if we want to amend it. Um, but putting it into NAC just makes that more solid and we won't have to do that through commission regulation is my understanding if we um, add that into PR or into commission regulation, I apologize. And then um, if Mr. Cushanks is available to speak to the spring snails, I'll defer to him. Okay. Mr. Cushanks, are you available? Nope. Okay, maybe we can wait for a minute for him to come back. Uh, if somebody can locate him. What about uh, any other comments or questions from the commission? Because I had the same, I had the same thought about the reptiles. <laughs> so I'm glad that we addressed that. Okay. Madam Chair. I apologize. Yes, Secretary Wasley. Uh, although I don't have an answer on the mollusk spring snail, I, but I, I did want to uh, expound a little bit on process. Uh, I know Deputy Director Rob tried to make the, the roles and responsibilities relative to drafting regulations clearer, um, but this is kind of where, where Kaylee started her presentation is that we're trying to, to bring clarity. And, and so we have language. That language leaves our, our agency and it goes to the Legislative Council Bureau. And they have uh, specific timelines that, that they're under to respond to us. But I've seen several instances over the past couple of years where, where the department has um, kind of been implicated or blamed and, and not responding. I'm thinking of like the shed antler reg. There's been a couple of regulations that have languished to the frustration of some of the cabs and to the frustration of some of the, the public. Um, I, I just want to make that distinction between, uh, you know, our initial drafting and LCB's final drafting. We are totally at their mercy and we we might think it's perfectly clear what they do is they they look at other relevant pieces of of legislation and make sure that there's common terminology oftentimes they don't understand the world in which we operate and it it does present some significant challenges to us and then and adhering to their timelines oftentimes you know they have a ton of work to do and and we're constantly you know, trying to, to get our work elevated. And, and every time that language would go back, uh, we would be looking at months uh, to get it back. And so there is a downside to, to trying to uh, resubmit, resubmit, resubmit. And that's just the length of the process. But there is a really, really clear separation between roles and responsibilities and in drafting the final language and, and the timeline. So I know it can be frustrating. It's frustrating to us too. Um, but it, it definitely is beyond um, the purview and authority of our agency to, to draft that and determine final language on those. Sure, thank you for that. Hopefully and I stalled long enough for, for <laughs> Mr. Crickshanks to be located. 
Um, I apologize. I have not gotten an answer from him yet. And if, if it's your preference to table this um, until we can get an answer, then that's okay with me. I apologize um, that we weren't prepared. But I do um, want to add that one of our administrators did venture to take a guess and noted that there are many different types of spring sales and that most of them are occurring on private property. And so maybe that's um, why they weren't put on this list. But um, that's, oh, never mind. I stalled enough to make him <laughs> join. So you can't leave your desk, Mr. Crookshanks. <laughs> My apologies. I was chasing down something really quick. Okay. I apologize. Now chase down a spring snail. I can do that. Okay. So we had a question. Um, Division of Ministry Cook thinks on why we didn't add spring sale to the list of um, protected mollusks. Which list are we talking about, uh, Kaylee? It's, sorry, on uh, CGR 496, it's NAC 503 in section three, so on page five. We um, classify protected, we list out protected mollusks, but spring sale. Um, is not on that list. I'm not familiar with this at the time being, but I can get an answer to you as soon as possible. Okay. I'm sorry, but I can I can I can do some research and get an get. I need to I need to take a look at the list real quick. And in his defense. We did start this regulation when um, John Schoberg was still the fisheries division administrator. So he was thrown into the. Oh, and she froze again. <laughs> okay, so how much time would you need, Mr. Crookshanks? He froze too. Holy cow, what's going on? <laughs> Tony froze, there we go. Okay, we had a little bit of a glitch here for a second. Everybody froze. How much time would you need, Mr. Crook Shanks? 10, 15 minutes at the, at the most. Okay. Madam Chair? Yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm okay. sure I need an answer to you very quickly. Okay. Okay, why don't you see if you can run that down? Could we just circle back on this one can we go to the next one and come back to b okay why don't we do that we'll give you we'll give you a little bit of time mr crookshanks okay so we're going to move to 9c and we'll come back to 9b okay so 9c commission general regulation 497 lcb file r006-21 nac 502 simplification management analyst kaylee musso the commission will consider adopting changes to NAC 504, that says 502, okay. Recommended by the Regulation Simplification Committee, the regulation was considered during a workshop at the January 2021 meeting. So we are, this is 504, not 504, not 502. Okay, Ms. Musso. Thank you, Chairwoman East. Uh, this regulation CGR 497 was heard and drafted through the Regulation Simplification Committee as well and brought forward for a workshop in January 2021. This regulation updates the descriptions of the wildlife management areas, clarifies permit requirements, especially for ungulates in order to curb um, the spread of CWD, and then clarifies terms of master guide and sub guide contracts. The department is asking the commission to adopt the regulation with the noted page noted changes on page 28 in orange. Um, so if I can just draw your attention to page 28, um, you should see some orange text along the top of the regulation. That's text that the, that the department added back in after receiving the draft back from LCD. Um, and this was originally language that you guys had voted on and approved, but it was um, it was left out when we got the draft back from LCD. So. We added it back in, but it's nothing. It's not any language you guys haven't seen before. Um, and we are available for questions. Okay. And that's that's the only change. Oh, I apologize. There's still some, I guess, um, 
the beginning part of that section was on page 27. So there are changes on page 27 in orange as well. Um, right. All dealing with the same master guide clients or contracts. But yes, those were the only changes to the LCB version the department made. Okay. Any questions on this one for Ms. Musso? Nope. Everybody good? I know they're extensive. Vice Chair Cavilia? I, I do have a question on, on that page 27 and 28. Um, number seven and number eight seem really redundant. Um, and I'm curious, I, one's in relating to a resident master guide and one's relating to a non-resident master guide, but we're, it's almost the same criteria. I'm curious what the thought was behind that, why we're, se why we're separating the two out, because it looks like it's the same. It's almost the same, um, the same stuff in there. It's, it's kind of odd to me. If it's okay with you, Vice Chair Cavilia, and I would defer to Captain Kramer for that. Yeah, th thank you. Uh, for the record, Jake Kramer, Game Warden Captain. Uh, Commissioner Cavilia, you're correct. They're extremely similar. Um, the difference is the dis differences between resident and non-resident differentiation. And it, it all goes back to uh, jurisdictional um, authority by the state of Nevada to request records. Um, we, in, in as far as like administrative uh, requests, administrative warrants, uh, for records requests. We can't do that outside of state that easily. So then we, um, as it relates to non-resident guides, uh, we're now requiring those records to be in state. So that is the difference, but we just wanted to be over clear in stating that these are the resident guide requirements and these are the non-resident guide requirements. Does that answer your question, Vice Chair Cavilia? Yeah, I mean, and I guess so. A, a non-resident master guide has to keep his records in Nevada while they're guiding. That's what you're. That's what we're getting out there. Yes, uh, available for inspection. However, it depends on uh, the contract itself. If you're talking about contracts, all guides are going to be expected to have contract on them um, in the field or uh, within close proximity. Um, client records, which is their guide books. Uh, and such and, and overall records of, of every client. If they're a non-resident uh, guide, again, we wanted to be, have that available for us without the, uh, uh, the need for going to administrative warrants out of state and, and the problems that that's gonna cover. So yeah, that, that doesn't mean they have to have them um, on the mountain. It just means they have to have them um, available to us within the state. Thank you. Okay, other questions for either Captain Kramer or Kaylee Musso? Okay, I don't see any. So go out for public comment. Do we have public comment on NAC 504? Okay, I don't see any. So we'll come back to the commission for a motion or further discussion? Do we have a motion to approve? Vice Chair Cabilia. Okay, I'll make a motion to approve Commission General Regulation 497 LCB file R006-21 NAC 504 as presented. Okay, do I have a second? I have a second by Commissioner Almberg. So we have an, a, a motion by Vice Chair Cavilia and a second by Commissioner Almberg to approve Commission General Regulation 497 LCB file R006-21 NAC 504 as presented. All in favor, raise your hand. Okay, motion carries nine to zero. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna circle back to 9B. Commission regula General Regulation 496 LCB file R009-21-NAC 503 Regulation Simplification with Management Analyst Kaylee Musso. 
Thank you, Chair um, I am just going to keep stalling until I see Mr. Cushings come back to his chair. Oh, he was there. Um, Where did he go? <laughs> yes. He, oh, he's in Alan's office now. <laughs> okay. Goodness. Okay. My apologies. I think I've uh, tracked it down. If you could uh, just pose the question to me one more time really quickly. Sure. So it's been brought up to us that spring snails was not included in the mollusk section um, in section two. Um, and we were asking why it was not included as a um, in that sensitive species. The on, under number two, the only mollusks I'm looking at are uh, apple snails, which I believe are under the classified as the injuri injurious ones. Is that correct? It's actually um, section three, right? Is, are we not looking at section three? I'm sorry, it is section three. My apologies. It's section three on page five of the regulation. It would be under number two though, subsection two, all species of mollusks, which are not classified as protected, sensitive, threatened, Endangered, injurious aquatic species or aquatic invasive, invasive species are unprotected. I'm getting there really, really quickly. Okay. The following species. It, it, it actually would be under number one. The following species of mollusk are classified as protected. I'm sorry. Okay. So we've got the California, the Western Pearl Shell, and then the Western Ridge. That's true. So the, the, the three that are, that, are, that are included here as protected are the California floater, floater the, the Western Pearl Shell, and the Western Ridge uh, mussels, and all species of mollusks which are not classified as protected, sensitive, threatened, or endangered, or unprotected. As, uh, as for the question as to why spring snails, um, weren't included in this. Um, I, I don't know off the top of my head and, and like Kaylee indicated, this was this was before my time. This was when my predecessor uh, was in here. Um, my guess would be is that, uh, that there are so many spring snails um, in the Great Basin and in Nevada, we're dealing our, our conservation agreement and conservation strategy uh, for spring snails in Nevada that was just completed this past year and signed on by uh, a multitude of partner agencies. Um, it, it classified anywhere from, from 99 to 103 uh, separate species of spring snails. Um, some of those, uh, a, a small subset which have been petitioned for, list, for listing in the past couple of years, none of those have been warrant, found warranted for listing thus far. Um, why they're not in, included in here, I, my, my best answer is I don't know. Okay. And just management analyst Musso, for the record, um, just to add again, uh, our diversity division administrator, um, Ms. New Mrs. Newmark, um, noted that if we wanted to list out every single species of spring snail, um, it would be a very long list. And she also noted we don't list out every single mammal um, in NAC for the same reason, um, just the ones that we still need to be called out for extra protection. Okay. And I can, for the record, Chris Crookshanks, Fisheries Division Administrator, um, speaking to to what Ms. Musso was was just referring to. Um, I know, as far as preparation of the the wildlife uh, action plan revision that we're doing right now, because the list of spring snails is so extensive in Nevada, uh, that we were we were classifying spring snails in Nevada in, into one sort of sort of large group, which doesn't. Um, work well in this endeavor here is, is to, to sort of lump them and say spring snails in Nevada because they could be one of, of three to four different genuses. Um, so I would imagine my educated guess was was similar to what uh, Ms. Musso indicated is that is that we didn't want it to, to list um, all of those those species singularly in here, which would be a giant list. Um, okay. With that being said, um, the assurances uh, that are laid out uh, in the conservation agreement and the conservation strategy uh, that was just completed, I, I think affords uh, some pretty rigorous protections for spring snail species in the Great Basin. 
Okay. Everyone good with that? Looks like it. Thank you. Once again, my apologies for the delay. Um, <laughs> Okay. But thank you. Sure. All right. Coming back to the commission on 9B. Do we have any further discussion? Motion to approve. Commissioner McNinch. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'll make a motion to approve uh, CGR 496 LCB file number R009-21 uh, as presented uh, to include the um, the, the, the amendments on page 25, 30, and 45 that the department noted. Okay. Do I have a second? I have a second by Vice Chair Cavilia. So we have a motion to approve CGR 496 LCB file R009-21 NAC 503 by Commissioner McNinch and seconded by uh, Vice Chair Cavilia. Commissioner McNish, Vice Chair Cavilia, as presented by the department. All in favor, raise your hand. Okay, motion carries nine to zero. Thank you, everyone. Whew. All right, lots of hard work there. Um, moving on to public comment, agenda item number 10. Public comment will be limited to three minutes. No action can be taken by the commission at this time. Any item requiring commission action may be scheduled on a future commission agenda. Okay, uh, Mr. Cooney. Madam Chairman, uh, members of the commission, I've got a quick question. Uh, I thank Tony and, and Jack for given the explanation of when this information goes to LCB and they do their magic and reword and uh, uh, turn things around a little differently than perhaps what the intent is. However, we just had a situation where, uh, and I'm curious how this works, if the department and the, the commission wants to amend that, does that amendment have to go back through the LCB or is there kind of, is it, are we able to, to move the regulation from LCB, then the commission amends it and it, it states that way. That, it's just kind of a, um, you know, if they're totally responsible for writing the language, do, do you guys have to get a approval for any amendments that you pass. I hope that question makes sense, but uh, thank you. Hmm. Ms. Musso? Yes, I can uh, try to address that. And then if uh, Director Fossil or Deputy Director Rob wants to add to it, they can. Um, Hang on one second, Ms. Musso. Dag Burkett, should we engage at this point? Yeah, that's fine. It was uh, okay. the question was fine. Uh, okay. I, I, if, uh, we'll let Kelly uh, Kaylee answer, and then if uh, she wants some assistance, I'll, assistance, I'll be happy to provide some. But I'll, I'll let Kaylee take that on. Okay. Yeah, we typically don't engage in public comment, but I just wanted to clarify that. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Musso. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, I do think it's beneficial for the public to know the process. And if it's your guys' interest to do a small presentation, I don't mind doing that um, in the future too. But um, once we draft a version of a regulation and it is submitted to LCD, um, the changes we're requesting to NAC into um, their version of the regulation, um, they are professionals in drafting the regulation, but as Director Wasley stated, they are tasked with um, making sure that it conforms to all other portions of NAC and NRS as well. Um, so once we get the version that they've drafted back, um, I do take a look at it and review it and compare it to the draft we submitted originally to make sure that nothing was missed um, and the intent stayed the same. At that point, I do have the um, I do have the authority to make any changes to their version that I can um, and bring those to the commission as well because uh, they'll need to be approved by you guys. But um, LCD still has the authority to change my um 
changes to the regulation into um, language that is suitable to them. So even if I do um, add language back in that they missed or that we wanted to um, add at a later time, um, they still do have the authority to put it into terms that is consistent throughout NAC and NRS. Um, I hope that answers the question, but Director Wesley can add to it. Thanks, Kaylee. I would, I would just add that that the answer is it depends. If it is viewed as a substantial change, uh, they will want to review it and potentially change that language. If it's an amendment that would just add a species list, then, then we would have a much greater chance of amending a list of species than if we're actually changing the wording because their, their contention would be that wording is the way that it is to adhere to other statutes and regulations. So it, it's, it's really kind of a gray area. We try not to make too big of a change um, unless it, we really need to change the intent after we get it back from them. Because if we make a big change, then we, we're just back to square one. We have to get the language back and the, it starts the clock all over again. Okay, thank you. Does that answer your question, Mr. Cooney? Yeah, I think so. It, it's gray area. That's what I'm hearing. So. <laughs> It is. It may be. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Do we have any other public comment? Going once, going twice. We do not. Okay. That wraps up our meeting for today. I will see everyone tomorrow morning at nine o'clock. Have a wonderful evening.